Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. Just to make you aware, this podcast may contain some explicit slash offensive language. And if that's not your thing, you don't have to listen. But I have given you a warning. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. You don't know the half of it, but yeah, um, I'm anyway. Time, yeah, I'm, good, on, <laughs> I'm skating on the thinnest ice known to man. Like. He said, and um, they put a poison in the tank that just instantly kills them. He went, and we've run out of it, so we cut their heads off with shovels. Suddenly, bang! The whole boat exploded. Take your sort of eight-inch-long piranha and imagine that at four, five, maybe six feet. I said, I've revived your dead fish. <laughs> F off, he said. You haven't. That was just humongous. It was... I couldn't believe what I was looking at. I'm just battling this fish out and on. I know it's a black man. I'm, yeah. I'm saying I'll never be a naughty boy again. If you catch fish and you return them to the water, then you are my brother. Mike Brown, welcome to the Nash Podcast, mate. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, mate. Yeah, thank you for the invite. Thank you very much for coming in, mate. I massively appreciate it. No problem, no problem. The pooch came as part of the package, but we we yeah, relegated he's, him. he's back in the van, mate. He was misbehaving, so he had to go. <laughs> uh, how have you been recently, mate? What have you been up to? Um, yeah, just obviously uh, just uh, this side of Christmas, mate. So, um, yeah, just Christmas and New Year with the family. Um, and, yeah, just work, family, really. Yeah, not a great deal of fishing. I've not done any fishing now since um, October, back in, in the autumn. Um yeah, so that, that's pretty much it, mate. Yeah, just sort of the usual Monday, Monday to Friday, and then weekends at home with, with the other half. So You had a bit yeah. of an interesting work incident, mate, didn't you, on the yeah, old uh, we, Christmas period? We did, mate, yeah. So the um, the night of the 23rd of December, we had um, a ram raid incident on, on the shop, which was, uh, yeah, eventful to say the least. This is Point Dexter's, isn't it? Yeah, this is where uh, you were. So, yeah, but working Point Dexter's in, in Southampton. So, yeah, we're a big sort of warehouse style um, angling shop. So we do um, all disciplines, really, carp, course, sea, um, you know, match all sorts of, uh, you know, a whole variety of fishing stuff. And, and a ram raid. Uh, yeah, so we had a uh, sort of notification from the alarm company and the police at about, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night that, uh, yeah, somebody had actually backed a um, a pickup truck through the front of the store. Jeez. Um, yeah, and obviously it made a hell of a mess and, um yeah, so we're still sort of going through the insurance process at the moment and sort of working out exactly what was taken. But, um, yeah, a bit of a nightmare, mate. And, and, of course, the worst thing about it is being, you know, so close to Christmas, trying to get hold of anybody. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, like, the, you know, the police were on scene straight away, which was great. But, um, yeah, just trying to get hold of the insurance company, even though they all say, yeah, 24-hour helpline and stuff. Phone no. just rings and rings and rings, no answer. Um, Merry uh, Christmas. Then, yeah, literally, <laughs> Merry Christmas. Um, so yeah, that was, um, yeah, an absolute nightmare to be honest. So yeah. The then, only way is up though, isn't it? Well, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's like, I think, you know, the whole cost of living thing at the moment, there's a lot of desperate people out there, you know, people just do whatever they can to, to try and put a few quid in their pocket, I suppose. So, um, but yeah, for, for, you know, I think the tackle trade's not in the best sort of place at the moment. It's hard going for all the shops really. Um, you know, and to then see that happen as well at a time of year when you're hoping for, you know, a fair bit of, sort of decent trade over, you know, that certainly the week between Christmas and New Year historically has always been quite a good week for, for the shop. So to lose three or four days trading on a, a good period and then, of course, all the, you know, the structural damage to the shop and then all the stock that was taken as well. So, yeah, yeah not, that's not, not the best, mate, not the best at all. That is extreme, but it's a great shop in a great area. Loads of sea fishing stuff, loads of general course carp stuff, the whole lot, mate. I know it's a mega shop, so I'm sure... When it's all sorted, mate, it'll be... Uh, yeah, no doubt, mate. Yeah, we'll, we'll you know bounce back from it pretty quickly, I think. But, happy days. Um, yeah, so... You're angling, mate. It's synonymous with crazy European adventures <laughs> on whatever public lake you can possibly think of. And we're going to go through some highlight chapters on various lakes, namely Cassian, Dadaer, Shant, you know what I mean? Rainbow, mm. the likes of. Yeah. But... What I was fascinated to know about, and I think it was probably one of the first things we talked about when we planned this, is a little bit about your background and where sort of carp fishing came into play and what you did domestically. Because the southwest is where you're from, mate. It's Mm. around that area. Me, even being up north now and sort of even in modern day times, the southwest doesn't strike me as the most carpy place in terms of abundance of venues. Mm. So talk to me a little bit about about the upbringing, your development, and actually finding carp fishing domestically? I started um, 
sort of fishing with my dad actually like so many people probably yeah you know tell the same sort of story but so yeah my dad first took me when I was about seven or eight years old I think um and there's a quite a well-known lake in the new forest called Hatchet Pond which is like a big natural lake it's probably about I don't know 20 odd acres in size and my dad used to take me out there on the odd occasion just with a little float rod you know like we, we all start just fishing with maggots and worms um and there's a bit of the lake where you've got like a roadway behind you, like a, you know, a public road, um, a nice gravelly bank. So it's quite shallow and close, quite safe, you know, when you're a youngster. Yeah. Um, so yeah, dad used to take me out there on a weekend and we'd just sit there float fishing, catching silvers and, and little perch and stuff. Um, I think I just literally drove him mad every drop in tangled. Oh dad, you know, can you try and help me sort this out? And, um, he, you know, he was forever like tying up new hooks and, and new floats and stuff. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much where it started really. Um, and my dad's background, he, oh, both him and mum came from, from Liverpool. Um, they were born and bred in, in the Northwest. And then dad had a job with um, BAT, British American Tobacco. Right. And then he was relocated um, when they opened a branch in Southampton. So they offered him a role down, you know, in the Southampton branch, which he took. Um, so they ended up sort of buying the house down here. Um, obviously, then I came along and, and, and dad was always a keen angler. He was sort of quite into his river fishing. Yeah. Um, he used to sort of fish on the, uh, when they moved down south, he used to fish for, for Christchurch Angling Club on, they, they had two teams, like an A team and a B team. Um, and he was never quite good enough to get into the A team. I think he tried, um, but he couldn't quite make it. So he used to fish for the, for the B team and they used to do like winter league matches and stuff on the lower stour. Right. Down at Christchurch. Nice. Um, but I know when he lived in the Northwest, he used to go and fish on the river D at Chester. Um, you, you might know it, yeah, obviously being from that way. So it's quite a big, powerful current you know deep river so he was quite accomplished as a, a, a sort of river you know running water angler um uh, and then yeah so once I started to get into it then he initially sort of took me on you know hatchet pond like I mentioned and we used to go to some other sort of smaller lakes in the forest um you know just again just catching sort of small silvers and stuff and then gradually progressed on to taking me onto the river um you know learning to trot and use a stick flow and, and, and that sort of style of fishing as well so um yeah, and and then I think you know the carp fishing was um, probably an accidental progression. Really, I remember he took me to a little lake in the forest called Sway Lakes, which was only about five minute drive from where we lived, uh, and it was uh, like a man made lake, mm -hmm. really beautiful little complex, um, loads of reeds around it and lilies, um, you know, sort of your your sort of typical carp lake. You know, if you, if you had to think of like an English carp lake, you know, with all the pads in it and stuff. Um, and I can remember him taking me there and by this time I'd sort of progressed up to using, um, I think it was like a Bob Church specialist rod or something. Right. Um, and he had like this beautiful old center pin. I can't remember the, the make of it, like a gold colored pin. So he sought me out to Wallace cast, you know? Yeah. Um, and I remember sitting there one Sunday afternoon and we had like a, a big sort of quill float out by the pads and a bunch of maggots on there. Oh, so the floats gone. I've hooked into this carp and. That was the, you know, I can still remember the sensation now, you know, feeling that power on the end of the rod. And of course this fish has gone through the pads out the other side. It was, you know, I was never going to land it in a million years. Um, but yeah, from that point on, that was, I thought, yeah, that's, that's what I want. I want more of, more of that feeling of sort of, uh, you know, feeling a, a bigger fish on the end of the line. Um, and then sort of when I sort of, you know, got into my school years, we, um, we used to go to a little complex of lakes called Hordle Lakes, right. uh, near New Milton where we lived. Um, and it's sort of become quite a renowned commercial fishery now that initially there used to be two lakes on, on, on site, what they call the, the bottom lake and the top lake. Um, obviously man-made yeah. and they were quite similar to Sway, not quite as nice looking you know, they, they didn't have all the lilies in like Sway did, but, um, they were full of carp, big perch, you know, decent sized roach, you know, good sort of mixed fishery. Um, so I used to spend literally every minute I could, I was down there, you know, should have been at home revising for exams and stuff, <laughs> never did. Um, and the actual owner of the lake, a guy called Mike Smith, um, he used to let me and one of my friends, a chap called Jim Carpenter, who probably familiar to a lot of people, yeah, yeah, definitely. a lot of people, um, you know, that will listen to this. Um, I met Jim at school. We went to the same school and he was a year above me, um, but he lived literally about a hundred yards from, from Hordle. So we used to meet there after school, you know, chuck the rods out and um, we were trying all sorts, you know, it was a, a time, you know, sort of back in the eighties where, um, you know, fishing was all about experimentation. You would try different baits, you'd make all sorts of different concoctions, pastes, and, yeah. you know, all sorts of things like that. So, you know, normally we'd have like a float rod and a feeder rod, 
Yeah. So, yeah. you know, so we weren't quite at that stage with all the, you know, the proper cart gear. We hadn't quite got to that point yet. Um, you know, but you'd have like a drift beater float out fishing with a cube and meat or something. And then I remember like my, my feeder rod setup, I had like, um, obviously some people will remember there was a, a, a bite alarm called a Magno bite alarm. Um, Magno a, yeah, a BJ Magno, whoever thought BJ was an appropriate <laughs> name for, a, for a brand. I don't know. Um, but yeah, they were like a sort of rectangular black box with a little V and used to sit the rod in there and it had like a, an orange needle, you know, and you right. used to loop the line around that. And of course, when the fish pulled, you would make a contact and it would make this horrendous sort of beeping noise. Um, so yeah, you know, that with a bottle top on the line and stuff. So it was all very, you know, sort of Heath Robinson, but, um, yeah, yeah and, you know, we were catching carp up to, you know, I think six, seven, eight pound. Yeah. You know, they, they were probably the biggest ones in there at the time. Um, but yeah, loved it. You know, literally spent every minute we could, you know, you know, jump on a push bike after school, straight down the lake. Um, and it's, it's quite a nice touch actually. So I actually, you know, dropped in there a few years ago now. And as you drive into the complex, there's a whole big row of conifer trees, really, you know, big mature trees. And we actually planted those sort of back in the day. Um, right, you know, cool. and Mike used to so probably use as a bit like slave labor really, but you know, we used to do all <laughs> sorts of maintenance around the lakes and, you know, planting trees and stuff in exchange for a bit of free fishing. Um, you know, but that's how it worked. And then, um, yeah, sort of from that progressed from there really onto, you know, some of the, the bigger waters around Ringwood, um, yeah. you know, which have obviously become you know, yeah. sort of household names now. Um, you know, Summerley Lakes, which was, I would say probably the lake that I sort of really cut my teeth on, um, you know, as a, dare I say it, a serious carp angler, but, um, you know, that, that was the one that I really learned to fish on, on sort of bigger waters and, and of course, going somewhere like that, you instantly you're mixing with more experienced anglers, you know, people that have been obviously doing it a bit longer and they're a bit older than you. So naturally you start learning straight away and, you know, you see things, people, you know, people doing certain things and, you know, baiting up in a certain way and you think, oh, you know, yeah, I can see why he's doing that. So gradually you're sort of building a picture of, you know, how to fish on the, the sort of bigger, more difficult places, really. What um, did your dad think about you going down the the sort of carp route because he seems like a very very much like a specialist river angler that's his bag yeah that's his sort of passion obviously he sort of molded you in in a similar light and then you've discovered carp on a cent on a center pin as well mate how yeah how beautifully the, 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 the purist, yeah absolutely yeah. um yeah he obviously had no pro- problem with it at all um you know he, he still very much loved his his river fishing yeah um but yeah, one thing I probably haven't mentioned to you at this point, but my mum also was a very, very keen angler. Was she? Yeah, yeah, mad keen. Um, and when my dad eventually retired, they literally, I think mum got a little bit fed up being left at home. Okay. Because like on a Saturday and Sunday, they would, you know, go and do the shopping on a Saturday morning and then oh, me and Mike are going fishing. And poor mum, bless her, was a bit, oh, great. You know, what am I going to do? So she actually came with us a couple of times, didn't fish and just sort of sat there and read a book and stuff and, and really enjoyed it. And she's oh, actually, I'm going to try, you know, get me a rod and reel and I'll, I'll give it a go as well. Mate, that was it. Literally. She was, you know, if you think I'm keen and my dad was keen, like she was like keen times 10. It was just ridiculous. Um, you know, and she got into actually making all her own baits and, um, oh, that's cool, isn't it? yeah, you know, and he, he, even like sometimes she'd just go fishing on her own, which, you know, and you think like, a, a, you know, it wasn't a young lady, obviously she was sort of in her fifties and that at this time. Um, you know, and I always thought that actually takes some balls to go and do that. 100%, you know, to, fair play yeah, to, to, you know, just sort of go and do a day's fishing on her own without any, you know, any sort of, you know, sort of help or guidance from anybody else. So, um, but yeah, so, you know, fishing was always yeah in the household, you know, where somebody would be in the kitchen rolling bait or, you know, um, I'd be out fishing and come back and then mum and dad would be out fishing. And, you know, there, there was this, this constant, sort of, you know, fishing presence in the household, really. So Love that, mate. You talked there, you referenced sort of Ringwood. Obviously, nowadays, people might know Rockford, they might know Roach, they might know all those lakes. Mm. They've obviously grown into what they've grown into. At the time, when you step foot on those lakes, what sort of age are you? What, you said there a little bit and sort of hinted at mixing with people and developing your carp angling, but where are you up to when you sort of go to those lakes? Because as you say, the lakes you've mentioned before are... Your typical sort of mixed mm. fisheries with a few carp in, you've got your, your two rod set up, a float and a feeder, and you're, you're yep. developing in that manner, which is a pretty organic and natural. And then, as you say, this is this is a tear up in terms of the angling. So what sort of age are you? 
And, um, and how do you find that first sort of introduction? I would say probably I would have been about 12 or 13, I reckon. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, I obviously relied heavily on my parents for, for you know, for transport to get to, you know, to, to and from the lakes and stuff. Um, and I can remember when I was at secondary school, I had a paper round. Um, so every morning I used to get up at stupid o'clock, you know, like half past five or something like that, cycle about two miles to the paper shop um, and then sort of do my paper round. And I used to earn 95p a day, which like when you when you look at it now, you just Jeez. think, Jesus, that is like proper slave labour. Um, and I used to, yeah, so Saturday morning I used to go do my round, get paid. So I had like, you know, £5.70 or whatever, however it worked out for the week. Um, and my mum and dad used to take me to a little tackle shop in Christchurch, um, which is about 10, 15 minute drive from home. And there was a, a great shop there still going nowadays uh, called Davis Tackle. Yeah. Um, right on the royalty fishery. So th- they used to have a whole range of stuff. They used to do, you know, mainly river carp, um, sorry, river tackle, Yeah, you know, for the chub and the barbell anglers, pike stuff, quite a lot of game tackle, but they did have a few carp rods and stuff in there. Um, and I can always remember I saw these rods lined up in the window and there was one particular rod. It was a tri-cast ultralight. Yeah. 12 foot two pound multi-range. And I kept looking at this and it was, it was like a hundred quid completely out of range, you know, for me. Um, and the guy that owned the shop at the time, a guy called Graham Pepler, he actually said, look, bring you five pounds 17 each week and we'll set up a, a little book for you. Oh, legend. And just keep paying it off week by week. Um, and I was thinking, like, I wanted two rods. You know, I wanted a matching pair and I wanted optonics and all the, all the you know, the, the, the proper stuff. Um, and it just took me forever, mate. I was like, every Saturday, come on, let's go down to Davis and pay a bit more money off. Obviously, what I didn't realise, mum had also been chipping a bit of money off at the same oh. time. Bless her. So, um, yeah, I managed to sort of, you know, get the rods a bit quicker. Um, so that was it, mate. As soon as I had these, uh, these tricasts, I thought I was like, the bee's knees. Where did um, that influence come from? Was that from seeing other anglers with the two rod set up and yeah, and the sort d- definitely. Of, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, you would see anglers. I mean, you know, bearing in mind fishing somewhere like Sway and Hordle, you, you know, the biggest cast is twenty yards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, you could you could cast across a lake easily, but you know, go to Summerlee and Summerlee is it's it's not a, a sort of conventional shaped pit. It was you know when it was dug, um, they left quite a few islands in there, right? And spits and little peninsulas that jut out, so. You know, you could look at it from all sorts of different points on the lake and it would look like a different lake entirely. You know, we used to call it the Car Park Bay and that was sort of quite intimate, little islands there, all like overhanging trees on it. Um, you know, then you'd go to the main part of the lake and it was like a big open expanse of water. Right. So, you know, How big was it in total? Um, I think it's about 18 acres, 17 oh, so or 18. A, that's a fair old sheet in terms so, yeah, of the so, stepping so stone. Yeah, so in, in terms of where I had been fishing to go up to that was, was quite a progression really. Mm. Um, you know, and I, I remember I had some old Mitchell 300 S's that I think I inherited off dad. Um, you know, so he used to churn, used to get, you know, when he had a, a bite, you'd get the old churners and you know, wrap your knuckles on, on the real handle. Um, but yeah, so having those rods was a, you know, that was a major sort of step forward, really just being able to fish at, at sort of longer distance than I, I previously had been able to. The fishing uh, on there, do you remember your first carp on there? Um, I remember my first bite on there. Yeah. Um, and this will make you laugh, actually. I used to keep a diary. So like a lot of anglers back in the day, and I know some people do, and I, I actually regret not carrying it on because I used to take a thermometer, used to log a water temperature, wind direction, everything. Jeez. Um, you know, I, I was really into it, you know, to, to, at this point. Um, and I can remember it. it was a winter's day. I think it was around about December time. And mum had dropped me to the lake. And in the car park bay there, you couldn't fish nights. You could only sort of day fish that part of the lake. Right. Um, all the night fishing was done by like a pre-booking basis. So that was about six quid a night or something. Never had the money for that mm. at that point. So um, I joined the club and basically just used to go up there and just fish afternoons and days, you know, when, when I could get a lift to the lake. And um, I can remember this particular day, it was freezing cold. And mum had dropped me there. And the, the bit I was fishing, basically, that you had like a, a sort of roadway running around the lake. Yeah. Um, and then a couple of steps down and they'd sort of cut some sort of gravelly swims, you know, down at water level. Um, they were completely flooded. Obviously there'd been a lot of rain and the lake's sort of fairly close proximity to the Avon. So when the Avon used to come up in level, that used to affect the water level in the lake as well. And um, I had to actually put my rods up on the, the sort of high bank on the road. So right. I had, the, you know, like some two rod buzzer bars by this point and some optonics. Um, and I sort of being a gravelly bank, 
as we've probably all done it, we sort of try and push the bank stick in. It's all loose and wobbly and yeah. you use a couple of sticks or something and sort of wedge <laughs> yeah. it in a hole to sort of try and try and firm the whole thing up. And uh, I can remember, and I'd, I'd literally just written in my diary, it was about f- five past four in the afternoon, uh, Summerlee Lakes, December, the whatever day it was, um, no action. And of course, I wrote a bit of detail about rig and bait and stuff I was using. And I've heard a couple of beeps and I've just happened to look up, mate, and, and the rod, my right-hand rod was sort of fishing probably 20, 30 yards out to a little island there and some overhanging trees on it. Right. it it's literally just took off. Oh. Um, and I, I can just remember being in a complete panic, you know, and the real handle spinning, the bank sticks, everything's just like collapsed, you know, yeah. being dragged off down the gravel and um, sort of hooking into this carp. And it, and it just felt different to anything that I'd ever sort of felt before, you know, just on a, on a, a, a complete different level. And uh, of course, this fish has just gone tr- straight through every branch it could. Oh. You know, I could feel the grating on the line, and of course, it's gone. And um, that was it. I was just like, yeah, literally terrified. You know, <laughs> yeah. shaking with you know all the adrenaline of it. So, um, yeah, and it sort of went on from there. You know, um, I, I just wanted more of that sort of experience. And um, I can remember my very first twenty pounder from there. Um, it was a fish called Blueback, beautiful old carp. It looked a bit like petals, you know, remember petals from, yeah. from Lynch Hill? Um, and it had a bit of a checkered past. Apparently it, it, it was obviously a summerly fish. Um, and then I believe it got, got taken from the lake and somebody put it into another lake um, up near Salisbury somewhere. Um, so obviously a bit of a traveller. A bit yeah. of a traveller, yeah. And then it eventually it worked its way back into its, its sort of rightful home. And um, yeah, that that was my first one. I remember I was using Richworth... Um, no, cream cajouses, I think. Right, no, yeah. sorry, Nutribates, cream cajouses. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the ready-mades. Um, obviously, you know, bait had all moved on and developed yeah. from those early days. You know, then you could go and buy a, a good, decent quality sort of shelf life bait or, you know, the Richworth freezer baits and stuff. Um, and I remember catching this fish. It was 23 pound one ounce, I think. That's um, a big one, no? Which, yeah, so for, you know, for, for my first sort of summerly you know, fish was, uh, you know, or noteworthy fish um, was, yeah, I was blown away catching that. And then it, it just sort of went on from there. I was just there as, as much as I could and started obviously, um, you know, doing nights as well. Um, and I remember I had like um, a 50 inch wave lock brolly yeah. with one of the Nash um, canvas over wraps. Yeah. Probably a lot of people remember these and like during the winter time, they used to go completely stiff right. know, when it was cold and wet Rigid. and you, you could actually like take the brolly out. And, just leave the over and the thing would just stand there on its own. They, they were the most incredible shelter. Yeah, really, really good. But um, not the one to pack up, you know, when it was wet. And, of course, you're mm. trying to fold this canvas up, and it's, yeah, absolute nightmare. So, <laughs> yeah, ge- gear's moved on so much, hasn't it, since those days. But um, <laughs> The fishing yeah. sounds, those early fishing memories, as you say, like, they're all mega. They all take you back there as an angler. The, the, the progression for your angling on there, I'm guessing, obviously, you've had your first bite, a nightmare. You've caught a 23-pounder. Mm. Your learning curve on there, did you obviously the bait game moved on. Rigs, was it technical? Was it where to find them? Was it just knowing the venue? Over a course of time, did you did you sort of tick all those boxes and find it easier yeah, and easier? I, I think so, mate, yeah. Um, I mean, really just by watching other people, you know, and, and sort of learning from other people's results and... Um, gradually you could sort of piece different sections of the lake together. Um, you know, so there were certain ways you would fish, you know, one part of the lake. Um, you know, the, the bit I mentioned, like the car park bay, that was all um, sort of very close range fishing, really. Um, you know, so you're a bit of a bush rat, really. You'd just be sort of tucking a rod down the margins mm. and, you know, sort of sitting there hit and hold fishing. Um, and then generally speaking, if you're in one of the night fishing swims, normally it was more open water fishing. Um, you know, so then sort of feature finding became more of a thing. I mean, Summerley isn't a particularly featured lake, really. There's a few sort of undulations and, you know, the odd bar and plateau, but generally speaking, it's fairly uniform and, you know, a mixture of sort of soft silt and hard silt. So, you know, over time you learn which were the better areas to, you know, sort of present your baits and stuff. But, um, I mean, the actual stock um, was a real mixture of mainly smaller commons and all the bigger fish were mirrors. Right. Um, and this was the only place I'd ever fish where the, the, the carp had names, you know, that was a new thing. Yeah. So you had like, you know, the, 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 the upper echelons really, you know, maybe 10, 15 fish that were named and they were the ones that were most revered. You know, they, they, those are the ones that you wanted to catch. And uh, I, I always remember there, there used to be um, a very elderly guy, a guy called Hamish, who I think he 
uh, whether he was some some kind of involvement with a club, like Ringwood Club that had the lake at the time. And he used to go around sort of checking tickets. Yeah. Um, and he, I mean, I, he can't have been a year younger than 80, mate. He was, he was quite an elderly fella. And he had like a little Fiat 127, um, you know, one of those tiny little, almost like a little bubble car. And he used to drive around this, you know, around the lake in this car. And even if it was like 30 degrees plus in the summer, all the windows done up and he had like a woolly hat and his coat. Oh, we, used to think, we used to think, Christ, how's he still alive? You know, like literally cooked to death in his own car. Um, and he used to sort of pull up behind you, wind the window down, any mirrors? What's he going on about? And of course, all he was interested in was logging any captures of the mirrors. Right. And then he would sort of write down the date, the weight, you know, where the fish was caught and so on. Um, and there used to be like a little tin hut in the car park where he used to go in and, and sit in there and smoke his fags and make a tea and stuff. And there were all these old pictures around, you know, typical old sort of fishing hut, um, you know, where people are giving him photos of the often you couldn't go in there, you know, it'd be locked if he wasn't around or something, but you could always peer through the window and just see all of these photos of all these big, these big mirrors in the lake. Hamish, um, the legend. Yeah, the legend. Um, and then you had like the, the main estate keeper, a guy called John, John Lavelle, who, who still sort of, I think he's the head keeper for Somerley Estate now. Okay. Um, and it, John sort of ruled the lake with a bit of an iron fist. You know, you had to be very careful if you were doing the odd moody thing or. What moody you know, things did you do, mate? Uh, on you know nothing major, but um, you know obviously as you sort of get a bit older, then you you start having a beer when you go fishing and stuff, and right. you know sometimes you'd be you might be fifty yards off your rod. So I'm not obviously not condoning it, but you know there'd be a social in somebody's swim, and you yeah, I'll oh, just leave the rods out and wander down there. And uh, he always used to find out, you know, you'd think he'd get away with it, but the next day he'd come around and give you a bollocking, like you know if I if I catch you off your rods again, mate, you're gone. You were like, right, okay. <laughs> Sorry, mate. So, yeah, John used to sort of rule the lake with, uh, you know, with a, a, a bit of fear in all the anglers. So, yeah, we obviously respected him and respected the fish, but, yeah, it's all sort of, you know, part of a learning curve growing up in you know, fishing in that sort of environment. Did you, right? you catch most of that A team or those mirrors or not? Yeah, I had quite a few. Um, I, didn't, I don't think I caught all of them. Um, I caught my first 30 pounder from there. Oh, uh, that's a, which, what year is this? Oh, God. That is a big fish, isn't it? going to say 1990. Wow. Yeah, 1990, 91. Um, that was just on a day session. Um, yeah, big sort of grey coloured fish. Yeah, a nice one called called Joey. Um, I was trying to think of some of the other names. There was a, a, a big sort of fully scaled one in there called Mavis. Mavis? I'm not sure where the name came from. Um, that was more of a friendly one. That used to get caught quite a lot. Um, and that was, I think his, his top weight was probably low 30s, but that was like a proper classic, you know, proper mm. fully scaled, you know, big scales all over it. Uh, you had Billy Boy, Billy which was uh, Boy. that. I think that actually became the biggest one in there. I think its top weight was about thirty six or thirty seven. Eventually, um, yeah, one called Golly, which was a big sort of deep like a football. Uh, C- I love carp names. I know, mate. yeah, where these names come from. Uh, C and D, another one. Um, C and D, yeah. So yeah, they, they, these were the you know the, the the top ones that everybody wanted to catch. Um, and at the time, none of the commons had really progressed. You know, they they were all mainly sort of you know ten to sort of eighteen pound. Yeah. And then gradually over time, a few of them started to push through. You know, so there were a few sort of nice commons in there as well. So, yeah. mate, it sounds like a mega place. Your your time post that, obviously, you're developing, you're finding the sort of solutions, you're progressing as an angler. Was it a simple case of working your way around those venues? And was your angling geared towards just getting a bite and catching a few? Or did you start to sort of crave or seek bigger carp, if you like? Um, no, I, I, to be completely honest, I was perfectly happy fishing on there. Um, and it, do you know what? If I could get a ticket back on there now, I would actually go back and fish on there. Mm. Um you know, purely for sentimental reasons as, as much as anything. But um, I, I wasn't really that aware of all the other lakes in close proximity. I mean, really, you know, th- at that point, Summerlee was, you know, um, you know, obviously it was open access. You could, anybody could join Ringer Angling Club and then latterly Christchurch Angling Club sort of took the lease on. So anybody could join. Um, and it was quite well known nationally as one of the best sort of 20 pounders venues Ooh, that yeah. you could go and catch you know sort of you know fish of that stamp um so yeah i wasn't in any rush to sort of go and fish anywhere else to be honest um i, I do actually remember there used to be um an old savvy 
angler, a chap called Cliff Howard. Mm-hmm. Um, there'll be some people again that will probably remember Cliff. He's sort of sadly not with us anymore. Um, and I used to bump into cliff fishing on there and he had obviously fished a lot around the Con Valley venues, Savay, Harefield. So he was like mega experienced and, you know, talking to him, we, we literally hang off every word, you know, he, yeah. he had all his kit was the bollocks, you know, all like the stainless satellite system and, you know, converted Delkins and, you know, and I, I sort of really, really looked up to the guy at that point. And, uh, he was a big fella, like larger than life character. He was, I don't know. 26, 28 stone, big lad. Proper big Um, And he, he, he couldn't sit on a chair. You know, he was such a size that he had to yeah. sit on a seat box when he was fishing. Um, and he would just sit there perched on his box all day, smoking big cigars. And he used to drive, <laughs> he used to drive like, um, oh, I want to say like a Cadillac or a Buick, that type of like American car. What? Um, yeah, proper, proper character. But um, I mean, he just taught me so much about, you yeah. know, he, he was sort of quite a technical angler. He would, you know, a bit more advanced with rig making and that sort of thing. Um, and I always remember one time he, I turned up to fish and he was there fishing in the car park bay with, um, turned out to be Johnny Allen. Again, right. very old school, yeah. very well known, you know, massively respected angler. Obviously they were good friends. Um, and I think Johnny had come down to fish with Cliff and stay with him for a few days. And they had basically decided rather than night fish, they were just going to day fish in the car park bay and they, they baited really, really heavily. So they fished the day hammered a load of bait in and then went back the following day and they absolutely battered it. I think they had about 20 odd fish, which at that time was just unheard of. Mm. Um, you know, and I remember just thinking, Christ, you know, who are these guys? Like they're just on another level to, um, you know, to, to, um, you know, me and my friends were at that point. And I can remember it's around about that same time. Cliff told me that he'd been over and fished on the roach pit. Right. Um, obviously I knew of the roach pit. Um, you'd seen it in the club book, you know, and all the rules and regulations and stuff. And, uh, my dad said, why why don't we go and have a look? He said, let's go over there pike fishing to start with. So on the odd Sunday morning, we'd just walk around there with a lure rod, you know, just catching little jacks and stuff. Um, and there used to be a few bigger pike in there. I I came close to one, one dad, one sort of follow the lure in and, and I see it swim past like, and I was like, Jesus, that's a big pike. (laughs) And then I think it eventually got caught that fish. A guy called John Cheatham caught it like thirty three pound or something. Oh my god! Um, I thought it, you were going to say like mid double. Oh or no, something. mate! It was it was a giant. I think it was actually the club record for a while. Um, but yeah, so I got wind of, of Cliff going over there carp fishing. Um, I wasn't even aware there were carp in there at this point. Right. Um, and I, I think basically what happened there, there's friends of mine who sort of fished extensively on the lake, far more than me at that point. Um, and they, they would be far better placed than me to tell you where the fish came from and, you know, how they eventually ended up in there. But, um, yeah, it turned out there were a few decent carp in there, but, and, and of course the roach pit is just a different animal altogether. It, not in terms of size, it was sort of similar size to Summerlee, but, mm. um, you know, the water in Summerlee had quite a lot of bream in there. So there was always a bit of a tinge to it. It was never crystal clear apart from the odd occasion during the winter. Um, of course over the roach pit, mate, it was just Tap, tap clear yeah and you know and i've never experienced anything like this at all um you know fishing in sort of heavy weed and uh i can remember sort of going over there the first couple of times and i was just like mate i'm so far out of my depth here. i literally just don't know where to start um and sort of cliff had been doing a bit of fishing over there um obviously the guys i mentioned you know very good friends of mine roland wood uh richie graham simon casey uh and i think they were again probably a year or two more advanced Ever than me long, in, yeah. t- in terms of sort of development as, 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 you know, as an angler really. Um, yeah. And, and I really struggled by my own admission, you know, I, I just couldn't really get into it. So I kept going back to somebody that was my sort of default. Fail you know, save. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know I can go there and catch fish and, you know, I was pretty successful on there. You know, I was, you know, most, most years on there I was catching, you know, 18, 20 pounders a season. Yeah. Nice. Which, you know, for at that point, I, I was quite, you know, quite proud of, and, you know, a few people sort of started to say, oh yeah, Mike Brown's got another 20 pounder. Um, you know, so I was sort of getting a little bit of, you know, sort of, you know, people knowing of me in the sort of Ringwood area. Um, but yeah, sort of going over to the Roach Pit was, um, yeah, just a step up really in, in, in development again, you know, as, as, uh, you know, as, as part of my fishing really. Um, but yeah, I, I sort of stuck with it. I didn't do loads and loads of fishing on there, but I kept sort of going over for the odd night and uh, eventually started to catch the odd one or two. What was the but, key to that? Um, I think really was sort of learning to fish in the weed. That was probably, 
the 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 thing I struggled with most was um was just sort of trying to you know find clear spots basically. So you did you did find clear spots. Yeah, you yeah. didn't just chuck it, it in low lying weed or no no no. I mean up. yeah, there, there you know there were some areas of the lake where um you could actually see you know sort of big clearings in the weed and you know by this point you sort of learned how to sort of you know fill the bottom a little bit more and yeah um yeah so you know gradually it's like anyway the more you fish the more you piece it together and you know it all sort of starts you know clicking into place but there were there were some really really good anglers on there at this point the lads i've mentioned you yeah. know I, th- I think simon uh he caught i'm fairly sure the, the first ever 30 pounder from there um and there was a guy from salisbury a guy called bob adams i'm not sure he's still fishing anymore but bob had sort of fished other waters around i was you know a few people knew of him you know he had mm. a bit of a reputation very very quiet um you know he, he was quite open he'll talk to you um but it, you know, he wasn't like a sort of flamboyant character or anything like that. He was sort of quite kept himself to himself. Um, and he absolutely battered the roach there. It was just ridiculous what he caught. You know, and at this point, the fish were sort of really going through a growth stage on there. So there were, you know, you'd gone from Summerley with maybe one or two 30s and all of a sudden go over to the roach pit and, you know, he was catching like 36, 34. Oh you know, they, they were like different level really. Why, why were uh, they growing? Is it because of the introduction of bait, the development in bait, the amount of bait, or was it because um, it was just that stage in those fishes sort of time? Yeah, I just think just more the latter, I think. You yeah. know, there, there weren't loads of people fishing on there at that point. There right. was, you know, just like a little, quite a little close-knit community, really, and they sort of kept it fairly quiet, really. Obviously, for, you know, for the right reasons, they didn't want too many people yeah. over there. So, um, But, yeah, Bob used to fish um, a lot of margin fishing. He would sort of go around bait spots close in, and he always had like a big white bucket, you know, like the big sort of plasters buckets full of trout pellet. Right. He used to carry around with him all the time. Um, but his observation was just on another level. Like I remember standing in the swim one day, you know, and you sort of creep in behind him and he'd be like, oh, there's one there, there's one on the spot. And he, I couldn't even see it, you know, and it, sure enough, he'd get a take and he'd, he'd be playing one. And yeah, I, I'd never sort of experienced a, an angler, you know, really before or since, you know, he was, he was next level. And, um, I can remember sort of waking up during the night sometimes. He'd, he'd be walking past with his kit yeah. at two, three in the morning. I'd be like, Jesus, where's he off to? He'd obviously heard fish somewhere else and that was it. Gone. So, you know, in, in terms of um, effort and, and keenness and, and really wanting to sort of, you know, catch on there, he was, yeah, he was something else. Yeah, learned, learned quite a lot from him really. But uh, Your captures on there? What what resonates for you over um, your time on there? I, I, I'll be honest, mate. I really struggled on there. I didn't, yeah. I've never caught that many from there. Um I can remember I caught, um, um, actually by this point, Jim, I mentioned earlier, Jim Carpenter. Yeah. Um, Jim was doing a lot of fishing on there. Um, and he was really successful, mate. You know, he, he just dialed into it straight away. Um, he had a really good method going. Again, he was using the trout pellet mm. and he was sort of using the spod. I've never God. used anything like that before. Um, you know, so that, that was a learning curve as well. But, you know, Jim was very accurate, very methodical, you know, and he would sort of bait very, very accurately in amongst the weed, big beds of pellet. And, uh, it, mate, he just caught him. He just caught pretty much everything in there, I think. So, yeah, there, there were some good anglers on there. But, um, yeah, I, I, I remember I, I caught one called Snubnose, um, right. which was, that became my PB for a while. That was sort of 35, I think. Um, I can't remember what else I caught. Um, there was one called Barbs, I think, which I caught at 31. So, yeah, I, I caught, you know, not numbers of fish, but I did sort of catch a couple of nice ones. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, it was enjoyable. Yeah, it really did. Uh, what prompted you moving on from there then? As you say, you've gone through a bit of a progression there. Suddenly well, you you could have stayed on, but you decided to go on to Roach. Roach is a mm. different sort of set of problems. You caught a few, maybe not as many, but you've sort of solved that problem. What what was the what was the catalyst to move on to another water? Well, uh, <laughs> bizarrely enough, um, France. <laughs> was it yeah that there? sort of came came around about that time so yeah what, what actually happened was there were a, a, a few lads that were fishing on Summerlee at the time that they announced that they were sort of oh we're, we're going to France we're going to go go and fish on this lake in France somewhere and of course this was at a time when um you know fishing in in France was I think very much in its infancy really there weren't mm. that many commercial venues um obviously you know people knew of Cassian and some of the famous lakes and I, I can remember thinking, why, why, why are you going over there for? You know, you've got big, big carp to catch, you know, yeah. in, in Ringwood. And um, 
I, I was a little bit dismissive of it, but curious at the same time. And I can remember when they came back and sort of saw him at the lake in a, in a few weeks after that. I was like, oh, yeah, how was, he, how was he trip? Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, you know, so-and-so caught a 38 and he had a 35 and they'd caught a load of, the, you know, nice ones. And I was thinking, well, oh, actually, that sounds all right. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so that sort of, you know, pricked my curiosity a bit more. And um, uh, a friend of mine at the time, he he was also sort of quite keen to go and give it a try. So, um, yeah, we, we, we sort of planned our first ever French trip. So this would have been probably around about 94, 95, I would okay. say. Mid-90s, yeah. Yeah, so around about then. Um, and, and that sort of changed everything to be honest. Yeah. So, you know, I was still fishing quite a bit in the UK. How'd you plan Um, that trip? What, what did you go off Intel or did you just get a map and think that's blue? I'll have a go there. Well, (laughs) um, it's a long story, mate, but I'll, yeah, I'll I'll tell you, um, we, we obviously had like the BK guide, um, which a lot of people probably still got a copy. Um, that was the Bible, you know, so we had this book that, you know, you had no internet, no smartphone. So all you had literally was just a few lines in a book to, to you know, to go on. Um, so we, we were sort of looking at possible venues um, and we decided that we, I remember sort of reading through all these pages and we picked almost at random, really, we sort of picked um, this complex of lakes and I can remember it saying, you know, a good head of thirties, chance of a 40, maybe a bigger one, something along those lines. And we were like, yeah, that'll do for <laughs> yeah. us, you know, let's, let's go there. So we booked a trip for the sort of, I think it was around September time, sort of September October, and we had a week. And I remember we booked a ferry from Southampton. We used to be able to sail from Southampton to Cherbourg, right? Um, but this is how ridiculous our planning was, right? So we we crossed from Southampton to Cherbourg, which is obviously you know northwest France. Mm-hmm. The lakes we were planning to go to were right across in the northeast, right. So, and you think, you know, with hindsight, why on earth didn't we just drive to Dover, yeah, over to Calais, done. you're there in a few hours. So we did like a four hour crossing from Southampton and then we drove all the way across without using any motorway at all. Ooh. Cause we were like, no, we're not paying for the auto route. We'll we just use all the minor roads. So we had to sort of skirt around Paris all the way across. Uh, mate, it took us, I don't know, 13, 14 hours, oh. something ridiculous, you know, on then obviously, you know, the, the time on the ferry on top. So, it was literally 24 hours traveling, give or take. Um, and I can remember panicking loads because we were sort of, you know, getting nearer and nearer to the, to the venue. Yeah. Kept looking at the time and I'm like, man, we, we're going to run out of daylight. You know, we were never getting fishing that first night, you know, in your head, you're sort of thinking, yeah, you, you could picture your bivy and your rods and your boat and everything like that it was never going to happen, not in a million years. Um, and we, we sort of got to this lake and it was a big water. It was like 1800 acres, I think. Jesus. Um, you know, far bigger, far in excess of anything we'd even seen before, you know, by this point. And, um, of course all you had was like, um, you know, the BK book and you had like a Michelin road Atlas, but they're not in any detail. So trying to find actual access points down to the water, yeah, just impossible, you know? And, and of course it's getting darker and darker and you're panicking a bit more like, Oh, you know, I'm going to lose a night's fishing sort of thing. And, um, I can remember that first night we, we literally gave up in the end. Like we, we were trying to find, you know, literally somewhere to get down to the water where we could maybe fish or, you know, we had no license. Um, obviously now you can do it all online, can't you? So yeah, it's a lot so easier. much easier. Um, and I can remember like saying to my mate, I said, look, we, we, we got to, you know, make a decision. We need to sort of write tonight off and then we'll start fresh tomorrow. And we drove down a little tiny track down into some woods. It was sort of quite a thick pine forest. I said, look, let's just put the beds out here tonight, sleep and then reassess and, and sort of start tomorrow. And uh, my mate said, yeah, that's fine. He said, look, I'm going to sleep in the truck. He had like a flatbed transit type thing. So we had all our gear in the back and he sort of laid across the front seats. And I said, look, that's, yeah, that's, that's cool, mate. I said, I'll put my bed chair out. And I sort of laid my bed chair alongside the van and I had my, like a, I think an oval brolly at the time and I had it sort of propped up, just leaning against the, against you know, the, the bed of yeah, the yeah. truck. And I can remember like, instantly going to sleep. I was so tired mm. and I can remember waking up after about an hour or two and it was pitch black. Like you're in the middle of a forest, like literally no ambient light at all. Mm. And I could hear like this rumbling, this booming in the distance. And I was like, oh, what is that? Of course, thunderstorm. Mm. Um, and it was getting closer and closer and closer. And I'm sort of starting to get a bit anxious by this point. And, you know, I've done a lot of fishing in France and like we all have fished in some crazy weather to this day, mate. I think that's probably one of the worst I've ever experienced. Um, I was literally terrified, mate. I, I can, yeah. The lightning was so vivid. 
Um, you know, even with your eyes shut, you could see it, you know, through your eyelids. Um, and the rain was that heavy. I, I didn't realise at, the, at the, this point that the water was actually sort of coming off my brolly down onto my bed. So I was sort of laying in this <laughs> this sort of wet puddle, basically. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you, you could hear, like, the lightning hitting trees in the woods and stuff. It You're was, in the forest as well, didn't you? Yeah, and it, it really, it was, um, yeah, nights to forget, basically. And I can remember getting up in the morning. You know, my mate's opened the truck, and he's like, oh, has it rained? I was like, <sighs> mate, don't even start. Do you know what I mean? It is, yeah, we are in a right mess, really. And, of course, I've sort of lifted my sleeping bag up, and it was just ringing wet through. Ooh. All our gear soaked in the back of the van. I was just like, oh, this is not not the start we wanted, really. Um so we, we sort of tried to find access down to this lake and it, it it very quickly became apparent that we were just so far out of our depth. You know, we, we didn't have a decent sized boat. Um, Had you done any boat work before no, at all in the UK? All. No, no, not at all. <laughs> so yeah, we, 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 we were sort of hopelessly unprepared really. Um, so we, we made the decision to drive back all the way, <laughs> all the way across pretty much to where we'd started. Um, so obviously earlier I mentioned about these guys that were fishing on Summerlee. They, they, obviously came across to France to fish and they told us a, a little bit about the venue where they went to. Um, right. And it was a gravel pit over in Brittany called the Grand Maison, the big house. Um, and it was about 30 odd acres, I think. Um, really, really well stocked. And it was sort of run as a pay lake. Right. And the actual property there, I think was a, like a rehab center for sort of recovering drug addicts. Um, so people like from the big cities like Paris and Bordeaux, Lyon, they used to get sent to this place literally to go cold turkey. Oh um, so it was a bit of a mad place, really. You that know, sounds you'd, mental. You'd, you'd see some sort of, you know, quite interesting characters wandering about, you know, while you were fishing. Um, and I can remember we, we sort of spent the whole day driving back across there, managed to get a swim, sort of spoke to the owner. He said, yeah, it's like, you know, 100 francs for the week or whatever it was. It was, yeah. it was. It was pretty cheap, you know. And got ourselves set up. And I think we had like um, a hutchy two-man dome. Yeah. And my mate had said, look, we'll both sleep in the one bivvy. Just put the beds next to each other. Yeah, no problem with that at all. And um, got our rods out fishing. So we had three rods out each and it was all sort of quite open water. So we literally just fanned the rods out for the first night, put one each down the margin, um, you know, throw and stick a few boilies in. Happy days. And uh, I've obviously crashed out. We were both really tired. And I can remember waking up in the morning and I actually had some like converted optonics with yeah. – the, you know, the plug-in leads and the sounder box. And I'd sort of, I was a little bit too far for my leads to reach back into the bivvy. So I had my sounder box sort of screwed into a little um, bank stick, pushed in, in the swim in front of me with a, a bit like a plastic bag over it in case it rained. Oh, in case it rained, yeah, yeah. And uh, my mate said to me, oh, finally awake then. And I looked after oh, yeah, yeah, I had a great night's sleep, thanks. He said, oh, you don't remember anything during the night then? No. And uh he said, my rods literally nonstop. I'd had about six takes. He had had about six takes. So he'd, poor bloke, he'd literally been up all night playing fish. And well, he, so he took them off your rods? Yeah, yeah. So he, he said, I literally couldn't wake you, Mike. He said, I was shaking you. Like, Mike, Mike, come on, wake up. Absolutely dead to the world. Um, yeah, so it's it a, it a mad sort of introduction into into French fishing, really. Um, but yeah, that, that was a brilliant week. It turned out to be the right move, really, because we obviously, you know, simply the size of the place. We felt a little bit more comfortable fishing yeah. the lake that size. And it was casting, um, wouldn't it? It was casting, like... didn't need a boat. Um, and it was full of carp, you know, and, that, and they were very easy to catch in truth. So, you know, everywhere you put a rod, you, you'd get a bite pretty much. Um, and, you know, we, we didn't catch any monsters. I think the biggest one we probably caught was maybe mid-30, I reckon. That would do, though, But again, it? you know, for, for your first introduction to it, it was, was brilliant fun, you know. And, and I think we went home with about 60-odd fish between us. So, uh, yeah, so it went from, from the jaws of disaster. We actually had, uh, you know, quite a decent week really. Um, and I, I think, I think the following year we went back there, um, we had another trip and again, that was really, really good. Um, caught a load of, you know, again, no monsters, but you know, lots of sort of 20 pounders, 20 to 30, I would say would be the average. Um, and it was, yeah, just, just really, really nice, relaxed, fun fishing, um, and I do remember my mate actually, he, he caught a really big catfish that week. That was my first experience. I'd never seen a cat other than, I remember, you know, when I was a kid delivering the old papers, there used to be one house that had a, um, uh, the Anglian Times on a Wednesday. Okay. And I can remember as a, as a youngster sort of, you know, walking up his drive to put his paper through and I'm there looking at the Anglian Times and sure enough, there's Johnny Allen with his big cat from, from Cassian. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I've never seen one in the flesh. And I remember my mate caught one this week and it was about 80 or 90 pound. Jeez, that's and, a big uh, It's a big cat. You know, for the first one you'd ever seen, it was like, yeah. Christ, you know, what is this thing? Um, so yeah, it was, it was a real sort of, um, you know, a good introduction to sort of fishing overseas, really. What was it about that? That Because obviously, I mean, and we'll fast forward, and we're going to talk through the chapters. As I said, obviously, present time, you ain't fished in England for a long time. Mm. And you've only sort of designate key times to go and do European adventures. What What do you think it was about about that first trip and about sort of, I don't know the feeling. The the everybody says it nowadays because it's a lot more popular in terms of that route, especially on the scene now. Mm. The, what is it about that that captivated you so much that ultimately it, it became the mainstay of your angling and sort of phased out your UK angling? Is it the freedom? Because you've had some nightmares. The storms a nightmare. <laughs> being shattered driving around is a nightmare. Mm. Like being a bit out of your depth and not really sure is a bit of a nightmare. Whereas you could just fall back onto roach or, or some of that and you know exactly what you're going to get. What, what what do you think it was in you that, that sort of, that sort of clicked with? Um, honest answer, I don't really know. I don't really know. I've never really been able to pinpoint why I love doing it so much to, to be completely honest. But um, I think I, I've always sort of liked a little bit of adversity in my fishing. Okay. If that makes sense. Um, you know, like take, to go back to Sumley for an example. I always, always used to like trying to catch carp from areas of the lake that, that weren't particularly popular. You know, it's like any, any sort of venue that there'll always be certain swims that tend to be taken first. And, yeah. you know, if you turn up and it's like, oh yeah, so-and-so points free, free, you're in there. Um, I was never really like that. I'd always sort of, you know, I'll, I'll tell you what, this week I'm going to go and try no carp corner, for example. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I've always sort of. I wouldn't say like to struggle, um, but I've always liked a little bit of adversity or edge in my fishing, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah whether going overseas perhaps sort of satisfied that with, within me. I'm, yeah, maybe, maybe that's, uh, perhaps that's what, you know, what it is. But um, yeah, I, again, I think just the whole adventure, you know, just going somewhere new, somewhere different, um, just a buzz. Yeah. It's just, you know, even to this day, it still is just a, a massive buzz, you know, doing that, that sort of type of fishing really. Um, you know, nowadays I would say I'm a little bit, obviously you're more confident with it. The more you do, um, you know, if something goes wrong, you just, just brush it off. You just, yeah. You know, just carry on. It's just, it's all part of the adventure. You know, back in those days it, you, you would, I think worry a lot more. Oh, you know, what if, what, what if something like happens, you know, what if something goes wrong with a car? Um, you know, and, and I think you sort of felt a long way from home yes. because, you know, nowadays communication's a lot easier, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I you get that. Pick up your mobile. You can text you, text your missus, you can text your family, um, you know, WhatsApp, you, you've got every means of communication available, you know, back in those days, no mobile phone, you know, no internet, no sat nav. So, you know, you were completely reliant on your instincts, you know, and reading a map and, you know, you literally just, just made it up as you went along really. But, um, I think that's probably what I enjoyed, about, you know, the most about it really was was that side of it. That makes sense, mate. To be fair, when you when you put it that manner, you're you're fishing at this time. You'd come back from your first trip. You went back out for your second trip. You're still doing your UK fishing in around those Ringwood waters, or is it starting yeah. to phase out and dwindle here with the yeah, poor passion I'd, for abroad? I'd say it, it probably did dwindle a bit. Um, yeah, well, I, was, I was still doing you know a fair bit of fishing, but uh, yeah, probably not quite as as regular as I was before. Um, but I'd still get in, you know, maybe one night a week or something, or, you know, okay. certainly on a weekend, just go for a day or, or, you know, a couple of days where, you know, where time allowed. So what was work um, at this point? Um, so I, back in, when I left school, I went to, to Sparshalt yes. and I, I spent a few years at Sparshalt. So I did a, uh, an ND in aquatics and ornamental fishery studies. Okay. Um, and I, I had a, a sort of vision of, working somewhere in sort of koi carp production. That's what I was, I was really interested in. Um, and as part of my, my, my course at Sparshot, I actually went out to Israel and I worked on a kibbutz Did you? in Israel. Yeah. Sort of, um, on one of the, the, the sort of major koi production centers yeah. over there. Um, and I spent pretty much the whole summer over there. So what I was, was that like amazing. Was yeah, it? Yeah. I mean, obviously now is sort of quite, you know, pertinent now with everything that's going on over there. Yeah. Um, which is terrible to see, but, um, I loved it. It's the most incredible country. I always found the people really, really warm and friendly. 
Um, and I think I was there for about three months in total. So we used to get up in the morning at about four o'clock. Um, and obviously, you know, part of the whole deal of staying on a kibbutz, you had to work basically to pay for your accommodation for and, your stay, and your food yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Um, so they used to get us up quite early. We would be out on the, on the fishery at about four, half past four. Um, basically just in the, in the pond, seine netting, you know, sort of manhandling the fish into big sort of plastic bins and then onto a truck and then back to the, you know, back to the farm to be sort of, you know, graded and processed and stuff. Um, absolutely loved it. It was, I just literally had the best time. So there was me and one other guy from Sparshot that went together. Um, you know, and then the afternoon you would just sleep, you know, right. and then get up, have a bit of food and then you'd just be on the beers, on the wine, go and play tennis, go for a swim. Um, oh, yeah, it really, good, mate. it was brilliant, mate. You had a, had a really good time over there. Um, and the people that, uh, that sort of run the fishery, they said, look, you know, you're only here for a few months. So if you want some time off to go traveling, um, we're quite happy for you to do that. I never told the people back at college, obviously. Um, so yeah, they gave us like a week off and, oh. and we just backpacked around Israel. We went to, um, you know, into Tel Aviv and actually slept on Tel Aviv beach for a couple of nights. Um, you know, stayed in a hostel. Then we went up to, to Haifa, um, went to Jerusalem, went to the, the Dead Sea down. That's like, in you, know. you then, that little traveller bug's in yeah, you, isn't so, it? So I think, yeah, probably from that point, it's always been, yeah, something sort of clicked in me. I thought, yeah, that's, that's cool. I, I really enjoyed doing that. So yeah, cool. and that, that's, you know, probably sort of transcended into my fishing, you know, over the years, you know, going forward. So talk to me a bit about, and we're not, we'll go down through the European chapters, but the, the, the moment whereby you decide that your your main emphasis on your fishing, albeit a few nights or however that dwindled out, was going to be abroad on those trips and those venues. Talk to me about what happened at that point. What was going on that you thought, well, why am I doing this? Or I don't like this anymore. I prefer doing that. So I'm going to phase it out. What was going on? What, in terms of? In terms of why the, the sort of, I get that, the, the appeal of the foreign fishing, the travel bug, the sort of pioneering, seeing new places. Mm. But obviously, as a sort of a, as a, at the same time, your UK fishing ultimately is being completely curtailed and it's all going to be based in Europe. Mm. That trade off where your UK fishing sort of wanes and the European fishing comes in more heavily, what's going through your head there? Because it's quite a, I mean, nowadays, there's a lot of people who do it. There's mm. a lot of people who mm. will just fish in Europe yeah. and they will not even fish domestically at all. Mm. It's too busy. Uh, there's not enough availability of the size of fish that you could possibly catch and access abroad that there is in this country. Mm. You know what I mean? Top end syndicates only got a few members on it. There's loads of different reasons people have given as to why that is. At this time, when, when it happens with regards to your angling, it's not a great pe- amount of people doing that. There's normally a, a core base of UK angling and then there's the odd trip here, there and everywhere. Yeah. But there's a big switch that happens that's quite, well, forward ahead of its time, really, mm. if you look at the modern day scene. What, what's happened there? What's gone through your head? Um, I, I think I probably just realised I enjoyed that more than the fishing back home. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, with, with, um, with Somalia, I've probably got to a point where I hadn't caught every carp in the lake, far from it, but mm. sort of got to a point where it's all becoming a bit samey, really. Um, you know, and the roach pit was a different environment to fish. Let's just say that it was a little bit more um, cutthroat would be the wrong word, but it was okay. a little bit more clicky on there. Um, and I don't mean that in any detrimental way to the, the lads that were fishing on there. They were all you know, very, very good friends of mine, even you know, right to this day. But um it was a little bit more, yeah, let's call it cutthroat. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I never really felt quite as comfortable fishing on there as I did on Summerly. You know, that, that was my sort of little bubble, you know, sort of, but yeah, yeah, probably the why, right, why the not right travel, place to use. Why not travel yeah. around the UK then? Why not go to different venues? Um, I don't know, wherever you might go, you might go to Norfolk, you might go uh, further up north, you might go to the Colne Valley. You might, mm. well, why not do that? And why, why go and pursue... I don't know, mate. I really don't know. Yeah, yeah just, just never. It? I mean, obviously there were other, uh, you know, other waters to, to, to fish around the Ringwood area, Rockford. Yeah. Um, you know, and at that time Rockford was very much in its infancy as a lake. It was still being worked. So the water was like tea, you know, it was like mm. a horrible colour, you know, and you still had the lorries going in and taking the gravel in and out and stuff. Um, 
So I, I've never really done much fishing on Rockford. I, I did a little bit of fishing on there right in the early days when Christchurch first got the lease. Right. Um, and I remember going up there doing the odd night and, and my mum actually, <laughs> she used to go up there and fish with my dad as well. Um, and obviously the carp that were, were put in there at that point, they were still quite small. They were, you know, mainly doubles. You know, if you caught a 20 pounder, you, you, you were doing, you know, quite well. Um, and I caught a few, not loads. And it was obviously very different to how the fishing is now. It was just literally, you know, fishing in the edge, a handful of boilies and some pellet and you, you would catch them that way. Um, and obviously you've got, um, spinnaker just over the road as well yeah which um yeah I, d- I did that's probably the only i would say other major chapter in my uk fishing obviously i've done you know a lot of fishing yeah you know, in various places we haven't talked about cornwall we used to do a lot of fishing in the southwest when i was younger um but yeah spinnaker is probably the only other lake in the ringwood area that um i really got my teeth into um aside from Summerley, i would say you know i love the roach caught some nice fish from there but yeah spinnaker was probably the the other one that uh why is that uh, probably the reputation yeah. i would say um it always had and still has to this point you know um a, an air of mystery about it it was um you know probably the biggest lake i'd fished in the uk by this point it's about 60 odd acres um i'd known that there were carp in there for for years and years not many there was always just a uh, rumored to be literally a handful like four or five fish um, so yeah, absolute ball breaker of a lake to fish, but, um, a few more fish found their way in there. It was stocked from, you know, some various sources. Let's just say that there were a few, <laughs> a few fish from sort of surrounded lakes that, that, you know, grew legs and ended up in there. Um, and a couple of mates, uh, actually rich from Ringwood tackle, you know, the, the, yeah. the shop owner, rich did a bit of fishing on there. Um, and one of his mates, and I can remember that they were catching, you know, lovely carp. They, they were sort of really nice you know, different to the summerly fish, they were sort of all different characters, you know, yeah. some sort of, you know, like long linears and like these sort of wood carving commons. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's a bit of me. I could quite fancy that. Um, and by this point, I basically um, started my job at Poindesters. Right. So just to put you in the picture, I, I worked at Poindesters for about 10 years. Then I left and I worked for CC Moore for about six or seven years, I think. And now obviously I'm back at the shop again. Um, so this was in my first spell at, at, at the shop. Um, and that gave me access to, you know, cheap kit. <laughs> yeah. I had to cut straight to the point. So I managed to upgrade my rods and reels and stuff. Um, and I felt ready to sort of give Spinnaker a decent go. And it was, you know, it was a big water, like say 60 odd acres. So you needed casting rods, you needed, you know, decent reels and stuff. Um, so yeah, I decided to sort of, you know, give it a go. And, and me and two other friends, we, we um, collectively agreed to sort of buy bait for, you know, the cheapest we could. So at that point we um we actually got a deal with Mainline. Right. And we were getting the um they used to do a bait called the C P two thousand. Okay. Um, which I, I somebody I'm sure will correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm I'm fairly convinced it was either the Activate base mix or the Grange base mix, but it had like a really strong enbuteric smell. Right. C P I'm I'm reliably told means cat piss. Um <laughs> it was a horrible smelling bait, but yeah, they I think probably the best bait they've ever done personally. The best bait they've ever done. Yeah. It was, it was brilliant. Yeah. We just caught lots of fish on it. And, um, so I remember we were driving up to, to Steve Morgan's place in Essex and, and buying, you know, the, the 10 kilo tubes. Um, and we were sort of picking up, I don't know, probably a couple hundred kilos of time between three of Ooh. us. And we, we sort of took the decision to start using a boat. Now, obviously boating is completely outlawed on spin. Yeah. Um, we just thought, look, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it by fair means or foul, basically. And um, all throughout the close season, we we were going up there two, three times a week, obviously under the cover of darkness. And we had like a little big 252 boat, I think it was, or yeah. a sport yak or something. You know, threw a little gap in the fence, chuck the boat in, and then we'd sort of take it in turns to go out on the lake. And we, we, we thought rather than sort of try and bait specific areas, we'll just, um, spread it just literally bait the whole lake yeah you know so we were going out 20 30 kilos a time and um and literally yeah just sort of laced the whole <laughs> whole lake with this this mainline stuff we were using and um yeah and and obviously at that point there was a, a conventional close season on there it yeah was sort of, you know shut through the spring period um so come june the 15th we were literally you know gunning for it you know all ready to uh to sort of start a campaign and by this point, you'd actually seen fish 
actively picking the baits up and yeah we we knew we were onto a good thing really um, what sort of stock had you seen um there was a real mixture of um so I think that there were some roach pit fish that ended up in there. Yeah. There was literally a handful of lots, two or three originals that had been there for years and years. Um, and then there was a, a number of fish that came from a trout reservoir in Somerset called Sutton Bingham. Right. Um, all different sizes really. So most of the Sutton Bingham fish were, were mainly sort of commons or sort of long snaky like linears. Um, and there were some fish from Holtwood Brickworks, I think, some from Wedge Hill, which are two little Christchurch Angling Club venues. They were a different strain. They were sort of quite short, deep, big sort of scales on their backs. Um, you know, and, and I would say you're probably fishing for, I don't know, say 10 fish over 30 pounds probably. Okay. Um, but they were a real melting pot of, of every strain of different and, characters. Yeah. yeah, you know, there was one called the Torpedo, which was a big, long, sort of leathery one. Uh, the one called Heather, which was obviously named after Heather Leather, which was, you know, a typical big, sort of short, fat, you know, completely scaleless one. Um, one called Dracula, one called Intercity. Um, he had a couple of big commons. Um, so, yeah, there, there was a real mixture of, uh, of different characters in there. And when the season started, um, you used to have to actually do a draw for swims. And I can remember I got a terrible draw the first night. My mate Barry was uh, in a much, I felt, a much better area. And uh, he said, look, if you want, he said, come up and fish the first night. Just fish next to me. Yeah. And we'll have a social, a typical thing, barbecue, a few beers and whatnot. And then you might be able to you know, make a move the next day sort of thing. And I fished the first night, nothing happened, nobody caught anything. And I remember going to work the next day and um, Barry texted me about four o'clock in the afternoon. He said, oh, mate, he said, you need to get back down. He said, there's loads of fish in the little bay just to the right of where he was fishing. I was like, all oh, right, okay. And I can remember driving back down, you know, back down the, uh, you know, the dual carriageway to the lake, thinking somebody's bound to have gone in there. Yeah. And um, I'd left my rods and, and stuff with him, walked back onto the lake and I remember walking through this bay and like looking, I was like, oh my God, yeah, there, there is. You could see like sort of 10, 15 fish sort of milling around close in. And I said, mate, why haven't you had a rod in there? He said, oh, I was just waiting for you. So I thought you'd want to go in there and fish for him. And to this day, I've never quite realized why he, he never had a go himself, you know? And um, so I literally just grabbed a rod, put a bait on, and I just underarmed a rig out. And so you could see like a little sort of sandy depression really close in, probably about seven or eight yards out. Okay. A few fish were sort of ghosting in and, you know, sort of showing an interest and uh, just laid the rod on the floor, just engaged the bait runner. And um, yeah, probably been in no more than half an hour, I reckon. And my mate Ash, who used to work in Ringo Tackle, um, I remember he just sort of just crept in to, you know, to walk past, you know, along the footpath there. And I said, mate, mate, just stop. And I could see a fish just, you know, close proximity to the rig. rig yeah. Sure enough, the rod tips just pulled round and, uh, oh. yeah, and off it went. So, um, that was my first spinnaker carp and that turned out to be like, the, but they called it the big common, um, which was, um, it was quite heavily spawned out at the time, but, um, yeah, it was just under 38. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, that was, uh, a good way to get the season up and running. So cool. yeah, well pleased Mate. with that. What was your boat experiences like the first time out in the boat? I know you're baiting <laughs> up, it's under the cover of darkness, but it's not like your typical sort of, it's allowed on a fishery. You're sort of guesting it's your first time doing any boat work on a, on a larger venue. Do you have any nightmares? No, not really. Oh, um, good. I mean, t- to be honest, I, I don't really like a hard bottom boat. You I'm know. much happier in an inflatable. I always feel safer um i always think they're a bit more stable like a hard bottom boat um obviously we, we you know perhaps talk about it going forwards but when i fished at rainbow a few times in the winter time um obviously they got those sort of sport yak type boats down yeah, there yeah, that's right and i always feel a little bit unsteady in those you know i'm much happier in a, in a, a sort of zodiac type boat but um no 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 real issues on there um the only thing i <laughs> i do remember a couple of times going out and the lake had a couple of islands on it and the um Canada geese used to sort of nest on the islands. So, of course, going out at night, you're trying to be as covert and quiet as possible. You can imagine, <laughs> you know, li- literally, like, hundreds of geese taking flight. And, of course, oh, no. you know, they're, they're, they're be probably other people, you know, covertly baiting up or something. And I'm sure people probably clogged onto what was going on. But, um, yeah, but I remember we had, like, um, a plastic bucket and we'd just taken a knife to it and we'd actually cut the bottom of the bucket out. So we used to chuck that in the boat and then take a torch and then as we, 
sort of went around the uh, the actual margins of the island there, just shine the torch down through the bucket to sort of hide the torch beam, and you could actually you know glow up the whole you know the lake bed underneath, and you could see where we were baiting. It was just being cratered. They like smashing there. it, yeah. They, they were absolutely smashing it. Just carp, or was there bream tension everything in there? Um, there were some big bream, just literally a handful, I think. Right. Um, and yeah, the there were. I, I remember like Terry Lampard and Tim Norman used to come and fish there for the tench. So it's um yeah it did have a reputation for some decent tench but I I never actually caught one from there I don't think um yeah so I'm I'm, I'm fairly confident all the bait we were putting in was was sort oh. of predominantly beaten by the you know by the carp yeah so my got a rigs and stuff how are you at this point with with everything obviously you've come on a fair old way and you carp fishing now mm. you've been to France you've got that whole thing have you have you built up a repertoire is it simple not less not stuff where are you mate very very basic mate yeah, yeah. always has been yeah has yeah, it I've never been. Um, you know, you've had some incredible anglers sat in this studio, mate. I, I don't put myself anywhere near some of those in, in terms of, you know, like technical ability. Um, yeah, just very, very basic, just a sharp hook, you know, just a, a bit of coated braid. Um, yeah, lead clip or a heli set up and, and, and that's about as, as complex as it gets really. But so uh, what, what I did actually, um, slightly interesting on there and I've done it a few other venues as well is I always tended to use two or three boilies on the hair. Mm. Um, so I was using, I think they were like 14 millers or 15s, the ones that Mainline did, but they were quite a small 15, you know. Um, you know, they weren't a big boilie. And um, yeah, I'd sort of use quite a longish hair. And at the time I was using those gardener muggers. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and they were pin sharp out of the packet and, and just sort of using two or three boilies on the hair. Almost looked like a little stringer you were casting out. Did you have separation in between the baits or were they all no, tied no, together? literally, yeah, just yeah, yeah, sort yeah. of tied together. And, um, you know, it's, it's not something you see many people do, you know. I think most people tend to it's become far more technical nowadays, isn't it? You know, now it's all, you know, spinner swivels and pop-ups. And, you know, I think, um, you know, if you walked around linear and you asked 20 people to really rig in and show you, they'd all be using the same sort of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, and not many people just keep it very, very basic and very simple. And, you know, earlier on, you mentioned, you know, a, a mutual friend, Derek Harrison over in Holland. You know, yeah. Derek's the most, I'm sure you won't mind me saying this, the most basic angler lot. His rigs are very, very simple and, you know, he doesn't faff around using technical stuff and look at what the guy catches, you know. It's, uh, yeah, I think we can massively overcomplicate things, personally. Europe, take me there, mate. You talked about your first <laughs> couple of trips. You've talked about sort of this, I don't know, this this general over the course of time preference to being out there, to, to, to doing that type of fishing. Mm. For you, the, the sort of path in Europe, was it always discovery? Was it always going to relative? I mean, there might be a tip off. There might be some water there. But mm. was a key part of it being unknown? You don't know what's going to happen when you go and fish that venue. Mm. Is that is that the thing that sort of drove you to those places? Or was there a plan to go, oh, we'll go to Cassian because I've seen some some fish caught from there. Or we'll go to Dadaer because I've seen some fish caught from there. Um, No, I mean... The BK Guide was the that was the Bible. Still really. okay. Yeah, that that was the um, you know until the advent of the uh, the internet and the smartphone, um, you know that that was the the sort of driving force in our fishing really. So yeah, we just used to pick venues from there and just just literally jump in the van and go. Um, and of course, back in those days, it, it, fishing was a lot cheaper than it is now. So you know, I wasn't earning much money, um, but you you could feasibly go for a couple of weeks fishing on a couple of hundred quid. Um, yeah. you know, like fuel was so much cheaper than it is nowadays, you know, tolls were cheaper, everything was cheaper. Um, so yeah, we, you know, driving any distance was never an issue. You know, nowadays I'm much more conscious of cost, you know, so, yeah. you know, if you want to drive down to the Alps tomorrow and fish and back, you know, you're looking at probably best part of eight, 900 quid in terms yeah. of your, your tunnel crossing or your ferry or, you know, your van, uh, running costs and stuff. And so, yeah, back in those days, I, I think you had a lot more freedom really to just you know if you if you went to one area and it you know got to a venue didn't look like the right place to be if, if you had to drive six hours to another one you'd be like oh all right just jump in the van and go mm. um you know I, I still still kind of do that to an extent but i'm I'm a little bit more methodical now in 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 terms of like choosing a venue to go to and i still like the freedom aspect um you know and i, I like to go to places that are you know probably off radar to, to many. Um, but yeah, nowadays I don't tend to move around and do the big sort of drives like I used to. Yeah. I used to just literally drive all over the place. 
you know, you do several thousand miles in one trip sort of yeah. thing. You, you, you sort of graduated towards public lakes rather than pay lakes. And we know we've referenced to pay lake that you fished early doors. What, why do you think that is as well? Because obviously there's a great deal of, of both, to be fair, with regards to France and, and sort of Europe. But what was it that that took your shine in terms of pay, in terms of not pay lake fishing and public lake fishing? Because it's a different kind. It's a lot more English, a lot of pay lake fishing, isn't it? It's a lot more sort of comfortable, whereas yep. public lakes, invariably you've got boats sometimes. You're not 100% sure of rules maybe. And you've also got, depending on time, mm. some of them... When I, I think of going, you think, is that viable to have only two nights on there with all that water and, do you know what I mean, all that kit? Um, I don't know, just the whole commercial side of it, you know. The, I, I, a big thing for me going over there is to get away from other English anglers, and I don't mean that horribly to anybody or detrimentally to anybody, but if I turn up to a venue and I see two or three other English guys there of an English van, I'm not interested, I'll just go somewhere else. Um, and that's always been the same, really, from from day one. Always liked just selfishly, sort of having a bit of water to yourself. You yeah, know, not seeing that, you know, anyone else there. Um, I've always been incredibly respectful to French anglers, and I've got to say, I think that's something that is lost on a lot of people that do go over there. Um, you know, in terms of you know people making content and filming, and and you know, there's this like you, you touched on earlier, you know, there's, there's a huge sort of explosion in the media now of people going out fishing public venues. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I, I've got to say, um, you know, and this is in no means to dig at Nash or Cord or anybody, but I think people that do that sort of thing and, and producing content, I think that you, you've got a degree of, um, you know, you've got to show respect to the people that live locally, you know, when, you, when you're making these films. Um, and it's something that doesn't sit, particularly comfortably with me when I see obviously lots of drone footage and stuff and yeah you know and everyone's doing it so you couldn't single anybody out in particular for, for criticism but um you know I think we you know we need to be mindful of the fact that you know these venues they're not ours they're you know a public venue open to everybody admittedly but you know they're in a different country so we have to be respectful of the fact that you know there are people that live locally that fish there for years and years and years um that are not going to take too kindly to this huge influx of people, yeah. You know, coming from the UK to fish, so that that that's always been prevalent in my mind. That I've always wanted to be, you know, as low key as possible, really. Um, you know, and, and of course, you know, there are venues like Cassian, like Shanty, like Orient, like Salagu. You could go on and on and on. You could name twenty or thirty that are very, very well known to everybody. Um, you know. A lot of people that may you may have never been to Salagu, but you'd be scrolling through Instagram and you see a picture, and instantly you know where it is. It's so recognisable. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. you know, I think there's there's less impact on venues like that. But um, what I don't like is seeing sort of lesser known places um, that all of a sudden you know drone footage. And if you're that motivated to go and find somewhere like that, it doesn't take you very long if you know how to use Google. Google Earth or Maps or whatever. No, I think I've, I've um, talked to people who've literally had one half a frame maybe or a little bit of background and they've managed yeah. to piece it together and find the location pretty easily with nowadays modern tools. And then you yeah, see it's, it's never been easier for the, you know, for the, for the, 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 the travelling angler going over to these mm. places. Um, you know, to find new venues, it's, it's easier now than it's ever been, ever will be really. Um, so, yeah, I mean, going back to your initial point, I, I, I think, yeah, I've, I've never really wanted to fish around other people you know, and even less so other English guys when I've been over there. If you go with a mate, that's fine. That's entirely different. But of course. Yeah. So I've, I've always sort of, um, you know, liked that aspect of just going somewhere quiet away from everybody else, you know, of, of course, you know, I've fished a lot of the, you know, the, the well-known venues. Um, but I do like finding the odd little hidden gem somewhere and, you know, and, and sometimes that might be handed to you by, you know, a French angler or something. And, you know, latterly with my job at CC Moore, that, opened up a lot of contacts overseas that yes. you would never have had that, you know, available to you without being in that position, really. Um, you know, so all of a sudden you, you're sort of working with and conversing with people in Germany, in Italy, you know, CC Moore, they're very, very prominent brand in all of the French shops. So you had this big network of anglers in every corner of France. So, you know, that, that definitely opened up a lot of doors. Um, you know, so I, I wouldn't say 
suddenly became lazy in terms of sort of going finding new places to fish. Um, but yeah, it definitely helped having a few people. Yeah, um, you contacts, know, contacts yeah, that, that, that can just say, look, you know, yeah, don't waste your time on that one. It's not worth yeah. it. Go somewhere else sort of thing. But. The fishing, the actual fishing itself. We'll talk about significant chapters, Cassie and et cetera, and, and sort of captures in amongst that because we've had some incredible fish. But generally when you went out there, the fishing itself, how do you compare that to English fishing? Is it is it carp behave like carp? Is it easier generally? Mm. Is it, what what's it like when you first go out there? You don't really know what it's going to be like. You've got a lot of big waters that are not characteristic of what you fished before. Mm. When you actually get there and start fishing, how did you find all that? Um, just like a period of adjustment, really. Um, you know, and it's like anything in life. The more you do, the more it becomes familiar and, and sort of second nature, really. So, um, I, I can remember like the probably the first really, really big water that I fished and I say like super water would, would be Lactodare. Right. Um, so this would have been going back to around about the late nineties. And I can remember my first trip. So going, going back slightly further, um, obviously at the time I was still doing a bit of fishing around Ringwood and I can remember going in Ringwood tackle and it's, a, a, it, if you've been there, you'll know it's a tiny little shop, like a shoebox really full of gear. Um, obviously you've got Rich and Ash that, you know, the guys that run it and all around the walls, there used to be loads of old prints. You know, if anybody caught like a noteworthy fish locally, they would take Rich a photo in, pin it up on the wall. And I can remember there was, um, one particular picture that was up behind the till where, the, you know, the guys used to stand and it was bigger. It was like an A4 print and a guy bearded guy with a cap on looked a bit like Rich McDonald, if you like, right. um, sort of, knelt in the water in thigh waders holding this big plated mirror, massive, like, you know, 40 pounder, nice. really, really decent sized car. And I can remember that in the photo, there were like these huge like waves, like rolling in really sort of evocative image. And I remember sort of looking at that and thinking, bloody hell, I'd love to know where that's from. And I said to Rich, like, oh, I said, who's that dude up there? And oh, that's Bob Davis. Um, so Bob, I think used to be, quite heavily involved in the carp society. He might've been like the chairman or president of the carp society at some point. Um, and I think back in the day he was involved in the very early days of the Savoy syndicate. Right. So really old school, you know, been around, done it, fished everywhere sort of thing. Um, and I, I remember saying to Rich, I said, oh, so how do you know him then? He said, oh, he lives locally. And, um, I think he was a Londoner and he had actually moved down to the Ringwood area and he set up business, I think doing, um, like a, a dog kennels or something. You had like a cattery or kennels. And um, I said, oh, does he come in here often? He said, yeah, he's, he's always in here, like popping in for a cup of tea. And mate, I kid you not, probably half an hour later, he's, <laughs> walk, he's walked through the shop door. And um, me being me, I was straight away, I said, oh, you don't know me. My name's Mike and sort of shook hands and stuff and started talking to him. Um, you know, mentioned that I did a bit of fishing in France and was sort of at that point sort of finding my feet over there really, sort of starting to fish a few you know, a few other sort of public venues. And I said, oh, if you don't mind me asking, where about, whereabouts was that fish from? And he went, oh, it's from, from Chantico. And uh, he said, you ever been there? I said, no, no, it's, it's sort of, it's on the list, you know, it's, it's one that I'd love to go and fish one day. And he said, look, if you want to go, he said, I've, I've fished there a lot. I can tell you, you know, all the sort of information you need to know really in terms of sort of fishing on there. And uh, this was, I think, at a time where, you could actually night fish on the lake, but there were sort of designated night zones. Yeah, zones, yeah. So there would be like a, you know, say a kilometre of bank and you could just rock up and, and if it was free, you could fish. Obviously, if it was busy, you'd have to go and fish somewhere else. And um, Bob basically told me that the area that he used to, him and his colleagues used to fish was a days only part of the lake. There was no night zone. Um, and he said, we, he said, it's a big effort to fish on there. You know, it's not easy. You know, you need the proper kit for it. Um he said, but it's very, very productive. You know, he said, you know, on a good day, good conditions, you know, a bit of a wind on the water. He said, you, you could catch 10 carp in a day, big ones. Yeah, nice. And I was like, really? Oh, it sounded too good to be true, really. Um, and this is obviously at a time when, when Shanty was very prolific, you know, it was, it was renowned, wasn't it? You know, people were writing about it in, you know, carp world and stuff and lots of Dutch anglers going there, German anglers going there, having yeah. these amazing captures. And, um, he sort of sold it to me on the premise. He said, look, I promise you go there and day fish. You'll catch more than any of the night 
anglers. He said because the night zones are gradually becoming more and more pressured. Yes, yeah, so they um, move out. You know, he said that the carp learn by association, don't they? So they they know that they've been fished for in a certain area. He said the day areas just don't get touched. You know, he said it's it's very very lightly fished, and as long as you're happy making the effort, you can you can have some good results. So we thought, right, let's let's go for it. So we we sort of took all of his advice, really. You know, he he pretty much handed it to us on a plate, in truth. Um, you know, told us the right area to go and fish. Yeah. Um, you know, sort of distance you need to fish, the right sort of kit you need. You know, he said literally take as much bait as you can. You couldn't take physically take enough. You know. Um, so we planned a trip, me and my mate planned a trip for that September time, um, which wasn't far away, actually. I think when I, when I met Bob, it was probably around about July or August, so we didn't have long to sort of get prepared. And we needed to upgrade a boat. We had no echo sounder. Um, you know, my rods at the time, I can't remember what rods I was using at the time, but they weren't really gunned up for it. Yeah, My reels weren't gunned up for it. So, oh. yeah, we had, we had a lot to sort of get prepared. And the guy I was going with, he lived in a part of Bournemouth, which was, let's just say, not the most upmarket part. Um, his next door neighbour used to come and knock on his door every now and then, just pop in for a cup of tea and stuff. And um, let's just say he could get hold of stuff. Oh, okay. <laughs> useful. But, uh, yeah, useful guy to know. Um, and I think my mate sort of mentioned to him, he said, oh, um, yeah, me and my mate were fishing in France, and yeah, we could do with a new boat. Oh, what sort of boat? He said, well, you know, we're looking for an inflatable, you know, and... Um, Gave him sort of, you know, rough idea. Next night, knock on the door. This any good? And this guy sort of, by, by fair means or foul, basically acquired a dinghy for sale that was, you know, a couple of hundred quid, I think. And from memory, it was like um, an Avon red breast, okay. like a grey coloured dinghy with a little wooden transom. And it was only about 2.1 metre or 2.3. Really not big enough for two people. But we were like, yep, yeah, we'll have that. <laughs> so we had a boat and then we managed to get an, a, an, you know, a, a better electric engine, like a Shakespeare <laughs> electric outboard, I think. Um, somewhere we managed to borrow a fish finder. Um, and I think Rich from the tackle shop lent me a set of, um, are they Hutchie rods or, or KM challengers or something like a burgundy wow. color rod? Um, another guy, Al McAvoy, lent me a set of um, SS3000 reels. And he said, Mike, you don't need to worry. He said, they've all got braid on them. He said, you'll be sorted. So I thought, all right, perfect. So we we sort of planned this trip, got the ferry booked. And I can remember we had like a nighttime crossing. I think it was about midnight time. I fell asleep and my mate drove the whole distance down to the lake. <laughs> and I remember we we sort of, I woke up as we obviously, you know, you know got, got to the venue and he pulled up in the, the public car park by Church Point and it was literally crack of dawn. I remember walking down to the church and sort of standing there looking and I thought, Christ, you know, <laughs> what is this place? Yeah. And it, was, it was all misty. I can remember it was really, really sort of thick mist and you could actually see a couple of bivvies out, you know, on the mud. So there was like a bivvy over here, bivvy here, bivvy here with the boats. And you could see like the batteries of rods, you know, sort of sticking up in the air, yeah. all these tree stumps and that sticking out in the mud, just the, the, never seen anything like it really. And I remember sort of standing there and we're drinking a cup of tea my mate said, oh, let's go and make a fresh brew, walk back to the van, brewed up, walk back to the lake again. By this point, the mist had burned off a bit more and you could see a bit more of the lake. And I was like, oh my God, like what have we let ourselves in for? This is massive next level. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's like five miles to the far side or something stupid. Yeah. And um, I, for the first time, I actually thought I'm really, really out of depth. You know, this this is a, a, a step up again, you know, from, from anywhere we'd fished before. And, Bob had basically suggested that we um, stay on a tiny little campsite. So obviously you've got the church point and then right up at the north end of the lake, um, there's another marina up there called Nuisamon. Okay. Um, and at the time there was like um, a little sort of um, a pizza sort of restaurant, like a, a, a shack basically, like a little wooden shack. And they used to sell pizzas and ice creams and steak and chips and stuff like that. And the lady that owned that lived in one of the little villages nearby and She's had, she's had like a little tiny field behind the restaurant there where you could camp. So it wasn't a proper campsite. It had like a little, you know, Thunderbox toilet and a shower. Yeah. Um, perfect. It was like, you know, six francs a night or something stupid like that. So we put our tents up in, in the field and the plan was that we would launch in the marina there at New Year's Mont. Um, And the area that Bob had suggested we fish was probably 
about 45 minutes to an hour's boat ride from there. But of course we only had like two batteries. Um, you know, we, we were just so undergun for this sort of fishing. It was, it was ridiculous. You know, when I look back now, it, I mean, it was dangerous yeah, really, dangerous. you know, we, we were putting ourselves at risk. Um, so next day we thought, right, we'll, we, you know, we'll get started. We'd been and got our licenses at this point. So blew the boat up, got onto the lake. And of course, first thing became apparent that like, this boat is nowhere near big enough for what we, what we need. So you got me, my mate, who was like six foot plus, you know, he was a big lad, two chairs, um, two rucksacks, got all the kids, food well. bags, buckets of bait, Oof. battery. How'd you get in there? I, to this day, mate, I don't know. So I think I actually managed to sort of perch on the tube at the, <laughs> at the front of the boat and my mate actually stood. There was literally standing room only. So he's there sort of surrounded by kit. You know, luckily we had, you know, life jackets on and stuff. Um, and off we went. Yeah. So we, we sort of boated out around this big peninsula and, and ended Ooh. up sort of, uh, yeah, pulling in in this area that Bob had said was the uh, the place to fish. So, yeah. It was, was it um, the place to fish? It was, mate. Yeah. So <laughs> the the very first day, um, you know, we, we obviously we're taking his advice, but you, once you're actually there in that situation, sometimes you get a bit carried away with yourself. And of course we were going out in the boat and, you know, the echo sounder was, that was the, you know, the, the guiding light, so to speak. So yeah. sometimes you don't think clearly about what you're doing. And of course we're going out in the boat and you keep going away, you know, out from the, you know, the shoreline and getting further and further and further out. And before you knew it, you were like sort of four or 500 you know, yards out into the lake and you were seeing like fish symbols on the screen so instantly your mind saying, right, this is where we need to fish. Yeah. But, you know, with hindsight, it was way, way too far. And of course we, you know, first time out dropping a rig, you drop, drop your lead, bait up, get a hundred yards back from the bank, run out of line. You're like, oh, for God's sake. So of course that's reel in again. And then, you know, sort of fish a bit closer in. Um, and what we sort of very quickly learned was that the fish would sit in the deeper water during the daytime. And then as soon as the sort of late afternoon, evening came, they would gradually come closer and closer. So in truth, we were making it far harder for, for ourselves yeah. than we, we actually needed to. Um, so the first couple of days we were fishing much too What were you fishing for? 300 out. yards or as much as you, far as you could? Yeah, but <laughs> but um, the reels that I'd borrowed, um, so if my mate Al listens to this, then he'll, he'll probably be laughing to himself. He said, yeah, they're, they're all full of braid, no problem. What he didn't tell me was that there was about six different types of braid. Yeah, all knotted together. Interspersed with mono. And it. <laughs> so I'm sort of, you know, going out, placing the rig, all of a sudden he did, ding, 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 through the rod oh. rings. And we're like, what the hell's that? And you know, different colour braid. You know, then it would go from like grey to green to red. Yeah, absolute nightmare. <laughs> but um, yeah, so the, the, the first day we, we sort of got our rods out, got fishing. And I can remember I, I actually fell asleep in my low chair and where we were fishing, you had like a clear view right down the sort of center of the lake. So you're looking at the main sort of Chanticoe Island in the distance, a very far distance, you could see Church Point. And I remember I woke up a bit, you know, obviously not quite with it. And I, I looked at my rods and as literally as I looked at it, my right hand rods just gone like that, just pulled down. And I didn't react straight away. I was a <laughs> bit like, Oh, what's going on there then? Then obviously realized that it was, it was a take. And for whatever reason, I'd not put my alarm on and um, I've run down to the rod clutch is absolutely ripping off and uh, sort of hooked in, started playing this fish. And for whatever reason, I just decided to play it back to the bank, you know, with hindsight, probably should have gone out after it in the boat, but um, started playing this fish and I was incredibly lucky. Like obviously knowing the lake a lot better now, mm. um, I did land it. It was a, a 39 pounder. That was my first cart from there. Wow. Um, almost like a true leather. So, you know, back in the day, there was um, a real mixture of, of sort of, you know, big scaly ones, but, you know, Shanty was always famous for those big sort of high shouldered leathery ones. Um, so yeah, I remember getting the fish in and I, the biggest carp I'd seen at that point. So I was absolutely beside myself, you know, it was just, just a, a mega moment really in my fishing to, to catch a fish of that sort of stature from, from, uh, you know, from a lake of, of that size. Um, but yeah, how I landed it to this day, I'll never know because it's just an absolute forest of tree stumps and, you Jeez. know, and snags and stuff in, in, in front of where we were. So, um, and I think my mate lost one that evening. Um, and then the next day, it, what we decided to do was basically fish closer in, try and make it easier for ourselves. 
because you know what was becoming apparent we we just didn't have enough battery power yeah you know, and we had to be mindful of the fact you know we were fishing a long way from you gotta getting, get back getting back into the base yeah, yeah. um and it, it was a mad experience like going back in the evening um you had no gps or anything in those days so you had to do everything kind of by by instinct almost um and in the distance, so as we're heading back to the marina, there was a little building on the the actual city, the marina complex itself. They had a coffee machine in their building, and you could just see like a little white light in the distance as you were going back in the boat. And that was your, yeah, your that, direction that was your, marker. That, that was your sort of direction point, yeah, to, to go back to. Um, and, yeah, looking back now, it was so dangerous, really, because, you know, a couple of days we had quite big, big winds yeah. on the lake, and you think... Yeah, it's just stupid taking such a risk, you know, on, on a big expanse of water like that. I mean, I can swim, but I'm not a strong swimmer at all. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it was a bit bit sort of foolhardy, really. But, um, yeah, so I think the second day, we it really kicked off. You know, we, we had about, I don't know, four or five bites, I think. Um, and then gradually it just went on and on from that point, you know, and the swim sort of built through the week. And you kept hitting it with bait every time. And what were yeah, you putting so, out? Were you putting a lot out? Um, yeah, so I think... I, I remember Bob had said to us, like, just physically take as much as you can. Yeah. You, know, you never be able to throw enough bait in that lake. So we took, um, at the time, Nash were doing these, like, 10 kilo white buckets of, I think they did, like, a shellfish sense appeal one. Mm. And they did, like, a yellow scopex one. And I remember we took as, as many buckets as we could afford. I remember actually going to Point Esters to, to buy a load of them. Um, and what we were doing was we were actually chopping the baits up to sort of try and make the bait go further, yeah. you know, and chopping them into halves and stuff. Um, yeah. So what we decided to do was put two markers out probably about, I don't know, 150 yards apart uh, around about 80, 90 yards distance from the bank. So quite comfortable casting range um, and literally just bait in a big line. And the reason was that if we all fished at the same sort of range, then no one's really gaining an advantage over the, you know, the, the other angler. Yeah. Um, and it, it just worked perfectly, to be honest. So, yeah, you, you would sit there all day, nothing would happen until we, we always noticed that the sun would get to a certain point in the sky around about sort of three, four o'clock in the afternoon. And it was almost like somebody flicked a switch, you know, first rod would go, then the next one, then the next one, wow. then the next one. Um, uh, yeah, it just, it got completely mad. Like I remember one evening we had, I think between sort of three, four o'clock and dark, I think we had 19 takes. Jesus. Um, it, it was just complete chaos. We'd never experienced fishing like it. How, how, 39 pound, you said there, was your first one. What, what, any big ones? Any bigger than that? Um, I had I had 140 that week. I had a 40, 43, um, which was, was actually quite a different sort of looking fish to the others. Most of them were sort of quite long, you know, these sort of big, sort of big shouldered leathery ones. Um, but this one was quite a short sort of scaly one. Yeah, quite a nice one. I did have some pictures. I don't know where the photos have gone now. Sort of long, long disappeared, sadly. But um, yeah, it, it was just like a real melting pot of different, different looking carp. And um, what a result on that water, though, because like it is a, I've seen it, and I'm like, you know, in <clears throat> modern day guys, and I've got the experience of other people going out there and catching them, the likes of Samir, etc. Mm. This is an intimidating sheet of water, mate. Yeah, it's. I think if you've if you've not done that sort of fishing before, I could I could see how people would be just completely intimidated by you know the size of it and you know the reputation of it as well. But um, yeah, we we weren't really prepared for the snags. You know, we, we obviously as you you do more of that sort of fishing, you get used to be you know fishing around sort of underwater structures and stuff. And you know, we we were completely naive to it all, really. Yeah. Um, you know, not fishing locked up, you know, we, we were just fishing with a loose clutch, you know, we were losing fish because they were just going into the snags and, you know, for whatever reason, you would just keep doing the same thing, you know, so you lose one and then put the rod out again, and do the same thing. And, you know, now we, experience has taught you that you need to sort of change things up and, you know, learn from your, you know, your, your mistakes, you know, whilst you're there. But um, yeah, it was, I think probably some of the best fishing I've ever had in France, I would say. Uh, you know, to, for it to be that prolific and, you know, just literally the numbers of fish we were catching of, of that size, you know, and there's not many places you could have gone at that point and, and caught four or five, 30 pounders in a day. It's just unheard of really. Oh, yeah. Quite, quite mega, unique. Mate, isn't it? Yeah. It was, it was awesome. Um, no wonder you only fish abroad now. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's, um, yeah, I, I think it just sort of opened up my eyes personally to, to what was possible, you know, and, and 
I've never really fished anywhere else quite like that in terms of numbers of big fish. Um, yeah, what one other you know v- venue that we will hopefully talk about, but um, yeah, it was it just incredible. Yeah, really, really enjoyable fishing, and um, it sort of became a regular fixture in our fishing. Certainly, that you know we had that trip, and then the following year we planned to go back again. Um, and I can remember going. We went around about nine eleven. Okay. Um, I actually because I, I think my passport had expired. Um, literally a week or two before the the, the trip we had planned, I didn't realise. So I just happened to open the passport, look at the date, and I was like, "Shit, yeah, it's not not valid for this trip coming up." Um, and I remember I actually had to go to the um the Newport passport office the day after nine eleven happened. Oh to go and God. get like an emergency appointment. And um, yeah, it was, it was mental. I remember sort of walking up the, up the street to, the, to go in the passport office and there were like armed guards there with machine guns Jeez. and stuff. And Proper. Um, yeah, it was a mad experience. And and even actually being on the lake at that time, obviously there was a great deal of uncertainty in the world. Nobody really knew what was happening with, you know, with these attacks and stuff. And, and Shanty's very close to a military base. So you've got, you quite if you fish on there, you're quite used to seeing the military jets sort of flying around. It was constant, mate. That like any one point there would be jets flying overhead, and obviously they were, you know, they they were sort of in the sky above Paris, you know, in case something happened there. So yeah, it was uh, it was a crazy time, but um, again, the fishing was just brilliant. You know, we 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 caught a load of fish that trip as well. I think thirty or forty fish. I think so. Oh. Yeah, it was. Good. Were you feeding boilies? Um. Yeah, said boilies, the, any corn, anything like that? Because no, the, the thing is, you go on to there, and a lot, and I've heard it a lot before, sort of especially with new people coming out on trips, they might have taken some boilie, used it, but a lot of the fish hadn't seen sort of boilies or any of that type of bait. Do you know what I mean? So they weren't switched onto it. But I'm guessing here, if you've hit the ground running, you said you took your Nash bait and your big mm. your big buckets, and you were just feeding that, they were straight onto the boilie. Actually straight on it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, Bob had said that, <clears throat> um, he always felt that just like a, a, a very basic high track bait was all you needed to, to catch fish on there. Mm. So, you know, we, we sort of follow that advice, but um, quite interesting, actually, uh, another friend of mine, a guy called Andy Starkey, who I've sort of sadly lost contact with him a bit now, but we actually bumped into Andy fishing on there at the same time as us on one of our trips. And he was sort of fishing about a mile away from where we were on the lake you know, doing the same thing, doing the day fishing and back to the, you know, the campsite in the evening. Um, and Andy was fishing with a friend of his and I think they had something like 70 bites between them, but it was literally like, you know, one out of 36, one out of 35. Um, but Andy was using like a high attract bait and his mate was using, I think like a premier fish meal bait. Right. And it was noticeable that the fish meal bait definitely caught the bigger ones. I've heard I've heard this as well in terms of big fish baits, obviously, but also <clears throat> the difference. And I think for me, I saw it at Zwolla mm. a while back when you saw <clears throat> that venue, the anglers tackling that type of venue. They were going up to the shows like Zwolla and they were buying in bulk sort of the most crazy constitution of sort of <laughs> boily I've <clears throat> ever seen. It was like sawdust with yeah. some flavour, but they were buying it by the absolute bootful. Yeah. And yeah. then you compared that, and I remember talking to anglers t- about using our type of baits, mm. whether that be a fish meal, whether that even be a bird food type bait, but the consistency, the quality of that. Mm. And then the, the English anglers going out and fishing against people using maybe bulk baits, but not to the quality, mm. and us doing better because of that type of bait. Did you find that same thing in terms of against local anglers out there over the course of time? Um yeah, latterly, I would say. Yeah. Um, you know, and obviously, you know, going forward to a few years, obviously I became, you know, associated with CC Moore as a consultant initially and then, you know, went on to, you know, to be an employee there. So that really gave me access to, I feel, you know, I'm not just saying this because he is a great friend of mine and mm. obviously I've got, you know, a, a sort of affinity to the brand. But, um, yeah, yeah. Far, in my opinion, far better quality bait than I'd previously had access to. Um, yeah, and I, I'm convinced on my own mind that, that, that bait does play a big factor, yeah, 100% in, in sort of picking out the bigger fish. Um, yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the high track stuff we were using at the time, we, we actually took a load of trout pellets as well. Right. I remember going to uh, to Simo, actually, and we, we obviously he's local to me, and buying like big sacks, like 20 kilo sacks of sort of 11 mil, high oil pellet 
um, purely to sort of try and bulk out the feed a little bit because, you know, boilies was expensive. Even buying the sort of cheaper, you know, the, the sort of buckets of high track stuff is still what, 40 or 50 quid a bucket or something. Um, so what we were doing was just sort of baiting quite heavily with a trout pellet and using less boilie. Um, and that didn't really make any difference in the results. You know, we were still catching plenty of fish and, you know, they were definitely responding to the pellet. And I, I think with, you know, a venue like that, obviously it's quite a soft sort of clay bottom. Yeah. You know, so even long after the pellets have been eaten, the, there's still that, that, that resident smell and, and taste and, you know, probably the oils themselves sort of break down and work into the silt and stuff. So I think they just keep coming back to that spot and, you know, and, and sort of visiting and just eating whatever whatever's there in front of them. Really. Is, so. Was was there much in terms of fishing to features or was the bait the main feature there? Did you find anything on it? I mean, it's vast, so there's different areas. I know that mm. that's, that may produce different winds, example, but different mm. times of the year. But is it just pretty much consistent? Is there anything out there that you found that was like a, um, a real sort of key area? Yeah, I mean, I view the lake a little bit differently now than I did back then. You know, I was always very much of the opinion that it was just fairly, fairly flat and featureless. Really, yeah, that's me. That's apart apart from the snags, but now obviously I've done a fair bit more fishing on there. And you know, with the advent of Google Earth and stuff, you can see. Of um, I mean, if people don't know, but basically the lake itself was formed by three villages being sort of flooded. Mm. So all of the um, you know, sort of farm buildings and outbuildings and stuff basically just were submerged. And then over time they sort of collapse. So you've got areas of the lake where there's old roadways, um, you know, old concrete buildings and structures and stuff, which have become over time, you know, decent features to fish to. Right. Um, but the, the particular area we were fishing was, was generally speaking, was just dropped off from the near side margin and just went out gradual slope off. Um, and there was actually uh, unknown to us at that point, there was actually like um, a very deep or to say very deep, but a deeper channel that ran across um, sort of horizontally in front of where we were um, that actually runs all the way down to the outflow, you know, where they actually sort of take the, you know, the water out when they're draining it. Um, we didn't know because we physically couldn't get out far enough to, to actually fish to that. We never had enough line on the reels. Um, but I, I still think that now is probably like a, a bit of a carp highway, you know, right. I'm sure they use that as a, a bit of a, a, you know, a navigation route through that, that particular part of the lake. Um, but yeah, where we were fishing was, like I say, we, we, we just sort of baited an area that we could comfortably cast to, um, you know, because you were sat in chest waders and that all day. So, you know, when you had a bite, you would obviously get the fish in, do your pictures, weigh it, whatever, put it back, then literally wade out to sort of chest depth, whack the rod out again. Then it, it was you know, very, very easy fishing, really. Um, but yeah, and that, nowadays, I think, you know, and, and angling's changed, I think, the way anglers fish on these lakes has changed and, you know, people are much more, um, I wouldn't say technical is the right word, but people are, are, are much more switched on in looking for spots. You know, Samir, perfect example. You mentioned him a minute ago. Yeah. Um, you know, his spot finding is just like next level. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm sort of quite elementary really. It's just like, Oh yeah, that looks like a nice spot and have a little donk around or whatever. And yeah, that's presentable. Can't see any immediate snags or anything. So place your rig, handful of bait, and, and I'm fishing. But, um, you know, when you look at the lengths he goes to in, you know, finding these little sort of hard holes, areas. yeah, stuff, little holes, yeah, hard areas, all mental. sorts. So, yeah, uh, you know, and I think that sort of mindset has sort of transcended through lots of people that go and fish on these places now. Um, I mean, to give you an example. I mean, I was out there in October, just gone. You were with Mr. Bartrop, weren't you? Mr. Bartrop, yeah. So that was uh, an eventful week. Um, not, you get not, some good food, I bet, though. We, mate, we ate like kings, as you, you can imagine. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, the fishing was a complete dead loss. The weather was terrible. We didn't catch any. And Leon had to sort of go home after a week. And initially, I would sort of planned to stay for two weeks. I had two weeks off work. Right. Um, so my plan was to sort of maybe stay and fish the second week. I decided not to in the end and just sort of bank the holiday and use it again, you know, carry it over to this year. Um, but before I drove home... I spent a whole day sort of walking out on the lake bed because um, I've got two weeks booked in May this year, um, two different night swims. Um, so I spent the whole day using what three words, oh, taking yeah. videos and stuff. Yep. And, and what you can learn, like, you know, you, you what you can sort of perceive when you're out in the boat and just donking around and stuff. You, obviously you build up like a, 
a mind's eye of what you're fishing on. When you actually walk out on the lake bed, completely different, like mind blowingly different. Um, you know, and, and the two swims that I've got booked in May, I spent hours and hours and hours, literally walked the whole mapped them all area, out. mapped everything, logged everything, made loads of videos and notes on my phone and stuff. So yeah, complete eye opener to be honest. Um, and have you always fished it over the course of time? You always fished it a, a, a similar way. Nothing, nothing in terms of the baitings changed, the rigs changed. Really, it's always been the same type of fishing. Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, same same sort of type of fishing. I mean, the lake itself has changed a lot. Yeah. In obviously going back to those sort of late nineties, early two thousand sort of period. Back in two thousand and three, there was a major fish kill. Right. Um, and a lot of those old. Um, I think they were called Aishgrund, the strain of carp, you know, the ones with the big shoulders, mm. they've pretty much all gone now. Um, and then the Federation introduced loads of these, I think they were Romanian commons, mm. um, that are a bit like, you know, some of them like the old Reduta fish, you know, the yeah. sort of big, deep bodied, you know, real fast growers. And they've now become the sort of, you know, the, the, the big, the dominant they? strain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So all of these absolute giants that are in there, there's, there's hardly a big mirror in there. I don't think, um, in, in, you know, in general terms, compared to the commons, you know, some of those, as we all know, are <clears throat> absolute monsters now. What's the biggest you've had out of there, mate? Um, <laughs> embarrassingly, I've never had a real big one, mate, to be honest, in, in all yeah. the fishing I've done on there. And the biggest one I've caught, I didn't actually weigh it. Um, <laughs> and this is, uh, I don't want this to sort of uh, sound like it's an elitist thing or anything, but I, I just sort of kind of got to a point where I just stopped weighing fish. Yeah. And I, I actually mentioned to you earlier, I listened to Ricky Connolly's podcast just the other day. Yeah. Rick said exactly the same thing. Like he, he, he just doesn't seem to weigh him anymore. Um, I don't really know why. You I catch just, too many. Just, uh, mate, <laughs> believe me, I don't. I really don't. Yeah, Rick does, definitely. Um, but yeah, I, I just, for whatever reason, just stopped weighing him. Um, and on one particular, I think it was about 2015 or 16, I was over there fishing with a Dutch friend of mine. And we were doing the whole day fishing thing again. Now, he basically, I and his name is, he used to be associated with Vortex Boats, right. um, you know, the green inflatables. Yeah. So really good angler, very experienced, and we sort of became quite good friends. We, we met at Zwolle years and years ago. And the plan was that we were going to fish from his boat, actually anchor out on the lake. Um, initially, he said, look, we'll both night fish from the boat. I said, well, how can we do that, mate? I said, like, where, where are we going to sleep? You know, the boat's yeah. like four metres long, but... You can't sleep two people on one of them, just just not possible. So we ended up with me staying back on a campsite and then each morning I'd blow my boat up, motor out to where he was fishing and we had both sort of fished from his, his four metre boat for the day. He would stay out there at night illegally. Um, it, it, it Obviously things went slightly you know pear-shaped and it didn't work out as we planned. But um, So the first night he did this, I think he caught two or three. Right. I've gone back out the next morning, he had a couple of 40 pounders sort of there ready for pictures. Um, nice. Unbeknown to us, the guard yeah. had actually GPS him from the bank. So they used some sort of laser what, device, ping him. pinged him, obviously found out exactly where he was fishing. Um, and of course they've got access around the whole perimeter of the lake. So they can drive all the way along the barrage, stop, see where people are fishing. And um, the second morning I've literally just got out there, got my rods out fishing, we heard a petrol engine mm. of a boat, Sure enough, we, we we got pulled and and they made it very very clear to us that look, we've watched you for two days. You haven't moved. We know you've been out here at night. Um, if we come out and catch you again, then both of you, irrespective of whether I was fishing or not, we'll take your vehicle. We'll take your boat. Oh. You'll get a minimum of like a thousand euro fine. So that was that was the end of that little plan. So we started just literally just regular day fishing. Um, couldn't find any fish anywhere. And by this point in time, the, the, the old night zones as were had stopped. And now it's all basically like a pre-booked night swim on the lake. Right. So it's a lot more sort of regimented than it used to be. So you could say it's a bit more pay lakey, no? Yeah, you, you could. Yeah. You could argue that it's actually a pay lake now, really. Um, so when you're day fishing on there, you're actually a lot more restricted now than you used to be right? because you've got, paying customers, you know, in their night swim, they're all fishing their four rods at 
whatever range that might be. So, you, so well. you've, you've kind of got to fish around the other people there and be respectful of that. Um, and I think it was the, was it the last day of my tree? I think I only, he might've had one extra day than me. Um, and we were boating out from, from the marina there first thing in the morning. Didn't really know where we were going because we hadn't caught anything by this point, you know, for the last few days. I couldn't see any fish jumping anywhere or anything. And I can remember all of a sudden we just heard one. It was early in the morning, you know, literally first light, and we've heard one jump, then another one, then another one. And we're like, Christ, you know, we found yeah. a few fish. So we actually pulled the boat into the sort of nearest available bit of bank. Luckily, we were a good probably quarter of a mile from the nearest night swim. So we weren't sort of impeding anybody. Um, uh, To this day, I've never seen so many carp jumping, mate, in one area. What are you saying? How many? I'd be no exaggeration to say, I reckon that day we must have seen a couple of hundred fish. Wow. Literally just like dolphins in front of us. Um, Over what depth of water? What were well, they this, this was the maddest thing. So it was an area that we, we'd kind of ruled out because it was so shallow. Um, And I think a lot of anglers sort of going fishing on these venues, you, you tend to get sort of pre-programmed into sort of, I'm going to fish in like three or four meters because that's where I've caught them in the past, mm. you know, and you kind of get into this mindset of not really looking at what's going on around you perhaps and paying too much attention to that. And I'm going to fish in that depth because that's how, that's where I feel comfortable fishing. Yeah. Um, and of course we, you know, found this group of fish jumping, took a first rod out in the boat to drop it. And I remember like, Christ, it's really shallow. And it was like literally three foot deep. Um, you know, I can remember looking over the side of the boat and you could see like these big sort of tree stumps coming off the, you know, off the lake bed. And I was like, well, obviously they're here probably sort of harvesting the crayfish and stuff, mm. um, you know, come up in the shallow water and well, they're here. So we'll fish from here sort of thing. And, um, yeah, just, just dropping literally in sort of three or four foot. And I think that day we had about seven or eight takes. Wow. Um, and the first one I had was, I'm, I'm going to say it was probably a 50 pounder. It was a big cart. Um, yeah, and and that to this day is is my my biggest one from from that to there. So, yeah. But you've got future trips planned. Yeah, I've I've got um yeah two weeks planned in May this year. Um, so I've got an Italian friend driving up from Italy to to sort of fish for me the first week. Um, then I'm home for about four days, and then then me and the other half are going back for a week. So I love the fact that you take the missus yeah. as well, don't you? That's yeah, <laughs> yeah. She um, bless her. Yeah. So we we we've been together about eight years now, I think. Um. When we met, she'd never experienced fishing, never been fishing, didn't know anything about it at all. And of course, I said, "If you fancy it, let's let's go to France." So yeah, we we we've, we've done sort of two or three trips to to Cassian together. Um, now we the, the sort of spring trip to Shanty's become a bit of a regular thing each year. Oh, nice! Um, purely for the reason, really, that at least if you sort of book a night swim on there, you, you know what you're getting, so it's quite safe. You know, nobody's going to sort of, you know, fuck you over, pardon the, 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 you know, yeah. the expression, but, you know, you pay your money, that's your swim, you can fish, it's all legal, it's above board, um, you've got no worries really. So the, the last sort of two or three years, we, we, we've we gone out there in May for a week. Um, a couple of trips we've done on the South Basin and caught a few fish, but for me, the South Basin part of the lake is, it's not the real not, lack yeah, of there. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's lovely. Um, and it's quite prolific and you always get a few bites, but it's not quite the same as that big lake where you know that the real big ones are. That's where, you know, that's where, you know, where I really want to be fishing. So yeah, we, we, we've got a week on there in uh, sort of middle of May this year. So what's in the hundred pounder? What will be in, in, it? in the main lake? Yeah. Yeah. Got to got be hundred pounder, yeah. hasn't it? No? I mean, that, that particular one, you know, I think the one that, um, didn't it go back in at 90, yeah, so I think it was, was it 93 pound or something? Excuse yeah, it was, me. It was up there, wasn't it? I remember because of the, it being found in a lake and then moved back in. And I remember yeah, it was right up there in the 90s, but it must <clears> be 100 pound by now. Yeah, I, I do know it's been caught, I think, at 103 pound, I think. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so I, I can't say exactly <laughs> when that was. I think that was probably a couple of autumns ago. Can you imagine a 103 pound common? It's it's insane, isn't it? Um, you know, when you think that that fish and those other big ones, because, you know, that, that's not the only one, mate. I'm no, sure that class. there's yeah, yeah. there's a few others in there that are, are, are probably getting up around that size as well. Um, and when you think that those fish have basically got to where they are, just eating crayfish and mussels, and 
It's it's insane. It really is. It's Imagine um, the old rod tripping off big old waves. <laughs> you're out in a boat. Yeah, you're getting towed around by Jonah. That's the dream, isn't it? Is to, oh, to go and catch one mate. like that. But the mad thing is, mate. I mean, you know, going back to the early days on there. Um, you know, the the lake was very coloured. Um, you know, purely because I think of the density of stock in there at the time. Yeah. Um, and now it's not. You know, so much has changed. And I can remember when I first went there in you know like the late nineties. And sort of did a few years fishing on there, then sort of migrated off and fished elsewhere. And I didn't actually go back there for quite a few years. And I remember when I went back in, oh, it would have been autumn, I'm going to say about 2012, 2013. Um, it was complete, I couldn't believe how different it was. You know, it had gone from no weed to all of a sudden weed is anything. And on the sort of windward bank, you know, you walk along on the weed and, that, and it was just completely full of zebra mussel shells, was it? swan mussel shells, you know, little crayfish shells and stuff. And yeah, you could see how the whole sort of dynamic of the place had changed. There was obviously a lot more natural food available and hence why there's so many big carp in there like there is nowadays. So Crazy stuff, weird goings on, strange people, guard Depeche, other anglers. What's going on there, mate? You spent a lot of time on that yeah. lake. It's a big one. I, I had a set of rod and, uh, rods and reels nicked on there. Nicked? Yeah, yeah, in one of my um, my early trips on there. So the bit where we used to fish, uh, like I said earlier, it was probably about 45 minutes to an hour's boat journey yeah. back to you know back to, to base. So it got to a point where we just thought, look, no one's coming out here at night. We'll just leave our kit. So we used to pack everything down and where we used to fish, there was like an old, um, like a collapsed building, basically, um, you know, all sorts of like concrete rubble and yeah. big sort of bricks and breeze blocks and stuff. So we actually used to hide our stuff. Stash so it. We, yeah. So we, yeah, you yeah. know, put your rods back on a quiver and stuff and, you know, put your storm poles in there and collapse your net and everything and just literally sort of stash it in around this, this sort of old concrete building. And I remember we, we sort of finished our days fishing and me and my mate have gone back to, to base, come back out the next morning, and we could see like a, a set of footprints in the mud, sort of from a different point where we'd been sort of pulling the boat in each day. And I remember sort of looking and thinking, oh, something's not quite right. And mm. uh, there were actually three of us fishing, my, my mate and his son and, and me. And as we sort of walked up to where our kit was, instantly I could see that my rods and reels had gone. I was like, I don't really believe it. Where could they have That's been? That's got to be the worst tackle theft ever. Yeah. On but, there. But, but the maddest thing is they hadn't touched anything else. So there's my mate's three rods and reels. Um, you know, and he had nice gear. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't like it was a load of cheap stuff. Um, and his son's stuff was still there. Bite alarms were still there. Pods and that that they were using. Um, yeah, so all they'd taken was my, I'd like a little, um, I think it's a witch with quiver, I think. And I had like three century SPs and some Biomaster reels, and I'd, I'd not actually had the, the rods very long. I'd only had them probably about two or three weeks. So, Well, that's yeah, brutal, I, mate, I was it? wounded. So we, we actually um, didn't fish that day, and we, we went to the like the Maison de Peche, you know, the, the, the office where you buy your permit, and, and walked in and, and sort of tried to explain to the guys. I mean, I'm, I can speak French. I'm not completely fluent, but I can sort of hold a conversation and sort of said to the guy in the office, look, you know, we're, we're fishing, day fishing on the lake, gone to fish this morning. My rods and reels were obviously you're, you're not meant to leave anything on your, your fishing site overnight. Yeah. Um, and I actually think, I don't know, but I think it was quite possibly one of the guard that took them. Mm. They just went shrug of the shoulders. Sorry, nothing to do with us. Can't help you sort of thing. Um, I'm convinced in my own mind, that was a little bit of a warning. Like we know you've been out here leaving stuff. It must be, because why would they just take one set? Exactly. Yeah, if you're going to take one, you'd take everything, wouldn't you? But... There's a guard with some nice centuries, mate, <laughs> yeah, fishing it. Probably, week in, week yeah, out. I know. Yeah, so yeah, that was... random, isn't it? Yeah, so that, that that's... And, and, and the worst thing about it was we were actually catching a lot of fish that week as well. So we, we were about three or four days in. And, um, yeah, to sort of have the trip cut short in that way was a, yeah, a bit, bit of a tough one to swallow on. But, yeah, there you go. These things happen, don't they? But, Mate, crazy. But what a place. I often think like, yeah, it is. I know it's got that sort of historical sort of, do you know what I mean? Wow factor. But even if it didn't, to step foot on that place for the first time and sort of take it in, mm. incredible, incredible sheet of water, mate. Yeah, it's, it's an awesome lake. It really is. Yeah, it's, it's probably one of my favourite lakes I think I've fished over there. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's special. Yeah, definitely. From one iconic French venue to another, mate, talk to me about Cassian. Oh, mate, where do you start? Where do you start? Um, 
So, it, I mean, I first sort of became aware of Cassian, like so many people back in, you know, like the mid 80s. And um, like I mentioned earlier, I used to do a paper around and I can remember seeing the Anglian Times with these iconic pictures in, uh, you know, Johnny Allen's catfish. And I remember the headline, oh, you know, so-and-so waiting, there's a bigger one inside. Uh, Kevin Ellis's fish, yeah. you know, people like uh, Andy Barker, um, you know, Phil Smith, all, all these sort of main anglers going there and catching these, obviously, you know, the godfather, Rod Hutchinson, Richie MacDonald. <clears throat> and um, yeah, they were just absolute icons, weren't they, to everybody really at that point. So it was always sort of on my radar that eventually one day, I, I mean, I can remember thinking at the time, you must be fucking mad. Why, why would you drive all the way to... <laughs> South of France, just to, to sort of, you know, go and try and catch some carp. But, of course, they weren't just carp, were they? They were these super fish. And um, I think what really, really inspired me to go there one day was the like the Rod Hutchinson chapters in Now and Then. You know, the story of the, you know, the infamous catfish fight. Mm. He's out in the boat and his other rods are ripping and getting pulled in and stuff. And I just thought, man, that is like, that's just something else. I've got to go and experience this one day. And um, obviously, you know, I was fishing elsewhere in France. So we, we spoke about, you know, Chantico and, you know, been to Salagou, been to Medine, quite a few other sort of, um, you know, renowned waters and, and you know, caught some nice fish. But <clears throat> I, I kept sort of hearing stories about Cassian, about it's busy. There's yeah. sort of, you know, there was that famous story about a guy got shot or shot at by another angler, mm. you know, like these sort of territorial you know, Wars, disputes yeah. and stuff about, you know, where people were fishing and, and, you know, sort of treading on each other's toes. And I thought, oh, I don't know, that's not really for me. Um, so I just left it alone, just never bothered going. And, you know, a, a couple of other mates of mine had said, oh, you know, let's just go. I, mean, I, I remember a few lads from Ringwood, actually, uh, Ollie Jenkins and, and, and I can't remember the other guy's name. Um, they sort of went and they had uh, Stevie back. Actually, they went and they they caught some nice fish. They had a few decent ones. I think one of them had like a fifty-seven. I think, and this was way back. You know, probably in the it, you know back in the late nineties. Um, so it was always there. You know, it was always one of them places. And then obviously you read Steve Briggs's you know material. He was writing about it, and so yeah, I knew I was going to go one day. It was just a matter of when. Um, but yeah, some of the stories just kept putting me off. You know, oh, there's you know there's litter everywhere. People crapping in the bushes and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but I suppose if, you know, fishing overseas teaches you anything is, you know, never believe everything you're told. Really, you need to go and experience it for yourself and then make your own opinion about somewhere. Um, and I, I mentioned a guy earlier, a chap called Andy Starkey, who obviously I, I bumped into him fishing on, on Shanty. And Andy used to live in Enfield, I think, in London. Um, mm. but he also used to come and work in Bournemouth. He was a taxi driver and that's where I met him actually sort of fishing on the roach pit and Summerlee. He used to fish for all species. So he's very, very good river angler, very good carp angler, but he also used to fish for eels as well. Um, eels. And he used to fish Summerlee for the big eels and stuff. And I always used to stop and chat to him when I see him. Um, and Andy sort of mentioned that he used to go to Cassian quite regularly. He used to go normally in the summertime. And I think what he used to do was when they, the regulations changed a bit on there and they basically introduced like the summer shutdown for night fishing. So when the tourist season it obviously it's had peak. its peak, yeah, they yeah. used to stop all the night anglers going for, for a couple of months, but you could still go and day fish. So Andy used to drive down and sort of, I think the nature of his work being a cabbie and he also used to, um, I think he had like a, a man and van business, you know, like doing removals, that sort of thing, you know, site clearance and all that. So he could earn money quite easily. So I think he was the sort of character that he would literally cane the work for several months, earn a load of money and then just go, right, I'm off fishing now. Um, you know, a bit of a free spirit. So he would just go to Cassie and him and his, his wife used to go for, you know, four weeks, six weeks, literally stay until the money ran out and then come home. Yeah. And sort of this is in, you know, pre-smartphone, but, you know, mobile phones are a thing by this point. So when he was down there, we used to keep in contact by text so every day I'll just drop him a message. Oh, any good today, mate? Yeah, yeah, caught five. Next day, caught six. You know, it, you could see it was quite prolific. And, you know, he sort of sold it to me on the premise. He said, look, if you go that time of year, there's hardly any anglers. He said, nobody wants to go in the summer because you can only day fish now. <clears throat> you know, the fish are not at their best weights. Um, but, 
there's no food going in, so they're starving, you know, and he absolutely creamed it. He caught a lot of fish, you know, sort of in that, in that period, but I still didn't go. I was still sort of, you know, just sort of fishing elsewhere. And then it got to, I think about 2013 and I just decided, well, I'm going now's the time. And by this time I'd met Nick Hellion, you know, Nick sort of became quite a good friend. Um, we had a few trips together, sort of fishing elsewhere. And of course, Nick had fished Cassian a few times. I think he actually went there on his honeymoon when he got <laughs> married as part of part of his honeymoon. Um, so he sort of said, look, you've just got to go, Mike. He said, just go and give it a try. He said, I think you'll, you'll really enjoy it. So I decided to go with my daughter, actually. So Cody, my daughter, uh, she would have been about 13 or 14. Right. And I said to her, look, we'll go in the summer when you're off school. So we'll try and go for like, Minimum two weeks, three weeks. And, and I sort of really you know, sold it to her. I said, look, it's a big lake. It's beautiful. It's blue. It's clear. You can go swimming every day. You can sunbathe. We'll have a great holiday. But, you know, secretly I was thinking like, <laughs> this is all right. I'm going fishing, you know. Um, so, yeah, off we went. So at the time I had like um, a little silver Astra van, sportive. Corder van, I used to call it, because all the Corder lads had it. Right. They had the same model. Um so yeah, loaded the quarter van up and, um, mate, uh, you literally couldn't fit anything else in there. We had like a camping fridge. Um, so the plan was to stay on one of the campsites near the lake yeah. and then just go off and day fish. Um, Nick had said like, you know, a fridge is essential. He said, cause if you go in that time of year, you, you can't keep anything fresh for any, anything longer than a day, you know, in a cool box. So we had to have a fridge. Um, he said, take a fan for your tent. He said, because obviously even at night time in like August, July, sort of August time, it's still 30 degrees plus. So we took two fans. Um, so we had our big tent set up on the campsite, a fan each. It was bliss, you know, so you get back from your days fishing, you got a fridge full of cold Cronenbergs or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> got your fan on, brilliant, happy days. So yeah, so we, we, we sort of planned to go for, I think, minimum of two weeks, but it was a bit of an open-ended trip. You know, we said, look, we'll, we'll just sort of stay as long as we feel like staying. And I had no great sort of aspiration of catching loads and loads of fish. I knew it had obviously a bit of a difficult reputation. You know, lots of people go there and catch nothing. That's the reality, really. Yeah. Um, and I knew I wasn't really going at the best time of year because it was evident there was going to be loads and loads of tourist activity on the lake. Didn't really know <clears throat> to what extent that would affect the fishing, you know, because I'd never been. I didn't really know, you know, fully what to expect. But, you know, when Nick had gone, admittedly, it was a few years earlier. Um, and I think Nick may have sort of fished it around the time when there weren't so many catfish in there. Mm. Um, and, of course, now it's it's well known that the, the cats have become a real problem. Boom, don't they? Know, they? They've literally exploded, yeah. And there's, there's so many big ones in there now. Um, so, yeah, I wasn't really quite sure what to expect in, in you know in, in that respect as well but uh yeah so we we got down there got ourselves set up on the campsite and the first day's fishing i think we launched the boat near Averon, the sailing club and i went and fished a little swim called tench point in the west arm um purely really just to sort of film my way into the lake i didn't really you know you, you sort of look at it on google maps but until you're actually there you you, you don't really appreciate how you know you look yeah. at distance, but then, you know, when you're looking at it across water and when you're actually there in person, it's like suddenly things become a lot further than they actually are. Um, so yeah, really just to sort of, you know, feel my way into it. I didn't want to fish too far from the van the first couple of days. <clears throat> didn't catch anything. Um, and then, you know, when you sort of became a bit more familiar with where you could launch, where you could park, then sort of started to fish a little bit further afield. So we did a couple of days in the West Arm. I think we did a day in Matilda. Um, you know, real famous swim. You got a big sort yeah. of feature in front there. Again, didn't catch anything, didn't see anything. And I sort of tried a couple of mornings getting up early. Um, Cody, she obviously didn't want to get out of bed at three, four o'clock in the morning. So I said, look, you stay in the campsite on your own. And I was always a bit mindful. A, it sort of seemed a bit selfish, me going off fishing and leaving her for a few hours. And she's only a kid at the end mm. of the day. And, you know, even though the campsite's all secure, you just never know. Do you know what I mean? It's leaving a teenage girl on her own. So anything could happen. So yeah, yeah I, I sort of tried it a couple of mornings, but I, I just didn't really enjoy it. To be honest, I was always, my mind was back at the campsite really. Um, so yeah, sort of tried a couple of days up in the South arm, you know, up around the Island Bay, um, went up to Gerard's beach, I think. 
Again, didn't see anything or catch anything. And I remember sort of coming to the end of the first week and I sat there, it would have been around about midday, and I saw a couple of fish roll. Um, we were fishing, we'd launched sort of in the end of the south arm. There's like the main launch that most of the anglers use. And I didn't go far from there. I went up towards, I think, Bivy Point. And um, I remember just sort of sat there and we're just eating some lunch. And I just happened to look up and I see a couple, literally in very quick succession, two different fish. And it, I, I literally, like, my senses come alive. That's <laughs> yeah, the only yeah. way you can describe it. It was like, oh, my God, literally just seen a carp, you know. It, it was like a, a sort of pivotal moment in the trip, really. Um, and, again, didn't catch anything. <laughs> Bit of a recurring theme. And it, it just seemed that wherever I tried, I just, you know, couldn't seem to get anything going. I was sort of trying bait in different areas and stuff. And Right, you were putting bait in a Yeah, well, sort you? of, you know, t- trying to get something going, really. But, um, yeah, just sort of, you know, disappearing up my own backside, really. And then I think the second week we had sort of a couple of days out sightseeing. We drove up into the, you know, the Verdon Gorge and spent the day up there, went to St. Croix. Um, yeah, just the most beautiful amazing part of France. I love it. I absolutely love it down there. And then well, I think we went to, there was another lake about 45 minute drive from there down towards Nice. Um, that's relatively well known now. I think a few people have been there and, and filmed. Um, and that was a bit more prolific. So we had a couple of days down there, caught a few fish and that kind of, I thought, well, at least if I go home, I've caught something. Do you know what I mean? Right. It's nice to go home knowing at least you've caught one. And we had a few from there, just like fairly small ones up to sort of mid-20s. But, uh, you know, deep down, I, I knew I really, really wanted to sort of try and, you know, go home having said that, you know, I've caught a cart from Cassian. And we were sort of getting right towards the end of the trip. And I'd done a couple of days in the North Arm. Um, and I remember we fished around Third Point, And Ian McMillan had told me, God rest his soul, because um, Ian used to be our tracker rep in the shop. Oh, right. Yeah, sort of, you know, going back a few years previous. Um, so I got to know him really well. And like so many people would say, you know, he, he's just one of life's lovely, lovely people. I miss him dearly. And Ian had said to me, because he had done a few trips down there, I think, in, in the sort of summer period. And he said, look, just look for the weed beds. He said, that's all you got to do. Just find the weed, you'll find the carp. And I remember sort of fishing around Third Point in the north and just close in there are a few weed beds you could literally go out not even 10 yards. So you were just sort of fishing on the drop off, um, you know, and you went out in the boat and look, and you could see like these nice sort of sandy clearings in amongst the weed. I think it's like that Potomagetan weed. Yeah. So it's quite a sort of, um, <clears throat> sort of calcareous leaf, isn't it? It's, it's quite weird sort of stuff. Funny to, to sort of touch. Um, and you know, I was placing rigs in there. So I felt, you know, I was sort of fishing as effectively as I could, but just not seeing anything, you know, you had not really anything to go on. Yeah. And, you know, there's so much sort of swimming activity. You've got people paddle boarding, you know, you've got the fire planes coming in every day, sort of, mm, you know, creepy. there's just an awful lot of noise on the lake. And yeah, it was, um, yeah, it's just, just difficult not really knowing where to go. You know, you, it was all just sort of guesswork really. And I can remember sort of um, looking on Google earth or Google maps or whatever. And, and a couple of mates of mine had said, look, try right down the end of the north. You know, if you can get in the barrage swim, um, there was another swim called Passerelle, which um, a couple of mates had said, look, if you can get yourself down there, you, you probably stand a chance, you know, if it's really hot, he said the fish are often down that end of the north arm. So I thought, look, I haven't been down that far yet. So let's give it a go. And I only had a couple of batteries with me and I thought, you know, they're, they're not, lithiums they were just old lead lead acid batteries i thought no way am i going to get all the way from you know from the bridge all the way there and back on probably not even on two batteries so i thought i wonder if i can actually drive down to you know get the van somewhere near to the water down there so of course i'm I'm looking on google earth and i could see that there's a road that goes up towards tanneron and there was a road that sort of forked off from there and i could see this track on google google maps that went down seemingly to the water and I thought well I'll go and check it out so jumped in the van drove down there and um started driving down this track and mate it's like a you know like it's some of the top gear things yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. You see sort of Clarkson you know sort of perched precariously on the edge of some sort of precipice it was like that it was it was so rutted and steep 
and of course by this point I'd sort of got so far down this track that I was sort of past the point in no return. Yeah, keep going. So I thought, oh God, you know, and of course Cody's absolutely, you know, shitting it basically, thinking <laughs> we're gonna write the van off or something's gonna go wrong. Um <clears throat> but yeah, we, we eventually made it down to the lake. And uh uh, of course, I'm mindful now. I'm thinking, how am I going to get out? Do you know what I mean? It, it, it was so steep and, you know, all these sort of big ravines sort of through the center of the track and stuff. And I'm thinking, oh, I've made a, like, a wrong decision here. So I thought, look, we're here anyway. Let's just get the rods out and fish. Yeah, too right. And um, so we sort of, you know, part of the van up, cast a couple of rods in. Um, and it was it was deep down. You know, obviously, the north arm is sort of down nearest the barrage. So it's the deepest part of the lake. So... I've literally just found three rods out, probably, you know, one about 20 yards, one about 30, one about 50 yards. Scatter some baits out with a throwing stick. And this was at the time when, when Ian Moore was developing the bait that became Equinox, um, which was sort of in circulation for a couple of years. And then he took it out of the range and they bought mm. Pacific, you know, Pacific Tuna instead. So I had a mixture of like some of the Odyssey Triple X um, and some of the Equinox baits. So I just mixed it up, put it oh, out with a stick yeah. And, yeah, and sort of give it a go. And we, we sort of went for a swim, you know, and, and that was pretty much how you sort of spent your days at, at Cassie in that time of year. You would just get the rods out fishing. It's holiday fishing to me. I don't take it that, that seriously, really. So we just jump in the lake, you know, and we were there sort of playing water polo and just pissing about, really. And it got to about five o'clock in the afternoon. And I can remember we were saying it was so hot. It must have been, I don't know, mid thirties plus. It was a really, really hot day, really windy, you know, sort of, you know, nice day to be out if you're in the shade. And uh, we'd been for a swim. We were sat there playing cards. And I've just heard a couple of beeps, you know, beep, beep. And I was using Neville's at the time. So I sort of looked up and I've just seen my right hand rod just pull down really, really slowly and kept going and going. And I'm like, right, this is it. This is my chance. So I jumped down, picked up the rod and started playing this fish. <clears throat> and um, I instantly thought it was a cat. Yeah. It just had that feel, you know, there there were these sort of sudden, you know, sort of funny little movements on the line, like a big head shake, and then it would go a bit slack and then, you know, then pull down again. So in my mind, I was just convinced it was it was a cat I was playing. But you, you're never quite sure, are you, until you see it. So I'm playing this fish and playing it. And, of course, I hadn't inflated the boat because we'd just driven down there. Oh, of course, you're in the van, so yeah. So I'm just in the van. So I'm thinking, like, if this snags me up, then I'm, I'm in trouble, really. So... Yeah, I was incredibly lucky. I had it on probably for about, I don't know, 15 minutes. And um, yeah, I, I sort of see it come past me and I thought, no, that's definitely a carp. It's, it's not a cat. Didn't really realise how big it was. And um, then it sort of came up and rolled and sort of coughed and that. And I thought, oh my God, that is a fucking giant. <laughs> like, how's your luck, literally? And um, yeah, sort of managed to get it in the net. And, and it was one of the big commons. I think there's... At the time, there were sort of two or three big commons in the lake. Um, not sure if this was the biggest one. I know Steve Briggs has definitely called it, and it's a bit of a well-known one. I'm sure it's called Lumpy or something. Right. Um, How big was he? Yeah, 61 pounder. Jesus. So I, I, I just couldn't believe my luck, mate. I, that's your I, first bite? That was my first bite, yeah. First bite, first cart was, um, was yeah, one of the, the sort of really old special ones. Um, and it was just mega, sort of having Cody there as well. You know, it, and I've got some brilliant like video footage of, you know, obviously I've had some video done with me with it in the water yeah. and some stills and stuff. And then I've got Cody in the water with it as well. So I've got footage of her holding it and some nice pictures. And it's, yeah, to see like a, you know, young kids that are holding this absolute behemoth of a carp. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was incredible. Um, so yeah, that, that was that. And I think we, we, we had a lot, maybe a couple more days, I think after that, before we decided to come home. And I, from that point on, I just couldn't stop thinking about the place. It, it, you know, not only, obviously, I was incredibly lucky catching that one. And I don't see any great element of skill. It was just, you know, I happened to be fishing there and it happened to swim past and pick up my bait. So, you know, I, I, there was no technical ability. Yeah, involved, do, do you know anything. what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. of course not. You know, I, I wouldn't try and kid myself otherwise. Um, so, yeah, I felt in, incredibly fortunate to catch that one. Um, and in the manner I did really, but then I just couldn't stop thinking about the place. And I don't know if you've ever been or if you've got plans to no, go, but no. I think of all the places I've been in France, it's uh, nowhere leaves quite an impression on you like that. I know, I know Ollie has been, <clears throat> he had a trip again last year. Yeah. Um, 
he said the same. It's just there's everyone something. says it, mate. Yeah. And I, there's something. There's an atmosphere. There's something there that everybody that I know is, that's ever been there has said it. And yeah, it, it's for the life of me. Like you put it, you put it in layman's terms. What you've just said there, mm. Aggie day fishing. Yeah, people jumping in the lake, pedlos, snags. <laughs> yeah. A massive stock of catfish. Yeah. Oh, no thanks. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But everybody that goes there goes, I need to get back. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that is the truth of it, really. Um, <clears throat> you know, in terms of, you know, big fish to go and catch, you're driving past probably 100 better places to get to Cassian. I, I, I genuinely think that. Um, but there's nowhere quite like it. You know, Steve Riggs will say exactly the same yeah. thing, you know, and he's been he's probably fished there more than anybody over the years. Um. Yeah, it, uh, I just couldn't wait to go back. I literally couldn't wait to go back. So the following year, we went again, did the same sort of thing, went in the summertime. Um, really, really, obviously, the first trip, I only caught that one. Um, second trip, I blanked, didn't catch anything, um, and tried really hard. Like, you know, I, mm. I really, really sort of went for it for a couple of weeks. Um, and I just thought, Christ, you know, it's quite unforgiving, really. You know, when you're sort of making all that effort, it's hot. You know, I'm I'm no athlete, mate. Look at me. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I don't so, know, mate. Right. Um, so you know, all the sort of carting your kit around in the heat and stuff, it is it's ball breaking. Yeah. It's it's a really difficult place to sort of go and fish on your own. Um, you know, and of course trying to keep Cody happy as well. It's the know, balance like, of it all, isn't trying it? To, yeah, exactly that. That's the word. Yeah, trying to find a balance really. So yeah, the second trip wasn't wasn't good, didn't catch anything. Um I think we stopped somewhere on the way home actually and caught some. So that, that sort of saved, you know, saved the trip. Um, and then I think the third time I went, I went, where was Cody with me? I can't remember now. I think I'm sure she must've been. Um, and I met, uh, Ian, my friend I talked about who was boat fishing on, on Dudare. Mm. Um, he was down there as well for the same sort of couple of weeks. And this time I'd actually decided to take my boat down on the trailer so I still had like a, an inflatable, but I brought like a a little uh, like a motorbike trailer, and yeah, and converted it. So you know, rather than use the, the add the sort of runners on it to put a bike on, took those off, put some rollers on there, so I could actually you know use it for a boat, and absolute game changer. Mm -hmm. So you know, doing the day fishing at least then I could back down the slipway, boat's already inflated, got your batteries in there, your bucket of bait, everything you need, push the boat in go and park up the car on the trailer and that's it. You know, rods in, chair, gone. You're away yeah. fishing. Um, so it, it kind of transformed it really and it made it a lot easier. And I think the easier you try and make something, you just, I don't know, I think you fish a bit more efficiently. You've got a bit more enthusiasm. Um, and I sort of made a decision then. I wasn't going to bother going out in the mornings because I just thought, hey, I've never caught one in the morning never really seen a great deal. And I know some people might say complete waste, you know, you're an idiot. You, sh you should be there first light sort of thing. Um, so we just decided to keep it really nice and relaxed and just fish from, you know, two, three in the afternoon through till dark. Um, and that third trip, it, it sort of came good. And I caught a few that, oh, nice. that session, you know, no, no monsters. Um, I think I had a couple of 40 pound commons, um, another one about sort of 34 pound, I think from memory, so, and I think maybe a couple of small ones. So I think I had about sort of five or six fish that trip. It was it nothing was different right. technically rig wise bait application. No, I mean, <clears throat> obviously having the boat, you know, uh, easily available to me each, each sort of day. Um, I was actually sort of dropping the rigs from the boat rather than casting. Okay. Um, and I started to use a little bit of particle rather than just sort of boilies. So I was using, you know, just sort of classic fermented sort of, pigeony mix type stuff um and some hemp and and obviously just you know a few boilies and chops and stuff um and i found a particular swim down in the north arm which was sort of down past third point on the same side um like a little corner the bank sort of curved into your left and there was a nice little spot i could just sit there in the shade it was lovely you know a nice little sloping bank down to the water and when i went out in the boat i found basically like a an underwater feature. So basically it was like a continuation of part of the bank. So you've got all of these little bays and cuttings along the, uh, along the bank there. And there was obviously a bit like a, a slightly shallower sort of right, finger, strip. if you like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that ran out into the, into the, into the, the, the main part of the lake. 
Um, so all I did was basically just sort of staggered a couple of rods along that feature, you know, one in about 28 foot, one in about 40 foot. That's sort of fishing it, so it's still deep. Um, you know, a few handfuls of particle, a couple of boilies, and, and, and that was a good area. Yeah, I sort of had a few bites on there. So, yeah, it was um, – but, yeah, you know, every time you go, you learn something about the place. It's – um, you know, I think you could probably fish that lake for the rest of your life mm. and you'd still not know everything there is to know about it. It's – yeah, it's quite a sort of mysterious place, which is is unusual for a lake that's been so heavily fished over the years and published, you know, publicised by so many good anglers. And you think that, you know, even to this day, you still never quite know exactly what's in there and you know how many big fish there are. And it's it, it seems to me like it's constantly evolving. You know, I know they've put some young fish in there again now, yeah. so it'll be interesting to see how they, you know, they progress in the coming years. But um, yeah, it's magic. I absolutely love it. Really, really love it. A place that's very, I'd say, different. Still quite, I'd say, raw. It's got a raw element, but it's definitely a bit more, a bit more managed. The fishing on the other side of things is is probably the rawest as it can get. Is Rainbow, mate? Mm. You've done a bit on there. Now yeah, that yeah. that yeah. again probably takes out that element of unknown to some extent. There's a lot mm. of biggins in there. Yeah. A lot of the real biggins are named and they're they're more of a of a pay lake slash syndicate vibe, if you like. Your your experiences on there, after doing your travels and you reference Medine and other places in amongst Cassian and Adair, going on to Rainbow, what what was the the rationale behind that? Was it because a trip was offered and you felt like seeing what all the hype was about, or was it because there was that that mm. real sort of different extreme style of angling that's associated with the place um <clears throat> right to go back to the, the sort of beginning part of the rainbow chapter if you like uh i first went there in 2003 okay so it's going back quite a yeah, long way early. you know you know back in the early days really um obviously working in poindesters you used to see a lot of anglers from the southampton area coming in one of which was Paul Hunt. He used to do the trips, oh, trips, yes. yeah, like you know, okay. the, the um, you know, the, the mini bus trips down to to Rainbow. I'd known Paul for years and years before that. I'd known him for a long time. Um, you know, fishing back on Sway Lakes and places like that, back in the, the very early days, <clears throat> and sort of lost touch with him a little bit. And then, of course, Paul happened to walk in the shop one day with some some leaflets. So I'm starting doing trips to this lake in France down near Bordeaux. Um. Didn't know anything of it, never heard of it. Obviously, I knew a few other waters in that area. I've, I've been to Mimazan. Um, obviously, you've got Biscarros, Sanguinette, some other, you know, sort of big lakes in that region, public lakes. Um, and Paul sort of said, look, if you fancy a trip, I'll do you a bit of a deal. So me and Jim Carpenter went. We went for a week in November, I think it was. And we had swim number 16, both of us fishing in there. Didn't really know what to expect. Um, you know, Paul had done a fair few trips himself by this point. Um, and it just completely different to anywhere I'd ever fished really. Mm. Um, now, obviously I, I'm probably sort of fairly synonymous with public lake fishing. Yeah. So it felt a bit odd doing the whole, you know, pay for your week, pre-book a swim. You can't really move that. That didn't really sort of sit particularly comfortably with us really, but you just go with it, you know, go and give it a try. And, you know, Paul had been catching some really, really nice fish from there. So, yeah, we, we, we thought we'd give it a chance. And um, that first week was good, actually. We didn't catch loads. I think I had about six. I think Jim might have had about half a dozen as well. Uh, no monsters. I think we I certainly had a 40-pounder, I think, was probably the biggest, like a mm -hmm. low 40. Um, but, yeah, sort of instantly fell in love with the place a little bit. And it had just a, a very just calm, tranquil atmosphere. You know, when you're sat there and it's quiet, there's no noise and you can just hear the wind through all the pine trees and stuff. It's, it's quite evocative. You know what I mean? It's just nice, just chilled out and you think, yeah, this is, this is all right. And the fishing side of it, I mean, a lot has been said and a lot's been written about rainbow saying, Oh, it's, it's extreme, mm. extreme, this extreme, that personally, I don't really buy into that. I don't think it's quite as extreme as a lot of people say. And I think, people have sort of built this persona of, you know, around the place. And I'm not saying they're making it out to be something it's not, but there's ways of fishing on there. And you could see some people that would be, you know, you could see evidence, you know, in the trees, there'd be a hook, you know, yep. putting a line around there. And you think, where are they going with that? You know, and then off down a channel and then round a corner. 
that never really sat particularly comfortably with me. Yeah. And yeah, of course people do it and you've got a boat at your disposal. So, you know, there's no reason to fish unsafely on there far from it, but I I can't honestly say I ever really felt I was fishing in that manner when I fished on there. Right. I would always sort of try and fish a direct line to the spot I was fishing. So no, no. yeah, no rings, no taking them around corners. Yeah, I mean, no. occasionally, like, you know, I fish swim 19. In 19, you've got an island out to your left just in front of you. Put a storm pole on the corner, just a runny line round at a slight angle. Okay. Um, But, yeah, I've heard stories where people were sort of fishing, you know, really, in my opinion, probably where they shouldn't have been. Mm. Um, And I thought, I'm not going to get involved in any of that. You know, there's clearly lots and lots of carp in the lake. They're hungry. So just fish it normal style, really. Um, and that's and that's what we did. So we had that trip in November, which was, like I say, was, wasn't was brilliant, but we caught a few and gave us a bit of a, a you know a taste of the lake. And then Paul said he was planning on doing a few, like, sort of deep winter trips. Um, so the plan was he, he said, look, you go for two weeks. He said, I think a week's not long enough that time of year. So we had a trip booked for the following January for two weeks. And he said at that point, the lake hadn't really been fished much in the winter. He said, but it shouldn't freeze because it's very near the coast. You know, the, the ambient temperature is pretty good for that time of year. Right. So, of, of course, there's always a risk. You could go there and get a real cold snap and, and, and get caught out, but it was unlikely. So, yeah, we booked a two-week trip with him. Um, and back in those days, you could have a swim to yourself. You know, there wasn't so much pressure on the lake. So that that – First two week we did, I think I had swim 21 to myself. Uh, a mate of mine had five to himself. So, you know, all of these, what have become very, very famous, you know, household names, if you like, household swims. Um, normally they're two anglers per swim nowadays, but back then it was just one one person. Yeah. So it was brilliant. You know, you could literally span your rods yeah, out. Yeah, happy and, days. You know, and we said to Paul, you know, four rods, and he went, use five, use six. Yeah. We were like, wow, really? You know, is it that relaxed? He said, yeah. You know, so we, often we'd put like a fifth rod out or something, um, you know, not completely take the piss, but um, yeah, do it a little bit sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean that, that first two weeker, we were very lucky with the weather. It was, um, you know, quite mild, windy, you know, sort of periods of rain and stuff, not particularly cold. I think we did towards the end of it, we did have a couple of days of snow. Um, but the lake didn't freeze and it actually fished really, really well when the snow front came through it, 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 um, it, you know, there were rods going off around the lake. It was, it was bizarre. Um, but yeah, we, we just caught a load. It was really, really prolific, you know, and I think, I don't know how many of us went, I think there were about eight or nine anglers. I think we had close to 200 fish or something. Wow. That is prolific. Which, yeah. So all of a sudden it kind of opened up a time of the year when normally you just wouldn't be at all interested in going fishing you know you might do the odd day session or something back home but um you know i'd never really entertain going to france in january before yeah so yeah we just booked immediately booked for the following year and um <clears throat> yeah i think in total probably had about maybe three or four winter trips down there always the winters yeah always the winter time i i i remember i did a week once in april um and i did a week once in june which was a very sort of spare of the moment trip. I actually flew down, pulled up my gear down in, in the minibus. Um, and me and my mate just hopped on a flight, my mate Jace. Um, we hopped on a flight down to Bordeaux and he picked us up from the airport. Um, yeah. And we, and we sort of did a week down there, you know, in the warmer, warmer time, which was, was good, but I, I've got to be honest, I really preferred the winter. Um, it's just so atmospheric when it's, you know, you, you get those really cold misty mornings and, it's, it's magic, you know, seeing the sun come up through all the pine trees and the mist. And yeah, it was, um, yeah, really sort of special atmosphere. So Ricks, bay, boilie um, again, small amounts yeah, of bay. Just, just, just boilies. Um, when I went in the summer, I, the, the time I went in June, I caught, I had a really good week actually. I, I had about 20 something fish, which for me is good. I know people have gone there and caught far more than that, but, um, I was using Brazil nuts. So just like half a Brazil and a bit of fake corn and sort of fishing over, you know, beds of seed and stuff. And, and that seemed to work really, really well. But during the winter time, it was predominantly boilies. Yeah, boilies and a few tigers and that sort of thing. Mm. Um, but what we did sort of discover during those, uh, during those winter trips was that the longer you left a, a rod undisturbed, yes, that 
the better generally you. speaking, the better your chances were. Why do you think that is on there? Because that's that's a common thing even to now. They, a lot of people yeah, will leave rods out two, three days plus. Mate, we, we had to take on a rod that'd been out 11 days once. 11 days? 11 days, yeah. Yeah, my mate just left it and left it and left it. And I was like, you're mad. And eventually it went, it went and he had one. Um, cool. Yeah, it's, it's, it's mad. Like to most people just couldn't even compute that, you know, to, to leave a rod in, in place for that length of time. But um, yeah, in those early winter trips, we, we met a group of lads from London way, um, a chap called Mark Adams, who used to be involved in a company called Elite Baits. Mm. Um, and I've lost contact with Mark now, but he at the time was um, – sort of involved in the bait company with a lad called Jordan, Jordan Wesley, who lots of people listening will probably know, a savvy angler. Right. Um, one of the best anglers I know, mate. He's an absolute Jedi, really, really good guy. And we, we constantly talk on WhatsApp and stuff. Um, he sort of become one of my best mates. And they were just a different breed of angler again, you know. And I always felt that, you know, some of the lads from Ringwood were really, really good, you know, and very, very sharp and and you know, really knew what they were doing, but these guys were just like next level. And I think sort of from fishing around the Colm Valley, um, it just breeds really, really good anglers that, you know, technically very good, good in a boat, you know, doing that style of fishing. Um, and yeah, sort of speaking to, to, to Mark and, and Geordie and, uh, Kev Garrett, obviously Kev the lead who very sadly passed away, you know, last year. Um, you know, sort of became good mates with Kev and, you know, hands down, one of the best anglers I've ever met. An absolute brilliant, brilliant angler. And yeah, that you know, that they sort of um, kind of got me into that way of thinking about just leaving the swim undisturbed. You know, he said, look, at the end of the day, you, you've gone out, you've used a prodding stick or whatever, you found a really, really nice spot. If you've got a decent hard hook bait on there or a tiger or something, why just keep going out disturbing it? You know, that time of year. And it, they sort of felt that, it was proven to them, you know, and their results alone on their, the early elite baits trips that, you know, rods just left undisturbed. Often they would either produce the biggest fish or, you know, or, or, or you know, more regular action. than if you were just constantly going in and out disturbing the swim each day. So yeah, it kind of became a bit of a thing, which I think's carried on to a lot of anglers You're and still, still go there, there now. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's mad, but um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's a special lake. It's a special, lake. I mean, I haven't really got any desire to go back there now. No. Um, you know, I had my time on there. I, I mean, obviously now it's very well documented how many big fish are in there. It's just, it's insane, isn't it? So many big carp. But I don't know, it, it, the moment you start seeing a few fish with mouth damage and stuff, and, and that's purely just down to, I don't think necessarily the way people fish, but that's, a lot of those big fish do just get caught a lot. You know, they probably get caught a bit too much you know, three or four times a year, some of them. And that's, that's a lot of stress and, mm. you know, uh, and pressure on a, on, on a big old carp, I, I think. So, um, yeah, I, I probably wouldn't ever go back. Never say never, but I, I, I haven't really got any, any desire to go back there, to be honest. And I, I do really feel, even though the days that we were there, um, probably weren't the best in terms of the numbers of massive fish like there are now. Um, you know, and there was a period probably from, I don't know, say sort of 2008 to 2015, where it was, it was the number one lake. Wasn't yeah, it, it was I the mean, place. Everybody wasn't it? wanted to, to be yeah. at Rainbow. Um, just insane numbers of big carp. And yeah, we, we were prior to that, I think, you know, most of the fish we were catching were probably 20 to 40 pounders. Right. Obviously. And then every now and then your big one would come along as well, which was, was great. But um, personally, I feel we had the best of it. I, I think, you know, it was nice to sort of be there before everyone else, if that makes sense. So, yeah, too, right. Yeah, what, what about good. other public venues, mate? We, we, we've noticed a few sort of, as you can say, sort of popular ones, and we sort of name them. But you've had success on a, on a number of different public venues that probably, if you know, you know, but if you don't, you don't. And we're not going to disrespect local anglers, as we mm. you've mentioned before in this podcast, <clears> by naming them. But some of your, your best chapters have been from lakes that aren't, those well-trodden publicised ones are they? They're just mm. public waters that you've gone to and and it and it's sort of turned into a bit of a red letter session, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I've been <clears throat> been lucky a couple of times. Um I mean, first thing I would say about, you know, fishing some of these venues is you know, and I always remember Nick saying to me that one trip in ten is a good one. And I right. reckon he's probably about right. You know, when you when you look at all the fishing you do, 
every now and then you'll just get one trip that, that, that really stands out and you'll catch a load of fish or you catch two or three big ones or whatever. But, you know, you have to go for a lot of shit to get, get one decent one. <laughs> yeah. Um, unless you're incredibly lucky, you know, or, or incredibly good. <laughs> so, yeah, I've, I've, I've had a couple of good trips to other lesser known venues. Um, one of which um, I'm guessing you're probably leading to this lake. Um, we'll call it the Dolphin Lake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which um, it, it first became known to me through Tony Davies Patrick. So he actually went and fished there, I think, a few times, back, way back in the probably the early 2000s, I reckon. Um, and it's not a big lake. It was only, I'm going to say, 10 to 15 acres. Mm. So it's not a big, big lake at all. So quite different to a lot of the other places I would probably normally yeah, sort of choose, choose there, to yeah. go and fish. Um, and I remember seeing his articles in Carp World and he was catching these just monsters, like, you know, really big, impressive looking carp. And there was also a French guy called Raphael, I can't remember his surname now, um, who obviously he must have befriended this guy down there and they were fishing together. And he was also catching some just giants, these monster carp, you know, real big ones. Um, so yeah, I was kind of aware of this place and of course, you know, Dolphin Lake, where's that? It, just then obviously they'd made a name for it, you know, based on the size of the fish in there. So I had nothing to go on at all. And purely by chance, um, a couple of guys I actually mentioned earlier in, in, in this podcast from the Ringwood area, mm. uh, my mates, Rich and Roland, they, they're like carp detectives, these guys. <laughs> so they, they will just spend hours upon hours upon hours trawling the net looking for clues you know finding some pretty obscure venues and and they actually mentioned to me we think we found it yeah so they, they sort of suggested that they'd um potentially found this lake so i think they they'd actually been on a trip down to cassian or were going to cassian or somewhere uh, you know in the story cassian was involved i think they might have stopped into this dolphin lake on the way back after a, a sort of summer trip down to, to Cass and ended up with Simon catching one of the big ones in there. There was a fish called Nautilus, which was like a huge framed, big sort of leathery one, absolute monster. Um, Simon caught this fish, I think, at 35 kilos, so 77, 78 pounds. Yeah, real big one. Absolute giant. Um, and of course that, I was interested straight away, you know, and of course the guy, the guys came back and the, you know, we, we met in the pub and had a beer and they were like, oh, you just can't believe this lake. It's ridiculous. How many big carp are in there? Um, it's not a big lake. It's really, really snaggy. It's quite clear. And I was like, yeah, this sounds like a bit of me. Let's, let's go, you know? So the following summer, we, we planned to do a trip. Um, I don't think Roland could go. So there was myself, Cy Casey and Richard Graham. And we planned to go for, uh, I think, two to three weeks. It's quite a lengthy trip. And I think the idea was, because it's not a big lake, um, with the layout of the lake, there's not that many swims, really, that you can you can fish without. If there's other people there, you'd very easily get into Camden, a dispute. Yeah, yeah. So the plan was to go there. It, obviously, if it was stitched up, we'd just go straight to Cassian and fish there instead. And, yeah, I remember we, we sort of... Um, you know, prepared. Obviously, the guys had had this one trip before, and they, the way they generally fish in France, normally they would use a lot of hemp, and they find they found that very successful at Cassian, and they've kind of carried that onto other venues they fish. So they'll bait very, very heavily with hemp seed. Um, you know, just hemp. Yeah, yeah, literally just hemp, right. and then just fish. You know, obviously sluis and boilies as well, but you know that that was sort of fundamental to their fishing. So, um, I sort of went along with it. I said, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll get a few sacks of hemp, and I took some peanuts, and obviously a few boilies and that as well. And off we went. So I can remember we, you know, it's a long old drive down to where this this lake is, is situated. Um, I can remember we got there sort of early evening time and we'd stopped at a McDonald's not far from there just to get something to eat. I remember getting out of the van and it was like, oh my God, it is so hot. It was absolutely cooking, you know, probably mid to upper thirties, really windy. And I just thought, oh, do you know what? I'm, unless there's some shade here, I'm like, I'm, not entirely sure I'm really going to enjoy this, you know? And uh, we got to the lake, nobody there. And we literally couldn't believe our luck. You know, we, we all the, the whole journey, we were thinking like there's going to be two, three, four anglers on yeah. there. So yeah, we, we just couldn't believe it. So what we planned on doing, 
just to give you a bit of a picture, the, the lake is sort of fairly square in shape. And there was like an old roadway in the middle of the lake that sort of ran out from one of the, the if you can imagine a rectangle, and there was like an old sunken roadway that ran out into the centre of the lake um, that had loads of trees left on it, obviously right. when they constructed it. So you had all of these old sort of dead finger trees sticking out of the water. And it was probably about 20 foot deep, I reckon, where these trees were. And you could sort of go out in the boat and look down and you could see, you know, couldn't see the bottom, but you could see a long way down. Yeah. Um, that was clearly where they lived, basically. You know, that that was their home. Um, so what we decided to do was all three of us fished from one point and just sort of found our rods along this tree line. Obviously, with um, Cy and Rich having been there before, I was I kind of felt like I was their guest, really. So I said, look, you fish the tree line, I'll fish more the open water. And uh, so I sort of fished to the right, you know, from where, where they were and fish more out into the open part of the lake and still found quite a few features to fish. There are a few sort of shallow, you know, shallow humps and lots of weed and a few other snags and stuff. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so the first night we got there, we didn't fish or hadn't planned to fish because it was sort of, you know, getting quite you know near towards dark. And I remember just walking along the bank to our right and the, the lake sort of went down into a corner. I remember just walking along and just seeing this group of fish close in. I was like, oh my God, they are monsters. Like there was half a dozen fish there. I don't reckon any of them were under 40 pound. They were like wow. big ones. And they were literally just like head and shoulder and close in. And there was like a big raft of weed there. And I thought, I've got a fish. I can't, can't ignore this. And I said to went back to the swim, said to the guys that I'm just going to take my bed chair and my rods and just, just keep down here for the night, just chuck them in the edge and, and, and sort of see if we can catch one. So I can remember just literally underarming a couple of rigs out, sitting back nice and quiet, just on my bed chair, no brawler or anything. It was it was really hot, windy. And I can remember it was a full moon night as well. And I can remember just sitting on my bed and I could see and hear these shapes, like big black head in the moonlight and the ripple just like, Ooh. probably you know as close as, as you are to me now literally just out from the bank um honestly mate uh, probably the most exciting night's fishing i've ever had mm. you know in, in my whole life it was just incredible and i remember i just had like beep beep on the rod nothing beep beep on the second rod oh, what's going on and you know these liners or what anyway eventually drifted off to sleep woke up in the morning you know the fish had gone the wind had gone nothing happened so of course, picked the first rod up, reeled it in, no bait, no. and um, I hadn't really realised how severe the crayfish problem was. It was no. so you know I'm absolutely certain that had I've had a tiger on or something, or you know a more durable hook bait, then I, I'd have definitely caught one that night. And uh, anyway, so we went back to the main swim, started you know got the boats up, got fishing, and the bit I had to fish basically, <clears throat> I could probably fish about. 80 to 100 yards out into the lake and there was a, a sort of bit of an extension of that sort of shallow area with the, all the trees on it and I could sort of come up over the shallow area and there was a really nice drop off the far side of it an area of thick weed and I thought it's just, it's just prime it's perfect and you know I could visualize my rig sort of laying down on the shelf you know all the leg core sort of pinned down nicely I thought yeah. yeah this is this is game on and I think the first night I had two um, I had a 34 and a 35, um, and they were quite different. I remember the 34 was like a big, long sort of yellow, like a banana, like a big, long yellow one. Right. And the other one looked a bit, a bit Simo-ish. It was sort of quite high backed, sort of deep, gutty one, a bit pale, not a particularly nice one in truth, but yeah, I was chuffed, you know, you know, two, two fish on the first night. Brilliant. And then the next night, I think I had nothing. Um, I don't think the guys had anything. Then the third night, I had a. This is from memory, mate. So please excuse me. I'm. I'm I think the first one I had was like a forty-seven, oh, um, and it was a really nice sort of deep-bodied one. Um, you know, really dark back, um, bit of a sort of wrinkled tail. So it sort of became apparent that they were all very different. All the fish in there, you know, there wasn't one sort of you know predominant strain. It seemed like they were all very very different in, in sort of shape and size and character. Um, and then I think the next day, so I, there was no action at all coming at night. Everything seemed to be sort of a couple of hours around dawn, you know, around first light. And, uh, next morning I had a real good one. I had a 59, 
Um, oh, nice. Yeah, which was was a really lovely one, like a real sort of um, mahogany, like a wood carving, really. Quite a long fish, and it had like a, a bit of a sort of slightly crinkled tail. Yeah, real old character. And I've got some really, really lovely pictures. Like Rich was very, very good with the camera. Mm. And I managed to get some really, really nice returners, you know, me in the water holding it. And um, yeah, and, and you could sort of sense that the whole swim was building. By this time, the guys had started catching. I think Cy had had a 53 um, I can't remember what Richard had, but, um, you, you know, you, it was evident we were on for, you know, quite a decent trip. And, uh, I think my next one, I had a 48, which was like a, another big sort of round one. And it looked like petals, you know, the one from Lynch Hill. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, you showed me that picture. Yeah. yeah. It's sort of really big sort of high shoulders on him and, and sort of nice little cluster of scales on his side. Um, and it, yeah, it was just brilliant. You know, it seemed like every bite, you never quite knew what was coming next. And we were actually sort of cooking hemp up on the bank. So we'd taken all these dried sacks of hemp and um, and we were sort of cooking the hemp up and putting it in hot, you know, so it's oily as hell, you know, it's still steaming when we were sort of ladling over the side of the boat. And you, you could just see that they were onto it. How know, much like, hemp were you putting on? Um, putting out, sorry. Probably putting a bucket, you know, I don't know what the litres the buckets are, Ten but probably are? putting, yeah, I reckon, yeah. But you'd imagine that, like, you've seen it so many times in this country where you put a load of hemp out, you get a load of fizzing, maybe a load of activity, but yeah. it's quite hard to get bites. And you were just presenting boilie over the top on, on yeah, just on a, a hair rig. Yeah. Well, to be honest, you, we, I was sort of feeding with a few boilies, but okay, I, a few it was it was nuts. Yeah, we were using using tigers and oh, stuff yeah. purely because of the cray problem. Crays, yeah, I mean, if you moved your boat at night, so you got your boat pulled up in the edge. If you actually just moved the boat to one side, underneath the boat was literally like. <sighs> Cray Central, like I've never seen anything like it. I mean, you know, and these were big, like mm, lobsters, not, not little tiny things. So yeah, there was no wonder that there were so many big carp in there. Um, yeah, and then I think a, a day or two later, I had another, uh, what uh, actually still my PB uh, to this day, which was um, yeah, sixty-seven and a half. Yeah, real big, sort of deep-bodied mirror. Um, it was mad because I actually I think I owned like an iPad at the time, and I'd taken my iPad with me. Um, I think I might have downloaded a couple of films on it to watch or something. And Simon, oh, I bet you had. <laughs> yeah. And, and Simon, Simon had actually filmed the whole fight using the iPad, you know, as, as the actual camera thing on there. And um, I can remember me sort of playing this fish and I was using sort of quite heavy braid. I think I had like 80 pound braid or 60 pound braid or something. It was quite sort of thick, you know, sort of wiry stuff. And I can remember like this bloody fish. It just would not give in. It was you could feel it was a big one mm. and it was just slow plodder, you know, and, and get the leader, you know, the knot would come up through the rings, then back down again, then up through the rings then back down again. And it, this just went on for probably seemed like an hour, but it's probably about sort of 20, 25 minutes, I reckon. And all the time I was just thinking, oh, I'm going to lose this. It's going to come off at some point. And I can remember it swam past us and there was a big line of bubbles come up. And I don't know if you've ever, ever experienced that, but normally when I see that, I associate that with a big one. I don't know why, but I always have done. And I can just remember this shape just suddenly rolling up on the surface and, and Rich sort of scooped it up in the net. And I was like, oh my God, that yeah. is, that's a fucking giant. That's a really big one. And um, yeah, so it turned out, yeah, 67 pounder. So, um, but what, what sort of became apparent really, not so much through my sort of research, but the other guys that how many big carp were in that lake at the time. Right. Um, you know, like I said, they're, they're like detectives, these lads, and, and they spent a lot of hours sort of piecing together what they, you know, a, a, a very good picture of what they, they've, you know, felt the stock of the lake was. Um, so you had Nautilus, which was a monster, 70s, upper 70s. There was another one, I think, called the Perfect Carp, mm. around about the same size. Mm, um, and in terms of like 50 to 60 pound carp, um, it was honestly ridiculous. And it's I, ten. I think, what you say, ten ish? It's not. It's not yeah, big, is yeah. it? I reckon ten to fifteen acres. Jeez. Yeah, not not a big lake by any standards. And what um, was quite interesting, I think, carp in the sort of southern French lakes, they tend to spawn very, very successfully each year. Right. Um. So if you catch one during the summertime, say you catch a fifty pounder, that fish could feasibly be sixty, sixty five pound in the winter. There's a massive fluctuation in 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 weight between sort of you know, summer weight and winter weight. So I genuinely believe, mate, during the colder months, that 
that lake would have had a stock to rival literally anywhere. You know, it was it was incredible how many big ones there were. On a wider theme, why do you think you get that? I know it could be strain. There's various factors, but why do you think that they are that big on average? You're not talking about one or two shooters. You might have them in this country on on certain lakes mm. that that shoot through, and they're they're sort of the A teamers. Why do you think you have such a big average sort of head size wise on those venues, mate? It's, I think it obviously climate <clears throat> is a massive factor. You know, just you've got such a long growing season. Um, Does it vary from north then to, to south in terms of size? Are those southern lakes, because it is warmer, have even bigger fish generally or not? No, probably not, in fact. No. Um, I mean, obviously they're just different lakes, aren't they? You know, m- most of those sort of southern French lakes tend to be, you know, they're like a rocky substrate. Right. Um, you know, Cassian, take that for an example. Obviously there's yeah. areas of mud, but there's a lot of areas where – it's just rock, you know, it's just, just like barren rock. So there can't be a huge amount of natural food, you know, harboured anywhere. Whereas no. if you look at some of those lakes up in the north, um, you know, look at those those Champagne reservoirs like Orient, you know, like Shanty, mm-hmm. Medine. It, obviously you've got a very fertile area for sort of crop growing around there. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it's incredible. They grow everything, you know, loads and loads of different produce. And those lakes, you know, Fundamentally, they're all sort of muddy, clay, that type of substrate. Um, and for whatever reason, everything seems to grow big. <laughs> yeah. Don't really know what, what it is, you know, whether it's just minerals in the water or something. But clearly they've got probably a longer growing season in the UK. Yeah. But, you know, they're not that far south from us, really. Um, not really, are they? No, yeah, when you look at it, you know, it's, it's, it's not a huge difference. But I guess the ambient temperature is probably a bit higher each year. Mm. Um and I think largely it's just down to naturals, you know. Yeah, it could be some so could be food stores, could be all sorts of yeah, different things, you know, couldn't it? I mean, you know, dolphin was just an absolute crayfish soup, you know. I mean, they, they, they must have just literally been smashing those crays, you know, when they they were really onto him. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously, yeah, they, they, those lakes up in the north, then, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you know, Shanty is just, it's absolutely alive with swan mussels, pea mussels, zebras, crayfish, is every type of natural you could you could ever want as a carp. So the nature of that fishing, <clears throat> first question, it's got busy in recent times. Mm. The impact of that on that fishing, have you noticed that the increased footfall, the increased amount of English anglers going over there, as well as other nations as well, I'm not just saying it's just us, mm. have you noticed that that's had a, an effect on the fishing generally on those waters? Um. I, I mean, I could only comment on the lakes that I fish. Yeah, of course. Personally, um, obviously, there's lots of places I've not been to or, you know, not planning to go to. So I think it's it must be having an effect, you know, just this, this extra number of people going over there. Um, you know, like we said earlier, carp definitely learn by association, don't they? Mm. You know, they'll very quickly know that if there's, you know, it's like rainbow, you know, an angler will fish a week, pull his bank sticks out, 10 minutes later, there's another guy, bank stick straight in the same hole. Oh, where are you fishing, mate? Oh, you know, around that corner, 15 yards, find a nice clear spot, a, a hard area, rig on it, literally fishing the same spot. Yeah. Um, you know, so I don't, I don't know, man. I'm, 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 I, I think that it, as a lot of these lakes are sort of getting more pressure, um, yeah, naturally, I'm sure the fish are going to get harder to catch. Um, but I, I've also noticed that, you know, call it climate, you know, change, whatever you want, but there's definitely a change in the sort of productive times of the year. Right. Um, you know, so going back to the early days going over there, historically September and October with the two, the two months, you know, you, you'd want to be out there in, in, in those sorts of that, that sort of period. Um, but now I think so many anglers are sort of going around about, you know, October used to be the month. Now everyone was going in October, so then I sort of think, okay, well I'll go in November instead. Mm. You know, but now everyone's going in November, so gradually, you know, the, the the way you've sort of got to go and fish over there to sort of try and get peace and quiet and not bump into too many people, um, I, I can feel that my sort of timing is is, is sort of changing all the time, really. So, um, you know, now I, I've actually gone back to going in September again, um, 
last sort of three or four years, I've gone early September to try and beat everyone else going. Yeah. Um, you yeah, know, just to sort of try and, you know, avoid the rush sort of thing. It's interesting, isn't it? For you, consideration, somebody who's not done it and has seen it, there's lots of people in this boat, I, I, yeah, I hear from it all the time, that maybe want to go out there, do that style of fishing. There's obviously the licensing and making sure that you're, you sort of adhere into all the rules. But yeah. other than that, for you, the sort of essential bits of advice, if you like, from a man who's done it for a very long time, what would you say as guidance points? Just go and enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, that's the main thing. Um, yeah. You know, it, it, you've got to go and enjoy yourself. There's no point just, I think a lot of people would probably go with ridiculously high expectations. Yes. Um, you know, and like I said earlier, you know, one trip in 10. If, if you go with that sort of mindset, then I don't think you'll go too far wrong. But, you know, I, I would never, ever go to France or sort of thinking I'm just going to go and pull trees up everywhere I go. You, you'd be very, very naive to... Yeah. to sort of go with that mindset really um yeah just literally go and enjoy it you know it's all there to be discovered you know and you may not be the first person to go to that lake but to you if you've never been there before it's all new and it's fresh and it's exciting and um you know that's kind of how it makes me feel is you know when i go somewhere and it's nice scenery and i'm not looking at other anglers and it's new to me i just get such a, a buzz from that you know it's it's like, uh, you know, Nick said it before, food for the soul. And it yeah. is genuinely, I do, I do feel that, you know, when some of these places you go are so beautiful and just quiet and, and the water's lovely and blue and you just think, you know, do you know what? I don't really care if I don't catch anything. It's, I it, genuinely couldn't care less, you know, it's just nice to be here. It's mad though when you think about it because there's beautiful places. You talked about a couple of beautiful places when you started fishing. I know full well you had a Milton Abbas ticket. It's a beautiful mm. bit of water, mate. It's yeah, absolutely amazing. stunning. Yeah. And and that ticket's gone. You've given it up. You don't fancy it. So there must be some additional element, if, whether it's the unknown, whether it's just the travel element that really is the sort of the draw, in it? Getting away from yeah. that race. I don't know. I, I think so, mate. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I was very kindly offered a ticket on, on Milton, like you, you mentioned. And, you know, I'm sure there are people listening to this that just think I'm mad. Oh, I, mean, I, I, I fished there twice, I think. Um, and I actually said to Wayne, look, I'm just going to let my ticket go. I said, because any sort of spare time I had, I just, I wanted to be overseas. Mm. It was such a draw for me. Um, and I just thought, look, there's no point just keeping a ticket and not using it because at the end of the day, you're just depriving somebody else of, of having a, a... Yeah, which is a nice way of looking at it. Exactly. So, you know, there's no, there's no point just being a, a ticket collector and just <laughs> having all these permits and not going, spending a load of money and, and just, you know, not getting any use from it at all. So, um, yeah, I, I just think that... Um, I, 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 I know where I want to be. I know where I want to go fishing. And to me nowadays, I mean... I think my whole sort of outlook on it has changed a lot from when I first started going, you know, when I first went, it was all just about, you know, obviously having a big adventure, but of course you want to go and catch a load um, mm. or a big one or, or you know, whatever, um, you know, your, your sort of goals are obviously relevant to the venue you're, you're choosing to go and fish. So, um, but nowadays, you know, I, I probably have three or four trips a year. Um, so <clears throat> I'll have a trip in the spring with my other half, um, Last few years we've gone to Shanty because, you know, like I said, you can book a night swim on there and it's nice, relaxed, it's chilled out. I can just go and fish and just enjoy it. Mm. Obviously, you know, I'm not there hoping to catch a 10 pounder. I want to go and catch a, a real big one, obviously. Um, and then we normally have a trip sort of September time. So like not last year, the year before we, we had a week in the Alps. Um, and then we had a week on the river lot fishing from a boat, which was, 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 nice. uh, yeah, it was, uh, that was an experience. Um, so, yeah, I'm always sort of looking at, you know, nice new places to go. But because, you know, Nikki, my other half, she loves it. You know, she loves France. She'd never been before till she met me, you know, and we just love the whole experience. You know, you go and have nice food, you go and have a nice bottle of wine. You know, I always, now I, I tend to choose my, my choice of venue based around her enjoyment as much as mine. I thought you were going to say based on the wine. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> On the boy. <laughs> I'm not really a wine drinker, to be honest. Yeah, she, she loves a bottle of wine. But um, yeah, I, I'm I'm very typical Brit. Cronenberg's in the fridge. I'm happy. Do you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, as long as I'm somewhere where it's nice surroundings and it's quiet, mm. that's me. I'm happy, you know. And I, I very much view it now as far more of a holiday than I did before. You know, before it was, I'm going fishing. But now I don't 
quite see it in the same light. You know, I'm a lot more chilled out about it. Maybe since I've met Nicky and, you know, your whole sort of perspective on life changes. I yeah, think, yeah, you right? go through, I think you do as an angler as well, don't you? You go 100%. through certain phases and, and stuff and you want different things at certain times. Mm. The, the, those adventures, you've referenced Nick Ellie, you've referenced various other people that are sort of associated with trade who've been out there, who've done it for a long time, incredible anglers. But invariably, when you're doing these type of trips, lots of shenanigans go on. There's lots of sort of, it's not just a straight line to the end goal. There's mm. loads of different mad stuff that happens. Mm. And you've done a lot of trips. Mm. Talk me through some of the more sort of crazy, um, sort of out-the-box moments that you probably wouldn't associate with a with a leisurely fishing trip to France, mate, or wherever. Oh, mate, <clears throat> where do I start? Um, yeah, so... I, I, I think probably one of the, the, the funniest ones I had actually inv- involved Nick and um, we'd gone to Belgium. So I've, I've done a fair bit of fishing in Belgium as well as France. Right. Uh, I've done your sort of foray into Holland as well. Um, and we'd gone to Belgium and I think we were, where were you we fishing? On the Mars, on the River Mars. Right. Um, so the bit we were fishing was up near, sort of near the French border, up near Dinant. Beautiful part of, of the world. It's very quiet. Um, the river's really, really picturesque. It's really scenic. It sort of runs through like a, a sort of quite a steep gorge. So you've got these beautiful, big sort of like granity rock, sort of rock faces. And it's, it's lovely, you know, really, you know, nice part of the world. And I think we'd been fishing a bit further downstream near, uh, down towards Liège around that sort of region. And it's very industrial around there. So you've got like the nuclear power plant, you've got all <laughs> these factories and, you know, belching, smoking stuff into into the air so good sort of area for fishing and we did catch some um no monsters um i think one night we, we had about half a dozen between between the two of us so it's you know you know sort of shaping up to be a reasonable trip and i think we just fancied to change the scenery so we drove further upstream much towards dinon and we found an area where we could basically get the car quite near the river and we thought you know nick being nick nick is He's Mr. ADHD. You know, he will never sit still for, you know, if he's fishes for a night, caught one, great, I'm off somewhere else. Mm. We're like, no, why not stay for another night? You might catch another one. No, don't care, bloke. In the car, gone. So he and I are quite different in, in that respect. You know, I'm far slower paced than, than he, <laughs> than, uh, you know, than Nick will ever be. But um, we just got on, you know, we, we you know, similar sense of humour. So, yeah, we, we just sort of rubbed along quite nicely, really. And, um, yeah, so this particular trip, we, we ended up up near Dean on, we'd found this area where we could get the car quite near the river. And we said, look, what we'll do is we'll fish for a night. See if we hear anything or catch anything. We might stay a second night. If not, we'll just go somewhere else. So we got the rods out and we had to sort of carry our kit probably about, I don't know, hundred yards from the car down to, to our swim. Fish for a night, typical Nick, you know, bottle of wine, barbecue, go to bed, you know, and, and nothing happened. Didn't hear or see anything no action on the rod. So the next morning decided to pack up and I'd carried some stuff back to the car. And for whatever reason, I don't know why, but I thought passports, where are the passports? And I can remember Nick had put both our passports in the glove box. Mm. And I had like this old Peugeot 406 estate. Um, a brilliant car, great for fishing. It was comfy, you know, really, really good on fuel and stuff. Loads of space for all your kit. And, um, I've opened a passenger door, opened a glove box, and I'm like, oh, no passports. Where are they then? So I've walked back down to the river. Nick's there sort of folding all his kit. And I said, oh, you got the passports there, mate? He went, no, 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 they're in the car. I said, well, no, they're not. He said, yeah, yeah, they're in the glove box. I said, well, mate, I've, I've literally just been. I've just looked. They're not in there. Oh, typical Nick. Nah, fucking hell, you fucking idiot. And they must be in there. And I'm like, mate, trust me, they're not. I've literally just been. They're not in there. Mm. So... You start panicking a little bit. Yeah, of course. And of course, then, you know, Nick's thinking, oh, have I put him somewhere else? Did I put him in a coat pocket? Have I put him in my, my tackle carry all or whatever? So we literally stripped everything, mate. And I mean everything. We were shaking bags out, mm. literally pulling the carpets up in the car, looking, no sign of them. And we're like, well, how can two passports literally just vanish, you know? So now we're sort of thinking, yeah, we got a serious problem. Now, how the hell are we going to get home? So I think Nick phoned his wife at the time and said to, to Rachel, look, can you get in touch with the British consulate in London and say, look, you know, my, my husband and his friend are in Belgium, they're fishing, 
the passports have been either stolen or lost. We don't really know what's happened. They've literally just vanished. Um, and from what I can remember, I'm fairly certain it was a Sunday. So, okay. of course, difficult to get hold of anybody. Yeah. Um, you know, so he was backwards and forwards on the, on, on the phone to, to his, his wife back home trying to sort this out. And then she eventually managed to get hold of somebody and said, look, they've suggested that you go to the local police office um, and report to them that the passports have been stolen. Yeah. You have to do that to then get like a, a reference number to go. Then you can go to like the British consulate in Brussels or wherever, hopefully get an emergency document to be able to, you know, to get you back home. So of course we've driven into Dean on, it's only a little town anyway, police office shut. So we're like, Oh, fantastic. So what do we do now? So we thought, look, we'll, we'll head somewhere a bit bigger and we're probably about an hour or two's drive from Brussels. Right. So we thought look, we're heading to Brussels, try and find a bigger, you know, police station. Hopefully it'll be open. So we've driven all the way into Brussels. And as we came off the motorway, we just happened to notice a sign you know, said polity like police. Oh yeah, perfect. So purely by chance we've managed to find a police station. So we pulled in this big car park, walked up and there was like a big iron door, you know, <laughs> knocked on that. And there was like a, an intercom system. Yes. Said, uh, Oh, hello. Um, we're English. We're here on holiday. Um, we're fishing and, uh, our passports have gone. Okay. So next thing, the buzzer Bless door you. opens yeah. and there's a sort of flight of concrete steps. So we've walked up there and there's like a, you know, a reception desk. And, um, of course we're trying to explain to this guy what had happened. So of course, first thing he said was, oh, uh, is the vehicle damaged? You know, is it, is it been it's a break in? And we, in yeah. we were like, well, no, no, the, the vehicle was locked, but the, they've just vanished. So of course, I think they instantly were a little bit suspicious, you know, couldn't quite work out what we were, what we were about. Um, so we actually got separated. So Nick got taken into one interview room. Ooh. I got taken into another one. Um, and mate, they were like taking fingerprints. They were running our details past Interpol. Um, Jeez. <laughs> Cause at, at, at the time, this was around about the time that if you remember, there were some terror attacks in Brussels. Yes. Yes. Um, yes you yeah. had the Paris attacks as well. So yeah. a lot of horrible things happening. So I think they were instantly suspicious that, you know, even if, in all innocence, we'd literally just lost our passports or whatever. Mm. A stolen passport's very valuable to somebody who's up to no good. Yeah. True. Um, so yeah, they, they obviously weren't taking it lightly, you know? So, you know, and they were like, Oh, have you ever been involved in drug smuggling? Have you ever been involveer in prostitution? You know, all this sort of racketeer <clears throat> and stuff. And I was like, look, you know, I, I'm mate, not, not being funny, but I'm a, I'm a, a fisherman. I'm here on holiday. But also and, <laughs> if you had been, are you going to go? You're yeah. not going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah of course you? I have mate. <laughs> so yeah. So, so this sort of, you know, went backwards and forwards and they were obviously contacting the police back in the UK, you know, looking for our records and oh, stuff. God. And um, anyway, so after about 45 minutes, I think I think Nick might have said, oh, would you mind if we just nip outside for a smoke or whatever? And so we've walked back down the stairs and they said, yeah, no problem. We'll just buzz the door to let you back in shortly. And we've gone out in the car park and stood by the car and I've opened the passenger door. And Nick said, mate, you don't reckon there's any chance that they could have just slipped down the back of the glove box? I said, no, it's just not possible, is it? And of course, we sort of looked, got a head torch looked in there and there was the tiniest of gaps, literally like, like this, you know, you couldn't have got a fag paper through there. I said, mate, surely not. And of course my glove box, I had like all my travel documents in there. Like your, you know, your, your logbook for your car, yeah. you know, all the, the sort of usual stuff you keep in there. And they'd obviously sat on top of that. And as we'd shut the glove box, they must have slid straight through this gap at the back. So purely by chance, Nick had like a sort of leather man tool with some, some grips on it. Um, managed to sort of prise the back of the glove box down. Ooh. Sure enough, you could see him in there. No. So we managed to just get like a pair of, you know, like long nose pliers through and grab them out one at a time. So of course, then we had the embarrassment of going back into the police station. Oh, that'd be horrendous. Wouldn't it? Saying, Oh, um, really sorry, but yeah, we, we found them. And of course they, they were not impressed. You know, we'd literally just wasted probably about, <laughs> about two hours of their very valuable, you know, valuable time what looking for these two been, what these stupid English lads been smoking. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah, mate. Yeah. Never a dull moment fishing with Nick literally, but, um, any yeah. sketchy situations, any trouble, any sort of hostility? Um, or not? You're yeah, quite the amenable I, chap. I can't imagine that. Yeah, not, not sort of personally. Never had like a, a major confrontation with anyone, from what I can recall. Um, I did have my van broken into in Belgium once. 
fishing on a lake near Ghent, um, which, you know, that sort of thing could happen to anyone at any time, couldn't it? It could happen on your driveway at home. So, um, yeah, I think me, me and my mate Dave Meek, um, we, we were fishing on the lake there, did a night, and um, I think Dave, I think he, he actually had like a really big grass cup, like 40 or pound grassy or something. And I remember we were sort of heading home that morning, of course, walked back to the car and sure enough, the bloody, you know, side window had been put through, but nothing taken, you know, and, and right. I actually had, stupid did actually left my passport in the, in the van. I thought, well, that could have gone, but luckily it didn't. Um, my sat nav and stuff never took that. And I think actually my camera, I think it I'd actually tucked behind the front seat. Um, never took that. So it was literally Lucky. almost like somebody just put the window through for, for no reason. Um, so yeah, that was, that was one incident. And obviously something we, we, we sort of discussed, you know, off the camera, but, um, yeah, the incident when I lost my trailer with, with two boats, that's, that's, oh. That's probably the, the the most major thing that's happened, I would say. Would yeah, that's there. pretty bad, mate, isn't it? Yeah, which um, yeah, some a mad mad story, really. Um, so yeah, sort of starting from the beginning, the whole trip got off to a really really bad start. Mm. Um, it was a solo trip. I think I'd already done a trip in the October of that year. Um, I, I genuinely can't remember where I went or what I caught, but um, I had another couple of weeks off in sort of very late October, early November. And my plan was to drive down to fish on the Rhone, on, on the river. So by this time, I'd bought my T5, my van, which is still my, my sort of current fishing van. And I had my trailer and I decided to take two boats. Um, so I had like a 2.8 meter inflatable and a little 2.3 meter one, just sat on top of the other. I had a petrol engine, like an eight horsepower Mercury. So I was fully kitted, you know, to go and fish on the river. Yeah. And purely by chance, um, a couple of mates of mine, uh, Matty Bennett and another chap called Tom, they were sort of fishing together down there at the same time. So unbeknown to me, they, they basically had sort of booked, you know, the same sort of two weeks that I had. So it's sort of, you know, in contact with them, I said, look, I'll come and meet you on the river. Um, I don't want to impede on your fishing. So in the end, what I decided to do was go and fish on a nearby lake. Um, they weren't really catching a great deal. Um, and the lake itself was days only. So my plan was to sort of go and fish the days on there, pre-bait in the evening, go back the next day, a bit like John Timmerman style. Yeah. Um, and the lake's got some really, really nice fishing. I've only, I've not been back to it. I will go back one day. And I did a sort of couple of days, didn't catch anything. Um, sorry, I've, I've actually skipped something prior to that. So on the drive down, down to, uh, to meet the guys, um, I just got off the ferry and I noticed that my trailer, I looked at one of the trailer wheels and it was all completely covered in grease like the whole the wheel. face of the wheel and the right. tire. And I was like, what the hell's going on there? And of course, you know, towing a trailer, you're a little bit paranoid anyway. You know, every noise you hear, you think, oh shit, something's going to yeah, go, go wrong or yeah. something's going to happen. And I think I'd lost like a uh, a sort of cover off the bearing. And right. All the grease had sort of come out. And as the wheel rotated, Still, it literally just covered yeah. it in grease. So I, I, I found a friend of mine who's you know very well up on that sort of thing. And he said, look, he said, try and cover it with something. If you've got some tape, just tape over it and hopefully that'll be all right until we get home. And I actually found I had like a can of deodorant with me, like sort of dove deodorant and the little cap off the deodorant just fit perfectly oh, touch. over the hub. And I had some of that silver, like gaffer tape stuff and I literally covered it with tape. Mate, perfect. Literally didn't lose another bit of grease the whole journey. So yeah, I was, I was very lucky in, in that respect. And I'd got off the ferry. i would probably driven about an hour or so stopped it and, um, one of these airs, you know, like a, not, not one with the service station, just like a little pulling point with a toilet. And by this time it was probably, I don't know, one in the morning, two in the morning. Okay. Pitch black. There was literally no lighting at all. And as I've got out the van, Flynn, my dog has gone running off, obviously, you know, doing his toilet and stuff, chasing rabbits, doing the usual sort of thing he does. And I've gone walking towards him and I didn't see like a raised curb. So, and you know, in those service stations, they have like these big high curves yeah, because of all the, you know, the trucks going through there. Yeah. And mate, I went flying, literally full tilt forward, smacked my head on the concrete and I sort of quite badly grazed both my knees. And I, mate, I, was, I was in a lot of pain. I was like, oh, Jesus Christ. And, you know, so that, that kind of sort of got the trip off to a bad start. And I've got myself up and I'm there calling the dog. And at this point, I saw some headlights coming in, coming down the sort of slip road into the services. And I thought, oh. Someone just stopping for a wee or something. Yeah, yeah, of course. And it was like a black Audi saloon, all like blacked out windows. And it drove past me and stopped literally 
10 yards in front of my van and my trailer started to back up. And I'm like, oh, don't like the look of this. Oh uh, yeah. And wound this window down and there's uh, three guys in there. Um, I'm going to say sort of Middle Eastern appearance. Right. And they were like, uh, where is Calais? And I said, uh, Calais, you've just, you must've just come from Calais. Where is, where is Calais? I said, well, it's back up the most. So you need to go around on the other side and, and back and up that side, way. Yeah. Uh, and he just sort of looked me up and down and I was thinking, mm. I don't like to look at this. Yeah. And of course you hear all these stories about people being mugged in these services and you know, their vehicle being stolen and stuff. So I'm like, Flynn, Flynn, like shouting the dog, trying to get him to come back to me. Typical Flynn is just like off doing his own thing. And the guy's just sort of there. There were three of them in the car and I'm thinking. Well, they're still sat there, window down. Literally, window down, just looking at me. And I'm like, don't like this at all. So I literally started to walk back to the van, unlocked it, jumped in. Luckily, I see the dog coming across, you know, running towards me and uh, got him in the van as well and literally just jumped in, locked the door, started it. They obviously realised that, you know, that, uh, you know, I'd locked myself in and they just, you know, drove off at this point. So, yeah, I've, that that really shook me up. You know, I've never really felt, I've done loads of like, solo trips to France and I've never, ever really felt uneasy, but that that did shit me up, I'm not going to lie. And um, so anyway, fast forward, got down to the river, met up with, with, with Matty and Tom and did a couple of days fishing on this lake, didn't catch anything, didn't see anything. I actually got caught out in my boat. Um, by a guard he said you're not actually allowed to use a boat on here and sort of gave me a warning so it that kind of sort of set the tone for the whole week really and i was just thinking yeah do you know what it's, it's just going to be one of those trips yeah. Nothing, nothing's going right so we decided the guys hadn't caught anything on the river apart from catfish so we said look we'll, we'll drive a bit further south um and i knew of a lake near to the river that i'd not fished before i had no knowledge of it um other than i knew there were a few carp in there so i said look let's go and check that one out if that's no good, we'll try a different spot on the river and, you know, see how we go. Got to the lake, didn't really fancy the look of that. Um, so we ended up fishing like a confluence of, of um, you had sort of one river joining the Rhone. Mm. Um, looked like a really good spot, you know, spot on the map, you know, when we, we sort of looked at it on Google and stuff. So we managed to get the vans behind us, which was nice. Um, you know, got the boat in and stuff, got ourselves fishing for this, you know, f- for the next night. And, I think we just cooked up some food. It had gone dark and all of a sudden I could hear like a, a sort of petrol, like an outboard, like a deep outboard tone. And I was thinking, oh, yeah, where's that, where's that coming from? And you had like a big, out to our left, way out to our left, there was like the main boat channel where all the mm. big barges went through. Okay. I thought, well, that's not coming from there. No. Next thing, it was like a, I can only describe it like a sort of pilot launch type boat. Suddenly appeared from the right, literally at rod tip distance out from the bank. And I'm like, oh, mate, this is, this is going to be an absolute clusterfuck, basically. So next thing, all three of my rods wiped, them. wiped yeah. out. Yeah. And literally all three clutches are just ripping, braid peeling off the reels. Then I could hear Matty's rods going. Oh. Then I could hear Tom's rods going. I was just like, oh, my God, like what an absolute fucking mess this is going to be. So, yeah, in the end, I think we literally just had to cut the braid at the rod tips. Oh. And, and, and luckily you had sort of spare braid and managed to be spooled and stuff. So I think we just said, look, not going to stay here. I'm done. Do you know what I mean? Need to go somewhere else. So we drove from there about four hours over towards the Alps and uh, went to a, a, a days only lake there, fished a couple of days on that one, didn't catch anything. So there's a bit of a common theme here. Yeah. Um, and we were sort of getting right towards the end of the trip. And we said, look, you know, we need to make a, a, a final call basically and, and try and, you know, land on somewhere where hopefully we'll catch one before we get home. And we drove back over towards the Rhone and, there's a lake that we're very familiar with. We'd all fished it a couple of times, caught quite a few fish from there. So I thought, look, that's a safe bet. You know, we, we, we know we can night fish. Let's just, just go for it. And drove over to this particular lake, got ourselves set up. And sorry, I've skipped something else. Um, so as we're basically sorting our, our swims, I've decided to fish an area where I had to drive the van down this little narrow track. Mm. And they it's like, more like a bridal way, really. So they'd actually... the you know, the fishing club or whoever, they'd actually put these big boulders on either, either side of the track to stop big wide vehicles going through. All right. And I could, I looked at it and I thought, yeah, I can definitely get the van through there. Started backing through. Um, stupidly, I'd left my side door open. Ooh. I'm only literally reversing speed, so I'm not going very fast at all. Dink. Didn't take into account the extra width of that. And of course, wallop hit this bloody great boulder, 
put a huge dent and a scrape down the side door of the van. And I'd not had it very long, you know, so my, my pride and joy, my fishing van sort of yeah. thing. And I was just like, hey, mate, what else can possibly go wrong this week? Um, got into the swim and uh, I thought, look, just, just crack on, get the rods out, get fishing. And I, down to my right, I had a really, really good area to fish. I had like a big fallen tree sort of running out from the, you know, my, my sort of near side margin. And uh, went and had a look. I thought, yeah, that's a prime spot for a couple of rods fishing down to that. And all my rods fishing, um, first night, it was really late. By the time I cooked some food, literally just crashed out and went to sleep. And I think I only had one night left. And on the second night, I got everything perfect. And I thought, right, you know, it's shit or bust, basically. Hopefully yeah. we'll, we'll get one tonight. And I think Matt and Tom had both caught a couple by this point. So I was the only one who, who hadn't had anything. And I remember it was the 5th of November. And I, I actually remember, I think I put a post on Instagram saying, you know, last chance saloon, last carp of the year, hopefully if I catch one tonight sort of thing. And just into dark, I, I remember I picked up my phone and I've got like a lightning radar app on my phone. And for whatever reason, I thought, oh, I'll just click on that, opened it. And I've looked, I'm like, oh my God. And there was this huge, no. like cluster of lightning <laughs> strikes on the map, sort of literally about 50 miles from, from where we were. And I'm thinking, oh no, surely not. And, yeah, sure enough, within the hour, it made all hell let loose. It was what a trip, just, this is. mate! Just ridiculous storm, like literally just f- constant flashes. Um, and I was actually sleeping in my van. I'd not even bother putting a bivy up because I had the van literally yeah. right there, Rod's boat. Um, so it was all nice and convenient. Um, and I can remember like that the rain was that loud, like you, you couldn't hear yourself think it was so loud on, on the roof of the van and all these lightning bolts going on. And I, I remember thinking. Don't get a bite now. Sure enough, beep, 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 beep. And I'm fishing locked up to this tree. Oh, no. I'm like, oh, no. So I've literally waterproof jacket on, and it was quite a steep down, a steep bank down to the water. So I sort of managed to get myself down, picked the rod up, started playing this fish. It must have felt sorry for me, I think, and it literally just kited out on a tight line away from the snag. Um, so, yeah, that that was, you know, sort of first lucky part. And um, it just wouldn't come in. It was one of them that just rucked and rucked and rucked. Eventually... I see it come up and well, yeah, it looks quite a decent one. Got it in the net and I was like, mate, what a touch. It was a big one. Like it turned out to be, I think 53, 53 and a half Whoa. common. And it was like an, I'm, I'm sure they were like an old river run carp. You know, it was like, you could see it had the frame. It had like a big sort of underslung mouth, you know, big lips, absolute giant. So I was absolutely chuffed to bits. You know, I, I couldn't believe my luck really. Um, got the fish into a sack and, I actually had a, a French friend of mine who lived barely 10 minutes drive from there. Okay. Obviously like a CC Moore contact. And I, I messaged him and I said, like, mate, I've had a right touch. I've caught a nice one. Any chance you can nip down in the morning, do some pictures for me. Plus it'd be nice to see you. You know what? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of just down the road from you. Yeah, no problem. So about sort of six, seven o'clock next morning, um, my mates turned up. And he said, look, yeah, I've got my camera. I'll do some shots for you. So I've got the fish out of the sack. And I mean, they're sort of trying to do some shots in the water. And I actually only managed to get two or three pictures. And it was so powerful, mate, this carp. It literally just kick, kick, kick like that. And it was it was gone. It went back. So, yeah, sadly, I didn't get any really good shots of it, which is a shame. But um, anyway, by the by. And so I pretty much packed everything by this point, And I left my van and trailer down I've driven it out of the swim and sort of down oh, the, okay. end, the end of the track there. So anyway, I've got my net, unhooking mat, you know, and wet weather gear on and stuff. So I've walked back down this track to where my van was. And I'm like, oh no, where's my trailer? I'm like, trailer's gone. And, and my, my, my French friend was like, oh, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? I said, my trailer, you know, trailer with my two boats. And instantly I saw his face change. And he was like, oh my God. Oh my God. And it turned out that as he'd driven sort of oh. down a little lane, down this little track to the lake, he'd actually seen a car going the other way with a trailer with two green boats and an engine. And of course I had like, you know, um, all my electronic stuff, you know, like a handheld GPS, my Jesus. fish finder, uh, a Minn Kota engine, everything just sort of laying in, in, in the top boat there. Um, yeah, so somebody purely by chance had just driven down there that morning, seen op- completely opportunist, seen the trailer there, and uh, and just sort of 
call it fate. They must have obviously had a tow hitch on their car and just hooked it on. Oh, <laughs> drove, that is a drove off with my kit. Trip, mate. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I obviously said to my friend, I said, "Look, you're going to have to help me out. You know, I can speak French, but I'm obviously not not as fluent as you." Um, so he phoned the police. Mm. Not in the slightest bit interested. They were just like, "Oh, okay, yeah, we'll 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 notify all of our patrols in the area." Um, you know, and, and obviously get them to keep a lookout for it. But by that time, it was too late. They they were gone and. And that was that. So, oh. yeah, I wasn't, wasn't covered on the insurance. Um, you weren't covered on the insurance? No, no. I, to be honest, mate, I didn't even bother trying to claim. I just thought, you know what? It's gone. Um, you know what the insurance companies are like. They're, first yeah, thing they'll say, long, you know, show us the damage to your van. Yeah, there wasn't, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, so, yeah, complete schoolboy error on my part. But, yeah, it's a, a bit of a tough one to swallow. And, and the hardest bit really was going from absolute elation you know, catching that fish on the last night, Back trip down. saver. And then I remember actually phoning, phoning Nikki from the van and I said, oh, I'm driving home. I said, you're not going to believe it. Told her the story. And of course she's in tears on the phone and she's like, oh, I just want to give you a hug. And I'm like, no, oh, I could do with one. <laughs> all <laughs> yeah, literally just, yeah, all emotional on the phone. Oh, just, it yeah, made us a trip of highs and lows. A good job you caught that one. Imagine if you caught absolutely jack all and that could, had happened. Could have, could have happened, couldn't it? Yeah. You'd so, be fishing, um, you'd be down at Linear every day of the week, mate. <laughs> I'm not leaving. I don't, I don't think that would ever happen, mate. Oh, but, you so. don't, never say never. Never say never. Mate, yeah. but you, it's incredible. To be fair, like when we were talking on the phone, the amount you've done of that type of angling to have one or two bad events is, is going to happen regardless of what you do, mate. But mm. the amount of incredibly like inspiring, incredible chapters and captures is, is always testament to why you still do it, I suppose. And to be fair, it ain't just, it doesn't just stop at cart fishing, does it? Like you've done a few crazy trips abroad to scratch that travel itch to like yeah. Canada sturgeon <clears throat> fishing, Florida with Danny Fairbrass. Florida with, with Danny Fairbrass. Yeah. So that, um, that sort of basically came about through a mutual friend. So Danny Turtle, who used to oh, be... Gigantic Bailiff, yeah. Gigantic Bailiff, yeah. So <clears throat> I met Dan Turtle uh, through Nick, actually. Um, you know, at the time, me and Nick were probably doing two to three trips a year over to France, I think, okay. or Belgium or you know wherever. And quite often, if we were fishing further south into France, um, Turtle would often sort of phone Nick or latterly me and say, look, if you're passing, just pop in. I'll cook you a roast dinner, yeah. stay at the lake for a night, just break your journey up. And it kind of became a regular feature. So pretty much every trip, we would always stop in, have some food, a few beers, you know, make a fire, sit there and just take the piss. And, and obviously, you know, really nice to see him and then, you know, drive off the next day. And Turtle had mentioned to me that obviously the Corder lads, I think quite regularly used to go out to Florida and fish for the tarpon and the sharks. Nice. Um, and at the time I was quite into my sea fishing. I used to do quite a few charter trips, you know, down at Weymouth and Limington, you know, for the congas and, and cod and all that sort of thing, taupe. So I thought, oh, do you know what? Yeah, I wouldn't mind some of that. And sorry, mate. Funny noise. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, uh, they total mentioned that they had a trip planned for, I think the May of the, the following year. Did I fancy it? And I thought, do you know what? Yeah, let's just go for it. Never done anything like that. Um, so I think there were six of us that went. There was me, Danny T, Mr. Fairbrass, uh, Clive Gibbons. Yeah. Absolute legend. Generally one of the funniest people I've ever met. Uh, Andy Reynolds, who I think used to own Fatfish Tackle yeah, 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 in yeah. Kent. I think he and Dan are like really, really good friends. Um, and another guy, I think called Matt, who was from up north, I generally can't remember. He was one of Clive's friends, I think. So there were six of us that went, <clears throat> and uh, the plan was to stay in John Rawls' house. Uh, so John Rawl was the guy that I think formed Cox and Rawl, real oh, famous yeah, yeah, like yeah. sea fishing yeah, brand. Sea fishing brand, yeah. Yeah. So uh, John had obviously retired over to, to say retired. He was still working as a as a, a sort of fishing guide, uh, but sort of relocated out to Florida and had his base over there. And I think the Calder lads had stayed with him a couple of times before, and said like he is by by far the best guide, you know, obviously mm. it helps with him being English. You know, he's very straight down the line. He's not going to try and fleece you for your money. He'll give you a, a good, honest day's fishing. Um, so yeah, so that, that was that. So we, we, we booked this trip. Um, I think flew from Heathrow landing in Miami and instant. I can remember the moment I set foot out the airport 
I, just the heat hit you. Mm. But obviously you haven't fished in France. You can't used to fishing in the heat, but it's just different. You've got that humidity as well. And I was just like, oh God, like this is, it's just different. You know what I mean? Never been to America before. So it was a whole new experience really. And Turtle being Turtle, it said, I'm going to sort the hard cars out. You haven't got to worry about that. So we pulled into like Hertz Rental and I'm thinking, oh, it's going to be like a genuine little family runabout. Oh, no, no, no. 5.8 litre Mustang convertibles. Yes. And I'm like, mate, you're, you're not serious. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Be, we're not messing, mate. It's a, this is going to be a proper holiday. Oh, that's epic. So, yeah. So we, we, we've got these Mustangs and there we are sort of cruising down the, the sort of freeway down to Isla Mirada. Um, and I was just like, mate, this is like we're in Miami Vice or something. It, yeah. was, it was the bollocks. Yeah. And uh, we got to John's place and, and basically it was a very big... Um, I don't know how you could describe it. A big sort of townhouse, basically, that had like two levels. And I think John and his wife used to live upstairs and the angling guests used to have the whole downstairs run okay. of the house. Um, so there were like two or three bedrooms, obviously your own kitchen, so you can go and cook food and make a tea and whatever you wanted to do. And then you had direct access out through his back garden out onto, obviously you've got the whole sort of tidal canal system there. Yeah, of course you have. Yeah, so yeah, John, yeah. John used to keep his boat literally moored. He had his own moor in there, wow. right on the end of his his own jetty in his garden. So say we had like an evening trip booked, the whole day you could just sit there in John's garden with a little lure rod. You're catching all sorts, little snappers and barracuda and stuff. Um, literally everywhere you went, you had a fishing opportunity, which, you know, Turtle said to me, he said, mate, You'll you'll never fish as much in a week as this this week that God we're gonna have. Mate, sounds like heaven. It was it was just brilliant. Um, so the plan was that we were gonna do um a few tarpon trips, sort of based around the evening tide or the morning tide. Mm. Um, and we had a couple of trips planned for like inshore shark fishing. Yes, and we also had a day set aside during the week for we had a choice of either Goliath grouper fishing or going out for like big sharks. You know, out on the Atlantic side going about 20 miles out and fishing for like, you know, the really big sort of pelagic species. So the first couple of trips we did like for the inshore sharks, which was just amazing. I can't tell you how, how much fun. So we were sort of fishing from three, three anglers per boat. So John would actually employ an American guide who he knew very well. Okay. So he'd have three anglers on one boat, three on the other boat. Um, and the boats were like a, a 23 foot long skiff. So he had like a center console, nice flat deck, with the railing round, so it's all nice and safe. Um, and he took us out to fish on these sort of um, how can I describe them? Almost like coral flats, if yeah, you like. flats. I've seen, yeah, yeah so yeah. it's really shallow, loads of like sort of sea grass and stuff. Um, but in amongst the real shallow areas, you had like these sort of tidal channels, uh, you could see the current sort of ripping through there. And John would either sort of you know, depending on whether the tide's running in or out, position the boat and then basically start just sort of chumming minced up fish. and on the way out, you used to stop and fish for, um, they were like a species of mullet, I think, called kingfish mm. that were probably, I don't know, say this big, you know, like a foot long or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was your bait for the day. And it was so basic, the fishing, it was literally just, you're only fishing in probably like three or four foot of water anyway. So you had no weight on the line. It was literally like an uptide rod, um, obviously heavy braid on the reel, and then like really, really thick mono down to a big circle hook and just a big chunk of fish just hook it on and just free line it out of the back of the boat. Simple as that. And literally minutes after sort of putting this chum into the water, you could see oh, dorsal up. fin coming, then another one, then another one. <clears throat> and I kid you not, mate, literally within 10, 15 minutes, you were like completely surrounded by sharks. I've never seen anything like it. They were everywhere. Um, you know, obviously in feeding mode as well, you could see them like really active and sort of buzzing around. And then you you could actually see your boat on the bottom. All of a sudden, you'd see a shark sort of go over it, and then next thing, you'd just watch your braid Ugh. snake across the surface, and the rod would hoop over, and yeah, that was you. That was it. You you were into one and playing one, um, and it was just the most mental fishing. Like I think the first the first trip we had, I think we had like twenty odd fish in a couple of hours. Wow! Um, and they weren't monsters. We were catching um, like lemon sharks. I think we had some black tip sharks. Um, and they had this mad species called spinner sharks. I'd never experienced them before. And they they look a bit like a black tip. Okay. They weren't very big, probably, I don't know, say up to 150 pound. But when you hooked one, they would literally leap out the water and spin, hence the name. Um, 
yeah, just the maddest thing. So you would sort of be playing this shark, and all of a sudden you'd see it sort of come like pirouetting out there, out of the water and back in. Um, but yeah, just brilliant, brilliant fun. And I think I had a lemon shark about two hundred and fifty pounds. Jeez, that's a big one. Yeah, decent size one. Um, you don't want to fall in, would you? <laughs> definitely not. But um, one of the guys I think lost a really big bull shark. Um, I say really big, but you know, sort of five six hundred pound. I think. Oh yeah. Um, big enough, do you know what I mean? So, yeah, so then we had a couple of days doing that and we, I say during the mid part of the week, we had um, a deep sea day. So me, Turtle and, and Fairbrass went out on like a proper boat, you know, with a big fly bridge and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it, it was really rough. It was quite a rough day, you know, a lot of swell. So I didn't feel particularly great. And the plan was basically to just fish with one rod Um and you had two deckhands on the boat, obviously, and the, and the captain. And the two deckhands, they kind of fished for you, really. So they were sort of catching live baits and they were putting these big sort of like tuna type fish on as live baits, dropping them down. And apparently there was like a big, almost like an underwater mountain. Mm-hmm. And you could actually see on the surface, you could see like the current was really sort of swirling Boy, yeah. and boiling around. And he said, like, this is a really good area for big, big predatory species. You get a lot of bait fish here. Um, and I can remember, I think Dan Turtle had the first bite. He had a 350-odd pound hammerhead shark. Oh, um, my God. Then I think, obviously, it was Dan's turn next. I think he had, I don't know what it was. It wasn't a shark. He might have had, like, a big group or something like that. And, of course, then it's my turn. And you just sort of sat there waiting and waiting and waiting. And one of the deckhands has gone, yep, yeah, fish on. So, of course, they sort of strap you into this harness. You're not in a chair. You stand up and fire. No, you stand up and play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so you're only using like a sort of short, you know, stand-up setup. And I, he sort of handed me the rod, and this thing is just ripping line off the reel. Just like, and I'm sort of looking at him, and I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? And he said, just just let it go. Yeah. Let it run. He said, you can't stop it. And this thing's going and going and going and going. And of course, I'm looking at the reel, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to run out of bloody line in a minute. And um, he said, right try and slow it down. So you sort of, you know, engage the lever drag, put it into gear, start playing the fish. And I'm not embarrassed to say, man, I, I'm just not physically strong enough for that sort of fishing. You know, I don't go to the gym. I don't train. Um, you know, turtles an absolute beast. He's a, he's a monster in he? you know, and Dan obviously looks after himself, goes to the gym and stuff. So they're a lot bigger and stronger than me. And I started playing this fish. I just couldn't deal with it. Literally within about 30 seconds, my arms, they felt like they were full of lead, like completely blown up and sort of locked and I'm there like, Oh God, I just can't deal with this and and call it lucky if you like, but it actually bit through the trace and it was off. So then that to sort of reel all this braid back on. Uh, I've never felt adrenaline like it. I sort of mm. said to the, to the skipper of the boat, I said like, what do you think that was? And he went, Oh, a thousand pound tiger shark, 1200 pound. Oh, and I was like, I mean, no yeah. way. Like, yeah, you're I, just I, reeling the bait back in, boys, what you were doing. <laughs> Honestly, mate, I just, just couldn't comprehend like catching something like that. Um, you, did you catch your tarpon? I did, yeah. I, oh, I caught one, sick. yeah. We, we had um, we had a few sort of evening tarpon trips. Um, probably the most enjoyable fishing, I would say. Because oh, yeah. it, uh, how we were catching or trying to catch them, we were using like these, um, they were like a blue swimmer crab, I think yeah. they're called. So John's boat had a live, live bait well full of these crabs and he sort of took us out and he said, obviously rather than anchoring, we're going to drift. So you had three people again per boat and it was very, very simple fishing. You had like a, a bit like an uptide rod again. Um, and you had like a big sort of orange poly ball float on the line. And then just like a long sort of either fl- heavy fluorocarbon or mono hook link and a, a circle hook. And he get a crab out the live bait. Well, and he had like a long needle and he just sort of pierced the corner of the shell just enough so you could actually sort of just nick it past the barb on the hook. So this poor little crab sort of hanging there like this, cast it out. And basically how you fished, you would sort of cast off the back of the boat, leave it a minute or two. Then the next angler would cast, mm. then the third angler would cast. So you had three baits sort of being fished staggered. So as you drift in, at least then you're not going to get hopefully, you know, tangled if somebody hooked up. And John had said like, just, really the best way of fishing. He said, if you just hold the rod, he said, obviously you can look at the float. He said, but I've always found the best thing to do is just pinch the line, the, you know, the braid between your thumb, forefinger. And he said, you'll feel when there's a tarp on there. So as the boat's drifting, they sort of drift over these, um, sandy depressions in the seabed. And I think yeah. the tarp on lay in these sort of 
little depressions and they're looking for the silhouette of a crab or something swimming above them and literally just ambush. They're up and, and make a grab for it. So on their sort of, it's getting towards dark. So naturally your senses, your senses are a bit heightened anyway, you yeah. know, because you're losing the daylight. And I'm there sort of gripping the rod and holding the line. And John had said, you'll know when the bite's coming because you'll feel the crab will start panicking. Yeah. And I was like, really? You're not going to feel it like 30, 40 yards out. But yeah, trust me, mate. I'm there sort of holding the rod. All of a sudden you feel a few plucks on the line and then it's just like everything goes tight. Ooh. And I can remember the first time it happened, I just happened to look up and I saw this <sighs> silver rocket literally come flying out the sea whoa, splash and back in. And of course my instinct strike. Yeah. And of course that's the very thing you don't want to do. Yeah. You know, John has said, just don't strike under any circumstances. Literally let everything go tight, then start to wind forward because you're using a circle. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, I can't even tell you how many chances I missed. I, I must have But you do up. lose them anyway, don't you? They're not the easiest to land, are they? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously you, you learn as you go sort of thing and, um, it became very apparent. Obviously, they, they've got these big sort of bony plates in their mouth, haven't they, for crushing food? Yeah. And, of course, you're trying to get a hook to stick. You're nev- never going to happen, not in a million years. So you're literally just, like, trying to get the hook just to catch just on the edge of that that big sort of rubbery lip. Um, Yeah, I must have had, I don't know, six chances, ballsed everyone up. And by this point, I was thinking, oh, it's, it's never going to happen. I think Turtle on the other boat had had... He had one about 180 pounds. Of course, he had wow. done it before. He, he he knew he knew what he was doing. Um, Dan Fairbrass, I'm not sure if Dan had caught one before, but he was absolutely desperate to catch one this trip. Mm. Um, eventually managed to hook one, and it looked like it was well hooked. You know, and I, somewhere I've still got an SD card, and I've got about 10 to 15 minutes of footage of, of me sort of filming Dan playing this fish. Um, it's quite a funny story, but. So he's there playing it and you could feel like the confidence was building, you know, the longer it was on, the yeah, longer yeah. you felt it was, he was going to get it to the boat. And, um, yeah, cut a very long story short after about sort of 10, 12 minutes, it come off and instantly Andy Reynolds has looked at me and just gone like, cut the camera, cut the camera. And I'm like, Oh, okay. So I'll sort of put the camera down and yeah, it was a proper, proper tantrum. I felt so sorry for him to be yeah, fair. It's a killer, like, then, you know, that. the rod got launched down the boat and it was like, Oh fuck. So, you know, but it, it's just so frustrating, you know, after all that time, you just think, yeah, it would have been nice to, to, to have actually, you know, got it to the boat. So it counted, but, um, but yeah, but I, I did get one the very last night. I did get one, Go on, which um, I think was about, obviously you don't weigh them. It's just an estimate. And I think yeah. they said probably about 140 pound, I think. So. Mate, that is the dream for me, mate. That is absolutely epic. Mate, you've had so, I mean, forget that last chapter, which was absolutely incredible. The carp <laughs> fishing journey is ridiculous, mate. And, well, they're they're not done, mate. You've got more trips to to go in the future. Mm. We spoke before we even came on the pod about what you're doing next year. So, mate, I can't thank you enough for coming in, sharing not only UK chapters but also the stuff you've done abroad. And this is just a, a mere sort of gloss over the amount that you've <laughs> done, mate. And I look forward to seeing more of it in the future. No worries, mate. Yeah. yeah before I, been... before I let you go, you're gonna oh, have to no. you're gonna have to answer some quick fire questions <laughs> for me, mate. Mate. These are pretty Dread, good. Dreading I mean, this. <laughs> I think I've been very nice to you here. Right, go on. <clears throat> I think... Let me, let me get a drink of water. Yeah, I think... So dry. <laughs> apart from the first one, I think I've been pretty nice here. You ready? I'm ready. Better drink of water. Go for it. <clears throat> for the rest of your living fishing days, you can only fish UK waters or Pay Lakes abroad. What do you choose? Pay Lakes abroad. Oh, you've sacked off the UK completely, haven't you? Yeah. No plays. Three celebrities you'd take fishing, past or present. Why? Fishing celebrities could, or... No, it could be any celebrities. I've opened that up. Jürgen Klopp, look, massive Liverpool fan. He's, he's, he seems like he's got a bit of personality, I'll give you that. Absolutely. He's a bit intense though, isn't he? Man, he, mate, he's the boss. He, he is, is the boss. Is he though? Go on, till next fist month. Pumps till you've that. had a few bad yeah. results and then 30, he's gone. 30 pounder in the net, fist pumps. Um, yeah, so Jürgen Klopp... Um, Donald Trump. Donald Trump? Right. Who wouldn't want to go fishing with Donald Trump? I think it, the guy's an absolute weapon, but just so amusing. Mate, imagine your hair, his hair, and my hair in their prime on the boat Dude, mate, in wouldn't Florida. It be, wouldn't it be incredible? Ooh. Just blowing in the wind. Yeah, it'd be amazing, wouldn't it? So Donald Trump, okay. uh, third one. Third one. Who would I take fishing? Um, oh, mate, really tough one. Yeah, I can't think of anybody. 
Um, You've got to mix that up, mate. Trump, yeah. Klopp. I think somebody for music. And maybe one of the Gallaghers. You know, oh. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a sort of 90s music fan. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's got to be Liam, isn't it? It's got to be Liam. Has it got to be Liam? You're not an old fan. Uh, to be fair, the last Noel Gallagher album, recent one, love it. I've mm. absolutely played it to death. Yeah, but um, Liam. I, I've seen Oasis a few times and yeah, love them. So it's got to be Liam. Nice. Very well answered. Uh, Cassian, Rainbow or The Day? Can only pick one. Cassian. Straight away, no hesitation. Yeah. Fair play. You caught a 60 pounder from there, mate. It's only one. It's more to catch, isn't there? So. History UK Cup, you wish you caught. Oh, God. Tough one. Um, I think one that really, really sort of inspired me as a kid would have been Yates's Fish. Yeah? The, the bishop. bishop. Yeah. Amazing creature. Just uh, that, that picture's just everything, isn't yeah, it? You know, that, that picture's uh, cool, really, uh, truly iconic. Um, I'd also say, I think, Springgate's Yovni Brace. That had a real impression on me. I remember sort of reading Carp Fever and that, and, and obviously, you know, the, the, the famous chapter about him catching those two. So, what yeah. A picture as well. They're two Amazing. great yeah, images, aren't two they? incredible carp. Yeah. Yeah. Fair play. Uh, drum and bass or country and western? Mm. Long road trip ahead of you down to the south of France. You've got to whack one on. Oh, tough one, mate. I like, I actually like both. Now, I've got a really, really eclectic taste in music. Um, I love, I've seen like loads of guitar bands, literally loads over the years. Um, I actually really love dance music. I like sort of, um, not trance, but sort of like, oh, not trance. No, sort of like really deep sort of melodic house, that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, do like a bit of drum and bass. Um, but I also like, um, some country singers as well, like Casey Musgraves. Yeah. Mate, she's incredible. Like really, really good voice. I'm probably going to say for a road trip, drum and bass. You mad Ed. Yeah. <laughs> One angler to catch a carp to save your life. Uh, Nick Kelly. Nick, a good call. He'd do it as well. Yeah. Um, biggest regret? Biggest regret? Um, not meeting my missus 20 years ago. She's oh. an absolute diamond, mate. I'm so lucky. Um, a lovely one. Yeah, yeah. She's an absolute diamond. She really is. Uh, yeah, no regrets in fishing, mate. Love not, that. At all, really. Yeah. Loved it all. Final question. A night out on the bank or a night in with the missus? I've just answered it, haven't I? Both, because she goes fishing. A night, a night on the bank with the missus. Yeah, how's that? Lovely, <laughs> Absolute legend. Thank you guys so much for watching and listening. I can't thank this man enough, mate. You're an absolute legend. Thank you so much again for coming in, mate. Everybody, no, no problem, mate. Really the one it. and only Mike Brown. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Cheers, mate.